Preface to The Fall River Tragedy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface When the assassination of Andrew J. Borden and Abby D. Borden, his wife, was announced, not only the people of Fall River and of Massachusetts, but the public throughout the country manifested the deepest interest in the affair. The murders soon became the theme of universal comment, both in public and private, and every newspaper reference to the affair was read with eagerness, digested and commented upon in a manner unprecedented. The crimes stand out in bold relief as the most atrocious and, at the same time, the most mystifying which the American public had ever before been called upon to discuss. They had about them that fascination of uncertainty, horrible though they were, which fixes the attention and holds it continually. Miss Lizzie A. Borden, a daughter of the murdered man, was arrested and charged with the killing. She was a young woman of hitherto spotless reputation and character, and more than that, she was educated, refined, and prominently connected with the work of the Christian Church in Fall River. Her arrest added more and more to the interest which the public had taken to the matter. She was tried before the Superior Court of Massachusetts and a jury of her peers and found not guilty of the crimes. This event settled beyond question the probability of her guilt, and yet the case lost none of its absorbing interest. The author of this book, therefore, has for a purpose the desire to give the reading public a connected story of the whole case, commencing with the day of the tragedy and ending with the day that Miss Borden was set free. Persons believing implicitly in the correctness of the findings of the jury at New Bedford will see much wrong done in those chapters which treat the police work, but that the grand jury indicted the young lady is no fault of the author, and the story of what brought that indictment about is important, therefore it is given without prejudice. Harsh words were said of Miss Borden, but they came from those who had a sworn duty to perform, and they alone are responsible. Her defence is given as freely as the case of the prosecution, and with it the history is made as complete as was possible. The facts discussed came from official sources and are independent upon the testimony submitted at the court trials. Edwin H. Porter End of Preface Chapter One of the Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One Discovery of the Murders. At high noon on Thursday, the fourth day of August, eighteen ninety two, the cry of murder swept through the city of Fall River like a typhoon on the smooth surface of an eastern sea. It was caught up by a thousand tongues and repeated at every street corner until it reached the utmost confines of the municipality. A double murder, the most atrocious of crimes, committed under the very glare of the midday sun, within three minutes' walk of the city hall, was the way the story went, and it was true in every particular. Andrew J. Borden and his wife, Abby D. Borden, had been assassinated in their home at 92 Second Street. The manner in which the deed was done seemed so brutal, so mysterious, and the tragedy itself so unprecedented, that people stared with open-mouthed amazement as they listened to the story passing from tongue to tongue. In the excitement of the moment, the murderer had slipped away unobserved, and bloody as his crime had been, he left no trace behind, nor clue to his identity. He had wielded an axe or some similar instrument with the skill of a headsman, and had butchered in the most horrible manner the bodies of his defenceless victims. When discovered, the remains of Mr. Borden laid stretched at full length upon the sofa in the sitting-room of his home. The head literally hacked into fragments, and the fresh blood trickling from every wound. Upstairs in the guest chamber lay the body of Mrs. Borden, similarly mangled and butchered, with the head reeking in a crimson pool. She had been murdered while in the act of making the bed, and her husband had died as he lay taking his morning nap. 
In the house was Miss Lizzie A. Borden, youngest daughter of the slain couple, and Bridget Sullivan, the only servant. They and they alone had been within calling distance of the victims as the fiend or fiends struck the fatal blows. The servant was in the attic, and the daughter was in the barn not more than thirty feet from the back door of the house. This was the condition of things on the premises when the cry went forth which shocked the city and startled the entire country. Neighbours, friends, physicians, police officers and newspaper reporters gathered at the scene in an incredibly short space of time. It was soon learned that the daughter Lizzie had been the first to make the horrible discovery. She said that not many minutes before she had spoken to her father upon his return from the city, and that after seeing him comfortably seated on the sofa she had gone out to the barn to remain a very short time. Upon returning she saw his dead body and gave the alarm which brought the servant from the attic. Without thinking of Mrs. Borden, the daughter sent Bridget for help. Mrs. Adelaide B. Churchill, the nearest neighbour, Dr. S. W. Bowen, and Miss Alice Russell were among the first to respond. Shortly afterward, the dead body of Mrs. Borden was discovered, and the unparalleled monstrosity of the crime became apparent. There had been murder most foul, and so far as the developments of the moment indicated, without a motive or a cause. The street in front of the house soon became blocked with a surging mass of humanity, and the excitement grew more and more intense as the meagre details of the assassination were learned. Men with blanched faces hurried back and forth through the yard. Police officers stood in groups for a moment and talked mysteriously. Physicians consulted among themselves and kind friends ministered to the bereaved daughter and offered her consolation. Inside the house where the bodies lay, the rooms were in perfect order. Mrs. Borden had smoothed out the last fold in the snow-white counterpane and placed the pillows on the bed with the utmost care of a tidy housewife. Every piece of furniture stood in its accustomed place and every book and paper was laid away with rigid exactness. Only the blood, as it had dashed in isolated spots against the walls and door jams, and the reeking bodies themselves showed that death in its most violent form had stalked through the unpretentious home and left nothing but its bloody work to tell the tale. No one dared go so far as to suggest a motive for the crime. The house had not been robbed, and the friends of the dead had never heard of such a thing as an enemy possessed of hatred enough to commit so monstrous a deed. As the hours passed, a veil of deepest mystery closed around the scene, and the most strenuous efforts of the authorities to clear the mystery away seemed more and more futile as their work progressed. Men with cool heads and with cunning and experience sought in vain to unearth some facts to indicate who the criminal might be, but their skill was unavailing. They were baffled at every turn. The author of that hideous slaughter had come and gone as gently as the south wind, but had fulfilled his mission as terrifically as a cyclone. No more cunning plan had ever been hatched in a madman's brain, and no more thorough work was ever done by the guillotine. Mystery sombre and absolute hung in impenetrable folds over the Borden house, and not one ray of light existed to penetrate its blackness. Mr. Borden and his wife were spending their declining years highly respected residents, with wealth enough to enjoy all the comforts and luxuries of modern life. Mr. Borden, by years of genuine New England thrift and energy, had gathered a fortune, and his exemplary life had served to add credit to a family name, which had been identified with the development of prosperity of his native state for two hundred years, and which has been known to public and private life since the time of William the Conqueror. His family had the open sesame to the best society. The contentment which wealth, influence and high social standing could bring was possible to his family, if its members chose to have it, but he and his wife had been murdered and there was no one who cared to come forward and explain why death had so ruthlessly overtaken them. One thing was manifest, an iron will and a heart of flint had directed the arm which struck those unoffending people down 
in a manner exceeding the savage cruelty of the most bloodthirsty creature, man or beast. The police officers invaded the house and searched in vain for some evidence to assist them in hunting down the murderer. They learned nothing tangible, but they laid the foundation for their future work by carefully scrutinizing the home and its surroundings as well as the bodies. A hint was sent out that a mysterious man had been seen on the doorsteps arguing with Mr. Borden only a few days before. Had he done the deed? To those who stopped to contemplate the circumstances surrounding the double murder, it was marvellous to reflect how fortune had favoured the assassin. Not once in a million times would fate have paved such a way for him. He had to deal with a family of six persons in an unpretentious two-and-a-half-story house, the rooms of which were all connected, and in which it would have been a difficult matter to stifle sound. He must catch Mr. Borden alone, and either asleep, or off his guard, and kill him with one fell blow. The faintest outcry would have sounded an alarm. He must also encounter Mrs. Borden alone, and fell her, a heavy woman, noiselessly. To do this he must either make his way from the sitting-room, on the ground floor, to the spare bedroom above the parlour, and avoid five persons in the passage, or he must conceal himself in one of the rooms upstairs, and make the descent under the same conditions. The murdered woman must not lisp a syllable at the first attack, and her fall must not attract attention. He must then conceal the dripping implement of death, and depart in broad daylight by a much frequented street. In order to accomplish this, he must take a time when Miss Emma L. Borden, the elder daughter of the murdered man, was on a visit to relatives out of the city. Miss Lizzie A. Borden, the other daughter, must be in the barn and remain there twenty minutes. A less time than that would not suffice. Bridget Sullivan, the servant, must be in the attic asleep on her own bed. Her presence in the pantry, or kitchen, or any room on the first or second floors, would have frustrated the fiend's designs, unless he also killed her, so that she would die without a murmur. In making his escape there must be no blood-stains upon his clothing, for such tell-tale marks might have betrayed him. And so, if the assailant of the aged couple was not familiar with the premises, his luck favoured him exactly as described. He made no false move. He could not have proceeded more swiftly, nor, surely, had he lived in the modest edifice for years. At the most he had just twenty minutes in which to complete his work. He must go into the house after Miss Lizzie entered the barn, and he must disappear before she returned. More than that, the sixth member of the family, John V. Morse, must vanish from the house while the work was being done. He could not have been counted on by any criminal, however shrewd, who had planned the tragedy ahead. Mr. Morse came and went at the Borden homestead. He was not engaged in business in Fall River, and there were no stated times when the wretch who did the slaughtering could depend upon his absence. Mr. Morse must not loiter about the house or yard after breakfast, as was his custom. He must take a car to some other part of the city, and he must not return until his host and hostess have been stretched lifeless. The slightest hitch in these conditions, and the murderer would have been balked or detected, red-handed upon the spot. Had Miss Emma remained at home, she would have been a stumbling-block. Had Miss Lizzie left the stable a few moments earlier, she would have seen the murderer as he ran out of the side-door. Had Bridget Sullivan shortened her nap and descended the stairs, she would have heard her mistress drop as the axe fell on her head. Had Mr. Morse cut short his visit to friends by as much as ten minutes, the butcher would have dashed into his arms as he ran out at the front gate. Had Mr. Borden returned earlier from his morning visit to the post office, he would have caught the assassin murdering his aged wife, or had he uttered a scream at the time he himself was cut down, at least two persons would have rushed to his assistance. It was a wonderful chain of circumstances which conspired to clear the way for the murderer, so wonderful that its links baffled men's understanding. City Marshal Rufus B. Hilliard received the first intimation that a murder had been committed by telephone message. 
He was sitting in his office at the Central Police Station when John Cunningham entered a store half a block from the Borden house and gave notice of the affair. He immediately sent Officer George Allen to the scene, and then, by signal, informed each member of his force who was on duty at the time. This was at 11.15 in the forenoon. Officer Allen was the first policeman to visit the house, and he saw the horribly mutilated body of Mr. Borden, as it lay on the sofa. One glance was sufficient to cause the policeman to stand almost rooted to the floor, for he had come unprepared to witness such a sight. Without delay, he hurried to the marshal's office and made a personal report of what he had seen. Almost all of the night, patrolmen and many of the day men were absent from the city on the day of the killing, on the annual excursion of the Fall River Police Association to Rocky Point, a shore resort near Providence, Rhode Island, and this unusual condition served greatly to handicap the efforts of Marshal Hilliard in his attempt to get possession of a tangible clue to the perpetration of the crimes. The city was but poorly protected by members of the day force who were doing double duty. However, within half an hour after the general alarm had been sent out, a half-dozen officers from the central part of the city had arrived at the Borden house. They were instructed to make a careful search of the premises. Officer Allen, before he returned to the police station, had stationed Charles S. Sawyer at the door on the north side of the house, and had instructed him to allow no one except policemen and physicians to enter the building. Mr. Sawyer was besieged by hundreds of citizens, but stood firm at his post during the entire day, and it was a time of intense excitement and pressing demands for admittance. The street in front of the house was blocked before noon with wagons, teams and pedestrians, and the people stood for hours in the hot sunshine of an exceptionally warm midsummer day, and speculated and theorised as to what possible motive any one could have had in so heartlessly butchering the aged man and woman. Inside the yard and house, policemen in uniform and in citizen's garb, hurried to and fro with the air of mystery which was becoming them, for to all appearances the assassin had vanished as completely as if the earth had opened and swallowed him. The Borden House, a plain two-and-a-half-story frame structure, stands on the east side of Second Street, and is numbered 92. It is but one block away from the main thoroughfare of the busy city of Fall River. Hundreds of vehicles and numberless people pass and repass before the building daily, and yet no person could be found who saw a suspicious move or heard an unaccustomed sound on that fatal forenoon, until Miss Lizzie told how she had called Mrs. Churchill and informed her that a murder had been committed. Mrs. Churchill had been to market and was returning home at about eleven o'clock. She saw Bridget Sullivan, who was also familiarly called Maggie, running across the street to the residence of Dr. S. W. Bowen, the family physician. The girl told her that something awful had happened, and then Mrs. Churchill went into her own house, and in a very short time appeared at the kitchen window, which commands a view of the side door of the Borden residence. She saw Miss Lizzie sitting on the back doorsteps with her face buried in her hands and seemingly in great distress. Mrs. Churchill crossed the yard and offered Miss Lizzie a few words of consolation. Bridget Sullivan, the only living person who admits that she was in the house at the time of the killing, was the first to give the alarm by noticing Mrs. Dr. Bowen. Bridget was in her own room, in bed, to rest. While there, she heard Miss Lizzie call, and from the tone of her voice knew that something was wrong. Bridget came down quickly, and Miss Lizzie said to her, "'Father is dead. Go for Dr. Bowen.' Bridget obeyed. The physician was not at home, and she returned. Then Miss Lizzie sent her for Miss Alice Russell, who lived two blocks away and who was an intimate friend of the family. Briefly, this is what had taken place before the arrival of Officer Allen, and up to that time no one except the assassin knew that the body of Mrs. Abby D. Borden lay weltering in its own blood in the guest chamber on the second floor. To those who early visited the house, the vision of Mr. Borden's body as it lay on the sofa, with the life-blood still warm, and flowing from a dozen gaping wounds, was a horror so dreadful that they had no thought of Mrs. Borden. 
It remained for the neighbour, Mrs. Churchill, and the servant Bridget, to make this awful discovery. Dr. Bowen, who had arrived shortly after Bridget's visit to his house, in response to her call, asked for a sheet with which to cover the body of Mr. Borden. Bridget brought one from one of the back bedrooms on the upper floor. About this time Miss Lizzie asked for her mother. It is related that this request for someone to go and find Mrs. Borden was the second made by Miss Lizzie. Suddenly it dawned upon those present that in the midst of the excitement of the moment Mrs. Borden had been forgotten. Of all persons in the world she would have been more deeply interested in the death of her husband and possibly she could give some explanation of his tragic taking off. Bridget was unwilling to go alone in search of Mrs. Borden, and so Mrs. Churchill volunteered to bear her company. The two women passed through the front hall and ascended the stairs in the front entry. Reaching a landing halfway up, where their eyes were on a level with the floor, they looked across the hall through an open door, under the bed, and saw the prostrate form of the dead woman. It lay full on the face, and the arms were folded underneath. Mrs. Churchill turned and retraced her steps to the kitchen. She sighed audibly as she took a chair, and Miss Russell said to her, "'What, another?' The reply was, "'Yes, Mrs. Borden is killed, too.' Bridget had followed back to the kitchen. Special Police Officer Patrick H. Doherty was the second policeman to reach the house, and he was soon followed by Assistant Marshal John Fleet and Officers Michael Mullally, John Devine, and William H. Medley. Before noon, several other policemen, friends of the family, and local newspaper men had been admitted to the house. Also, medical examiner Dr. William A. Dolan and a number of other physicians. The medical examiner arrived at 11.45 and encountered Dr. Bowen and Bridget on his way into the sitting-room. He then made a hasty view of the bodies and the house, and commenced immediately to make preparations for holding an autopsy. John Vinnicum Morse, brother of Andrew J. Borden's first wife, and uncle of Mrs. Lizzie and Emma, arrived at the house shortly before noon. He entered the north gate and went directly to a pear tree in the back yard, where he ate two pears, and then returned to the side door and entered. Then Miss Lizzie told him that Mr. and Mrs. Borden had been murdered. Mr. Morse had slept in the guest chamber where Mrs. Borden's body had been found on the previous night, and had, after eating his breakfast that morning, left the house to visit a relative who resided on Way Bossett Street in Fall River, about a mile from the Borden house. It was remembered that Mr. Borden fastened the screen on the side door after Mr. Morse passed out at 9.20 o'clock in the morning, and bade his guest return in time for dinner. Mr. Morse had come to the house on the afternoon before the tragedy, and had spent a few hours with Mr. Borden, and then had driven to the Borden summer residence and farm, which are situated about six miles from the city, in the town of Somerset. He returned in time for supper and spent the night at the house. Miss Lizzie sat at the foot of the back stairs and near the side door, when Mrs. Churchill arrived. She had called her neighbour and informed her that Mr. Borden had been stabbed or killed. Then she went into the kitchen and remained a few minutes. Here she was seen by a number of policemen, physicians, and others who had been admitted to the house before noon. She told Mrs. Churchill that she had been absent from the sitting-room a few minutes, and that she had spent the time in the barn, where she had gone to get a piece of iron. About noon she went upstairs to her own bedroom in company with Miss Alice Russell, and the two sat alone for some time. While in the upper part of the house she was approached by Assistant Marshal John Fleet, who made numerous inquiries concerning the condition of things in the house previous to the murders. She told him, as she had told others, that Mrs. Borden had received a note delivered by a boy early in the morning, asking her to come and visit a friend who was sick. She did not know who sent the message, nor who delivered it, except that the bearer was a small boy. Her father, she said, had had angry words with an unknown man on the front steps a few days before the murder. She thought the man was a farm labourer. 
The daughter also gave the police information that the entire family had been sick a few days before and that she feared that an enemy had attempted to poison them. The sickness had followed after drinking milk, and this fact was enough to cause Miss Lizzie to suspect that the milk had been tampered with. The information given by the daughter was carried to Marshal Hilliard, and he ordered several policemen to guard the main roads leading out of the city. A squad was also sent to Taunton River Bridge, over which the assassin, if he was a farm labourer, would pass on his way to the country. The police questioned Bridget closely, and she corroborated what Miss Lizzie had said about the sickness in the family. So confused with the servant girl that she could tell no coherent story of the condition of things about the house during the forenoon, she did say that during the morning Mrs. Borden had instructed her to wash the windows from the outside of the house. This she had done. After receiving this order from her mistress, Bridget did not see her alive again. She finished her work before ten o'clock, and while in the sitting-room, heard Mr. Borden trying to get in at the front door. He had returned from the city. She opened the front door and let Mr. Borden in, and then went upstairs. This was the last she saw of him until Miss Lizzie called her when the body was found. When the police officers arrived, they began to search the house for the weapon, and Bridget showed them into the cellar. Here they found four hatchets, one of which had the appearance of having been washed after recent use. At this time little attention was paid to this particular hatchet, but all the hatchets were taken to the police station. Shortly after twelve o'clock, Special Officer Philip Harrington arrived at the house, as had other policemen. He joined in the search for evidence which would lead to the arrest of the murderer or to the discovery of the weapon. After viewing the bodies, he went to Miss Lizzie, who was in her own room, talking with Miss Alice Russell. He asked her if she knew anything about the crime, and she replied, No. It was then that she detailed to him the story of her visit to the barn, and he cautioned her to be careful, and to give him all the information in her possession. Perhaps tomorrow, said the officer, you will have a clearer frame of mind. No, sir, responded Miss Lizzie, with a gentle courtesy. I can tell you all I know now, just as well as at any other time. The conversation was prolonged, and during the entire time Miss Lizzie controlled her emotions wonderfully for a young lady who had so recently been called upon to witness the blood of her father and stepmother flowing from dozens of hideous wounds. When the officer left her, he went to the city marshal and related his experience. The public was not informed that then and there suspicions were aroused in the minds of the police that the daughter knew more of the circumstances of the tragedy than she cared to tell, but nevertheless this was true. All through that eventful day the police searched the house, cellar, yard and barn, but found nothing to confirm any suspicions which they might have entertained as to who was guilty of the crimes. Honourable John W. Coughlin, mayor of the city, who is a physician, was among the first at the house, and he took an active interest in the search for evidence. From cellar to attic, the police and physicians delved into every nook and corner. Every particle of hay in the barn and loft, and every blade of grass in the yard was turned over, and when the day was done the harvest had been nothing, except the discovery of the double murder of a peaceful old man and his harmless wife, struck down in their home like an ox in a stall. There was no assassin, no weapon, no motive, just the crime and veil of mystery surrounding which apparently time alone could lift they found the house in perfect order the front and cellar doors were locked and every window sash was down even the victims as they lay showed no signs of a struggle and the blood which spurted as the weapon fell had not bespattered the rooms and furniture as it generally does under circumstances such as these which surrounded the butchery of the bordens they found two persons in the house living and two dead and the living could throw no light upon the darkness which clouded the stark forms of the dead. A sturdy old man, rich in world's goods, highly esteemed, retired from active life, without a known enemy, and his equally unoffending wife were cut down in their own house, in the broad daylight, and the assassin had left absolutely no trace of himself. No man had seen him enter the house, and no one had witnessed his departure. 
The city was excited as it never was before. Thousands of people hurried from their places of business, from the workshop and the mill, and gathered in the street in front of the house. Newspaper men from the principal cities of New York and New England, to which the telegraph had communicated the news of the astounding crime, arrived on the afternoon trains, and as the day wore on, the dark mystery grew darker, and the task of fastening the crime on the guilty party took on the semblance of an impossibility. Medical examiner Dolan and the corps of physicians held an autopsy on the bodies in the afternoon and found that thirteen blows had rained upon the head of the unsuspecting Mr. Borden, and that no less than eighteen had descended upon the skull of Mrs. Borden. The cuts were deep and long, and any one of them could have produced instant death. Could any but a maniac have inflicted those pitiless wounds, or could any but a madman have struck so ruthlessly and unerringly, and watched the effect as the weapon sped on its mission of death, time and time again? These were questions which suggested themselves to the public, but they were unanswered and seemingly unanswerable. This was the baffling condition of things which beset Marshal Hilliard and his officers after the scene had been hurriedly gone over. Out of this chaos of bloody crime and bewildering uncertainty, the police were expected to bring light and order. It was a Herculean task, yet they went to work with an energy prompted by duty, and spurred to greater efforts by the public demand that justice overtake the author of the foul deeds. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of the Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two Police Searching the Premises. Let us go back to the Borden house on the afternoon following the time of the massacre. Medical examiner Dolan and his associates are found at work on the partial autopsy. The bodies have been removed to the sitting room. The physicians found thirteen wounds on the head of Mr. Borden, which were clean-cut and evidently made by some very sharp instrument. The largest was four and a half inches long and two inches wide. Many of them penetrated the skull, and one severed the eyeball and jawbone. In Mr. Dolan's own words, the sight was the most ghastly he had ever witnessed. Mrs. Borden's body was even more severely dealt with. The head was chopped into ribbons of flesh, and the skull broken in several places. A deep wound was discovered between her shoulder-blades, and had the appearance of having been made by a hatchet, the blade penetrating full three inches deep. The stomachs of the victims were taken out, sealed up, and sent to Professor E. S. Wood, an eminent chemist of Harvard University, for analysis. It was desirable to know if their contents would reveal the fact as to whether or not the milk which was used had been poisoned. Then again, there was a difference of opinion as to which of the two persons had been killed first. Only the condition of the blood at the time of the discovery and the contents of the stomachs could determine that question. The pool of blood in which Mrs. Borden's head lay was coagulated, while the life-giving element of Mr. Borden's body was fresh and oozing from the wounds. It was evident that the woman had been dead two hours before the assassin slaughtered the old man. Yet this must be established beyond a doubt, and in order to do so, Professor Wood must determine to what stage digestion had passed. The autopsy was partially finished, and the bodies delivered into the hands of Undertaker Winwood, who prepared them for burial. The police were more than ever active during the afternoon. City Marshal Hilliard and State Detective George Seaver of Taunton visited the house and made personal inquiry of the inmates and viewed the bodies and their surroundings. The search for evidence was continued until night with little or no satisfactory result, so far as the public knew. Dr. Bowen, who was the first physician to enter the house, told the writer the following story of the condition of things as he found them. Quote, when I reached the home and before I entered it, my wife said to me, You are wanted at the Bordens. Something terrible has happened. Without waiting to learn what the trouble was, I hurried across the street 
and entered the house by the side door which leads to the kitchen there i was confronted by mrs churchill who lives next door to the bordens and by miss alice russell and miss lizzie borden miss russell was sitting by miss lizzie's side rubbing her forehead and hands and otherwise comforting her i asked what the trouble was and they told me that mr borden had been killed i asked how long since it had happened and they replied that it was only a few minutes by conservative calculation i believe that i was present at mr borden's side not over twenty minutes after the fatal blows had been inflicted alone i walked into the sitting-room and there i saw the body of mr borden on a lounge i determined to make a thorough investigation without delay and proceeded the sofa on which the dead man reclined was of mahogany with hair-cloth covering such as was commonly manufactured for high-class parlour furniture forty years ago mr borden lay partly on his right side with his coat thrown over the arm of the sofa at his head he wore a dressing-gown and his feet rested on the carpet it was his custom to lie in that way his position was perfectly natural and he appeared as if he had just lain down to sleep i was impressed at this point with the manifest absence of any sign of a struggle mr borden's hands were not clinched no piece of furniture was overturned there was no contraction of the muscles or indications of pain such as we expect to find under similar circumstances i am satisfied that he was asleep when he received the first blow which was necessarily fatal i approached the body and felt for the pulse it had ceased to beat then i examined the body to note its condition and the extent of the wounds mr borden's clothing was not disarranged and his pockets had apparently not been touched the blows were delivered on the left side of the head which was more exposed than the other by reason of the dead man's position i do not believe he moved a muscle after being struck the cuts extended from the eye and nose around the ear in a small space there were at least eleven distinct cuts of about the same depth and general appearance in my opinion any one of them would have proved fatal almost instantly physician that i am and accustomed to all kinds of horrible sights it sickened me to look upon the dead man's face i am inclined to think that an axe was the instrument used the cuts were about four and a half inches in length and one of them had severed the eyeball and socket there was some blood on the floor and spatters on the wall but nothing to indicate the slaughter that had taken place i calculated that nearly all the blows were delivered from behind with great rapidity at this point i returned to the kitchen and inquired for mrs borden miss lizzie replied that she did not know where her mother was she said that she lizzie had been out to the barn and that the servant was on the third floor mrs churchill suggested that i go upstairs which i did entering the front room i was informed that mr john morse had occupied it the night before as i passed within i was horrified to see the body of mrs borden on the floor between the bed and the dressing-case in the northeast corner i walked over and realized that she was dead but at that moment i was not sure she had been murdered i thought she might have fainted the sad truth was discovered too soon mrs borden had also been murdered i think she must have been engaged in making the bed when the murderer appeared with an axe or hatchet and made a slash at her after that she turned and the fiend chopped her head as if she had been a cake of ice one blow killed the woman but the murderer kept on hacking at her until he was well satisfied that she was dead it is a mystery to me how he could have done so much savage work in so short a time and made no noise the weapon must have been a sharp one for the cuts were as clean as if made by a razor there were however no signs of a struggle in the surroundings there was a large pool of blood under the dead woman's head as she lay with her hands under her i easily made out eleven distinct gashes of apparently the same size as those on her husband's face some of these blows had been delivered from the rear and two or three from the front one glance blow cut off nearly two square inches of flesh from the side of her head in my judgment the dead woman did not struggle she was rendered unconscious by the first blow not a chair was displaced and not a towel disturbed on the rack nearby 
I revisited the dead in company with the police officers, but made no further observations at that time. I afterwards talked with Miss Lizzie, but she was in a highly nervous state. She said that her father left the house about nine o'clock and went to the bank and the post office. He returned about ten-thirty, as near as she could remember, and took off his coat to put on his dressing gown. She asked him about the mail, and also if he was feeling any better, as he had been sick the day before. She said he replied to her, I feel no better now, no worse, and then went into the sitting-room. Shortly afterward, the daughter went out to the barn. She told me that she didn't think that she was gone more than fifteen or twenty minutes, and then came back and discovered the murdered bodies of her father and her stepmother. Members of the family had been sick recently. Mrs. Borden came to me Wednesday morning and said that she was very much frightened, for she thought she had been poisoned. She and Mr. Borden had vomited all night, and she feared the poison had been from the baker's bread or the milk. Miss Lizzie and Bridget had been sick with the same symptoms, and it was their belief that the enemy had attempted to kill the whole family. End quote. The police upon investigation found that Dr. Bowen's story that the Bordens had been ill was true in every particular, and they naturally went to work in order to find, if possible, the person who administered the poison. Special officers Harrington and Doherty were assigned to this task, and before midnight they had made a startling discovery, so astounding, in fact, that they hardly believed their senses. They started out late in the afternoon to visit the various drug stores of the city and to make inquiry as to who bought or offered to buy poison. They worked without success until they came to D. R. Smith's pharmacy at the corner of South Main and Columbia Streets. Eli Bentz, the clerk, informed them that on Wednesday before the murder, a young woman had come into his store and asked to buy a small bottle of hydrocyanic acid. Suspicions are cruel, and if unfounded, they burn like hot iron, but in a murder mystery, where every link may strengthen the chain, they rise up at a thousand points and cannot be ignored. She wanted poison to kill the moths which were eating her sealskin cloak. If a person wished to kill and avoid detection, and that person were wise, hydrocyanic acid would be the first choice among all deadly drugs. It is a diluted form of prussic acid, and it does its work surely it is not necessary to use it in bulk homeopathic doses are all sufficient it is absorbed by the nervous system and leaves no traces and it produces none of the anti-mortem symptoms peculiar to most violent poisons there is no vomiting no spasm or convulsions no contraction of the muscles hydrocyanic acid simply takes hold of the heart and stops it beating it may not have been used in this case but at this time the detectives did not claim that it was. Mr. Bentz told her that he did not sell so deadly a poison except upon a doctor's certificate, and she went away empty-handed. This woman, Mr. Bentz and others positively identified as Miss Lizzie Borden. When the clerk told his story to the officers, they took him to the Borden house. This was about ten o'clock on the night following the murder. He was placed in a position to see Miss Lizzie, and when he came out, was more certain than before that she was the lady who called for the prussic acid. This, then, was a possible clue, and the first and only one which the police had secured. The Fall River Daily Globe published the particulars of this incident the next day, but almost every newspaper in the country failed to accept it as authentic and while it served to point the police toward a possible solution of the great murder mystery, it also brought down upon them the vituperation of many a bucolic newspaper man who knew not of what he wrote, or knowing, cared little for justice and truth. For the day after the killing, newspapers throughout the country questioned the ability of the officers of the Fall River Police Department, and some of them went so far as to criticise sharply the work done. An act of injustice, unless the author of the criticism knew as much of the case as the police themselves, which was hardly to be expected. However, the work went on, yet with this slight clue, the mystery seemed dark as ever. More bewildering, in fact, for there arose countless suggestions during the afternoon, which the police were called upon to consider. 
John V. Morse developed into a seemingly very important factor before the day had passed, and Special Officer Medley was detailed to look up the facts concerning his whereabouts during that day. Mr. Morse had told the newspaper reporters of his visit in the morning to the house of a relative, Mrs. Emery, at No. 4 Waybosset Street. Thither went the policeman, accompanied by the writer, to investigate. The Emerys were found at home, and Mrs. Emery said that Mr. Morse had visited her house that morning, arriving there before ten o'clock, and remaining until eleven-twenty. A niece of Mr. Morse was present, and she also declared that her uncle had left the house at the time stated. The testimony of these two witnesses would set at rest forever the theory that John V. Morse was within a mile of the Borden house, when the old people were done to death but these facts were not then generally known, and there were many persons who believed that he knew more concerning the killing than he cared to relate. The city marshal sent a detail of police to guard the Borden house soon after the murder was reported, and instructions were given out that every member of the household be shadowed. Officer John Devine was designated to keep Mr. Morse in sight, and every movement which he made was carefully watched. He was allowed to come and go at will, but whenever he appeared on the street, a great crowd gathered. On one evening in particular, when the excitement was at highest tension, Mr. Moore set out for the post office. Before he had completed his journey, a mob numbering a thousand people was at his heels, and fears were entertained lest he would be roughly handled. Officer Devine was in the shadow of Mr. Morse and saw him safely back to the Borden house. End of chapter 2《Chapter 3 of the Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The Borden Family. Andrew J. Borden was numbered among the wealthy and influential men of Fall River. He was one of the family of Bordens whose name has always been identified with the growth and business enterprises of the city and vicinity. No one knows how much money he was worth, but persons who are as well acquainted with his affairs as he would allow them to be do not hesitate to say that his estate was worth $300,000. He was a thrifty Yankee in every sense of the word, and nothing that represented money was ever wasted by him. No other man knew the worth of a dollar better than he, and none were more thoroughly convinced that a dollar properly invested would bring its returns many times over. Upon the death of his father, Abraham Borden, he came into possession of a small estate, but his fortune was of his own creation. Abraham Borden sold fish in the streets of Fall River, when the place was but a village, and thus, by patient and plodding economy, accumulated enough money to purchase a house on Ferry Street, and some other real estate. But the murdered man was never too busy counting his money to stop and do a day's work. He owned farms across the Taunton River in Somerset, and took the greatest interest in superintending the work thereon. There was nothing like style around him, and no one wondered why he did not make a show of his money. He had devoted his entire life to its accumulation, spending but little, and it was not expected of him to change his manner of life in old age, although many a man would have pursued a different course in his declining years. Other matters besides those of the farm occupied the old man's attention, for he was a prominent figure in financial circles. He was president of the Union Savings Bank, a member of its board of trustees and investment, a director of the Merchants Manufacturing Company, the BMC Durfee Safe Deposit and Trust Company, the Globe Yarn Mills, the Troy Cotton and Woolen Manufactory, and other manufacturing concerns. In each of these he had large sums of money invested, and the returns were undoubtedly large. In early life Mr. Borden was for many years engaged in the undertaking business with William M. Almy and Theodore D. W. Wood, and it was his boast that during his active business life he had never borrowed a cent or given a promissory note. He was always conservative in his investments of money, a man of excellent judgment, and he was often called upon to act as appraiser on land values. Two years before his death he erected one of the finest business blocks in the city 
located at the corner of South Main and Anawan Streets. His mode of living was simple and unostentatious, and he was a pattern of old-time New England industry, thrift, economy, and good citizenship. He was twice married, his first wife being Sarah A. Morse, daughter of Anthony Morse. His second was Abby D. Gray, daughter of Oliver Gray, whom he married June the 6th, 1865. He lived with his two daughters, Emma L. and Lizzie A., who were issues of his first marriage. At the time of his death, he was 70 years of age, and his wife was 67. Miss Lizzie Andrew Borden was 32 years old at the time of her father's death. Her mother died when she was two years of age, and she was cared for in her early childhood by her elder sister. A few years before the murder, she joined the Central Congregational Church, and was oftentimes an active member of that society. She was reared under conditions which could have made life a luxury had she and her parents turned their attention to society. The most aristocratic drawing-rooms of the city would have welcomed the daughters of Andrew J. Borden, but Miss Lizzie seemed to care but little for society. She preferred to move in a limited circle of friends and never sought to enlarge the number of her acquaintances. She avoided strangers and persons with whom she was not familiar. She was born in the old Borden homestead on Ferry Street in Fall River and received her education in the public schools, graduating from the high school early in life. Her classmates say that she was rather eccentric in her manner of life and of a retiring disposition. She never attended college, although her father was amply able to give her the best education that the schools of the country could furnish. At the mission of the Central Church on Pleasant Street, Fall River, she taught a class of young people, and there formed the acquaintance of the Reverend Edwin A. Buck, who was her constant companion and spiritual adviser during the great affliction which came to her in after life. Besides her active church work, she was a member of the Fruit and Flower Mission and other charitable organizations, as well as the Women's Christian Temperance Union. In all of these she was considered a valuable and conscientious worker. In the summer of 1890 she joined a party of young ladies who made the tour of Europe, but aside from this she never travelled extensively. Miss Emma L. Borden was the eldest child, being 37 at the time of her father's murder. She had been less active in church matters than Miss Lizzie, and had not travelled outside the bounds of New England. Her education, disposition, and manner of life were somewhat similar to those of her sister. At the time of the murders she was visiting friends in Fairhaven, Massachusetts, and arrived home on the evening of August the 4th, in response to a telegram sent by Dr. Bowen. John V. Morse was 69 years of age at the time of the murders. He is a native of New England, his early home being at Dartmouth, Massachusetts. At the age of 25 he went west and located at Hastings, Iowa, where he engaged in farming and built up a comfortable fortune. For twenty years he was separated from his friends in Massachusetts, and during that time, by honesty and frugality, made himself a respected and influential citizen of his adopted state. Besides his farming interest, he was engaged in other enterprises which brought in a goodly sum of money. After his years of work in the West, he came back to New England, arriving at Warren, Rhode Island, in April 1888. He remained a short time in Warren, and then removed to Dartmouth, which place he called his permanent home. After his return, he made frequent visits to the home of the Bordens in Fall River, and was upon the most intimate terms with all the members of the family. End of chapter 3Chapter 4 of The Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Hiram C. Harrington's Story Hiram C. Harrington, a brother in law of Andrew J. Borden, having married Mr. Borden's only sister, Luanna, and a blacksmith by trade, threw some light upon the manner in which the Bordens lived, which was highly interesting and important for the police to know. He said in an interview the day after the murder, quote, I have become acquainted with a good deal of the family history during years past. Mr. Borden was an exceedingly hard man concerning money matters, 
determined and stubborn and when once he gets an idea nothing could change him as the motive for this crime it was money unquestionably money if mr borden died he would have left something over five hundred thousand dollars and in my opinion that estate furnishes the only motive and a sufficient one for the double murder last evening i had a long interview with miss lizzie who has refused to see any one else i questioned her carefully as to her story of the crime she was very composed showed no signs of any emotion nor were there any traces of grief upon her countenance that did not surprise me as she is not naturally emotional i asked her what she knew of her father's death and after telling of the unimportant events of the early morning she said her father came home at ten thirty o'clock she was in the kitchen at the time she said but went into the dining-room when her father arrived she was very solicitous concerning him and assisted to remove his coat and put on his dressing-gown and inquired about his health she told me that she helped him to get a comfortable reclining place upon the sofa and asked him if he did not wish the blinds closed to keep out the sun so that he could have a nice nap she pressed him to allow her to place an afghan over his body but he said he did not need it then she asked him tenderly several times if he was perfectly comfortable if there was anything she could do for him and upon receiving assurance to the negative she withdrew i then questioned her very carefully as to the time she left the house and she told me positively that it was about ten forty five she said she saw her father on the lounge as she passed out on leaving the house she says she went directly to the barn to obtain some lead she informed me that it was her intention to go to marion on a vacation and she wanted the lead in the barn loft to make some sinkers she was a very enthusiastic angler i went over the ground several times and she repeated the same story she told me that it was hard to place the exact time she was in the barn as she was cutting the lead into sizable sinkers but thought she was absent about twenty minutes then she thought again and said it might have been thirty minutes she entered the house and went directly to the sitting-room as she says she was anxious concerning her father's health i discovered him dead she said and cried for bridget who was upstairs in her room did you go and look for your stepmother i asked who found her but she did not reply i pressed her for some idea of the motive and the author of the act and after she had thought a moment she said calmly a year ago last spring our house was broken into while father and mother were at swansea and a large amount of money stolen together with diamonds you never heard of it because father did not want it mentioned so as to give the detectives a chance to recover the property that may have some connection with the murder then i have seen some strange men around the house a few months ago i was coming through the back yard and as i approached the side door i saw a man there examining the door and premises i did not mention it to any one the other day i saw the same man hanging about the house evidently watching us i became frightened and told my parents about it i also wrote to my sister at fairhaven about it miss borden then gave it as her opinion that the strange man had a direct connection with the murder but she could not see why the house was not robbed and did not know of any one who would desire revenge upon her father yes there were family dissensions although it has always been kept very quiet for nearly ten years there have been constant disputes between the daughters and their father and stepmother it arose of course with regard to the stepmother mr borden gave her some bank stock and the girls thought they ought to be treated as evenly as the mother i guess mr borden did try to do it for he deeded to the daughters emma l and lizzie a the homestead on ferry street an estate of one hundred and twenty rods of land with a house and barn all valued at three thousand dollars this was in eighteen eighty seven the trouble about money matters did not diminish nor the acerbity of the family ruptures lessen and mr borden gave each girl ten shares in the crystal spring bleachery company which he paid one hundred dollars a share for they sold them soon after for less than forty dollars a share he also gave them some bank stock at various times allowing them of course the entire income from them 
In addition to this, he gave them a weekly stipend amounting to $200 a year. In spite of all this, the dispute about their not being allowed enough went on with equal bitterness. Lizzie did most of the demonstrative contention, as Emma is very quiet and unassuming, and would feel very deeply any disparaging or angry word from her father. Lizzie, on the contrary, was haughty and domineering with the stubborn will of her father, and bound to contest for her rights. There were many animated interviews between father and daughter on this point. Lizzie is of a repellent disposition, and after an unsuccessful passage with her father, would become sulky and refuse to speak to him for days at a time. She moved in the best society in Fall River, was a member of the Congregational Church, and is a brilliant conversationalist. She thought she ought to entertain as others did, and felt that with her father's wealth she was expected to hold her end up with others of her set. Her father's constant refusal to allow her to entertain lavishly angered her. I have heard many bitter things she has said of her father, and know she was deeply resentful of her father's maintained stand in this matter. The house on Ferry Street was an old one, and was in constant need of repairs. There were two tenants paying $16.50 and $14 a month, but with taxes and repairs there was very little income from the property. It was a great deal of trouble for the girls to keep the house in repair, and a month or two ago they got disgusted and deeded the house back to their father. I am positive that Emma knows nothing of the murder. End quote. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five The Search of the House. Friday morning came, and with it little but mystery to add to the awful tragedy. The police had guarded the house all night. Marshal Hilliard had been active to an unusual degree, but the solution of the great murder mystery seemed to be as far distant as at any time since the discovery of the bodies. It was stated early Friday morning that arrests would be made during the day, but they were not. Miss Lizzie Borden was suspected, but there was no evidence against her. It would have been a serious matter to arrest a person for such a terrible crime as this double murder, especially when it is considered that the one suspected occupied a high social position in the community. Besides, she had a spotless reputation. Not one word of criticism had passed upon her before this time, and furthermore, she was an heiress to a fortune of not less than $300,000. The officers of the law must have more evidence, and with this idea in view, they again visited the house for the purpose of a more thorough search. On the afternoon before, the report had gone out that Miss Lizzie had refused the officer's permission to search her room. This was promptly denied. However, they were not satisfied, and the ground was carefully gone over again. Five officers spent over three hours ransacking rooms, bureaus, beds, boxes, trunks, and everything else where it was thought that anything which they would like to find might be hidden. Not a thing was discovered which afforded the slightest clue to the perpetrator of the bold and blood-curdling crimes. The searching party consisted of Marshal Hilliard, Assistant Marshal Fleet, State Detective Seaver, Medical Examiner Dolan, and Captain Desmond. They went to the house shortly after three o'clock, and did not leave until nearly six o'clock. There were a number of people in the house beside the two daughters, the servant, and John V. Morse. Among them were Mrs. Holmes and Miss Russell, friends of the family, who had been sent for by the Mrs. Borden to keep them company. The squad of police surrounding the house were given instructions not to let anyone enter or leave while the search was in progress, and they obeyed their orders to the letter. Attorney Andrew J. Jennings of Fall River was also present. He had been retained by the Mrs. Borden to look after their interests, but made no attempt to interfere in any way with the searching party. Mr. Morse offered his services to the officers, but they were declined with thanks. The police were satisfied after an hour's work on the first floor and cellar, and then they passed to the second floor. Miss Lizzie was in her room when they approached the door. She opened her trunk and said, 
Is there anything I can do or show you, gentlemen? She was told that nothing further was expected of her. They spent another hour ransacking the rooms on this floor, but their efforts were unrewarded. Then the yard and barn were again searched, but with the same result. Nothing was found and nothing was taken from the premises, if the words of a policeman at the time were to be depended upon. After the party left, one of the officers in conversation dwelt particularly upon the demeanour of Miss Lizzie at the time of the search. He said, quote, I was surprised at the way she carried herself, and I must say that I admire her nerve. I did not think that a woman could have so much. She did not appear to be in the least bit excited or worried. I have wondered why she did not faint upon her discovery of the dead body of her father. Most women would have done so for a more horrible sight I never saw, and I have walked over a battlefield where thousands lay mangled and dead. She is a woman of remarkable nerve and self-control, and her sister Emma is very much of the same disposition, although not so strong. End quote. After so thorough a search of the house, it was expected that some startling developments would be made, but the public was doomed to disappointment. Contrary to the expectations of all, it was announced that absolutely nothing had been discovered which would lead to a clue or assist in any way in clearing up the great mystery. There was one thing of importance which the police did accomplish on the second day after the murder. The time of the taking off of Mr. Borden was fixed at between 10.50 and 11.03 o'clock, and it was assumed that Mrs. Borden was killed before that time. They arrived at their decision regarding the old gentleman by the following facts. It was known that Mr. Borden was talking to Mr. Charles M. Horton at 10.30 o'clock, as they were seen together by persons on the Chase Mill car that leaves City Hall for Bedford and Quarry Streets at 10.30. The car was standing in front of the building. After leaving Mr. Horton, Mr. Borden walked up South Main Street, stopping for a minute or two at this block, and then going through Borden Street to Second and to his home. Bridget Sullivan was positive that she admitted him to the front door between 11.45 and 11.50. It was before 11 and after 11.45, Marshal Hilliard made special inquiries of the persons in the office with him concerning the time that he received the telephone message, and it has been fixed at within a minute of 11.15. Officer Allen was sent to investigate, and positively asserts that he was at the house at 10.20. A man who heard the alarm on the street says at the time there was no one in sight except the person who informed him. He was able to fix the time to within a minute of 10.45, by attending circumstances that he can recall clearly. The clock at Dr. Bowen's had struck 11 just before Miss Lizzie came to the door for the doctor and Dr. Bowen reached Mr. Borden's house at 11.30. The murder was reported within 15 minutes from the time that Mr. Borden is known to have been alive. With this detail were involved many issues. It practically broke down any theories that a mysterious assassin slyly entered the house, sneaked into the rooms, and then killed his victims. The intervening space of time was too brief. It became perfectly apparent to the police that the body of Mrs. Borden lay for an hour or more in the room where Mr. Morse slept, brutally hacked, the work of a murderer showing beyond all question and cavil that the blows were administered not in a frenzy at the sight of blood, but with one all-absorbing purpose, immediate death. There was evidence of fiendish brutality in the work, shown not alone in the manner in which it was done, but in the apparent sole desire of the guilty one to complete the crime so that the victim could not by any chance escape from the fate intended. They became more and more convinced that the body of Mrs. Borden could not have lain in the room for one or two hours without having been discovered by someone in the house. In the minds of the police the proposition resolved itself into this form. Could there have been a dead body and an assassin in the house for nearly two hours unknown to and undiscovered by miss lizzie or the servant end of chapter five chapter six of the fall river tragedy by edwin h porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the funeral 
the funeral of the murdered people took place on the morning of august the sixth crowds of people numbering between three thousand and four thousand appeared on second street in front of the house and about twenty policemen stood around and maintained a clear passage rev dr adams of the first congregational church and city missionary buck soon arrived and entered the house the bodies were laid in two black cloth covered caskets in the sitting-room where mr borden was killed an ivy wreath was placed on mr borden's bier and a bouquet of white roses and fern leaves tied with a white satin ribbon was placed over mrs borden there were about seventy-five persons present in the funeral services in the house the services consisted of reading from the scriptures and prayer there were no singing and no remarks the bodies of the victims were laid in the caskets with the mutilated portions of the head turned down so that the cuts could not be noticed the caskets were open and the faces of both looked wonderfully peaceful the mourners who were present were mrs oliver gray the stepmother of the deceased woman g f fish and wife of hartford connecticut the latter a sister of mrs borden dr bowen and wife southard h miller and a very few of the neighbours who had been invited to attend the services in the house the funeral was private that is only a very few of the immediate friends were asked to accompany the remains to the cemetery but from eleven o'clock until eleven thirty when the funeral procession of eleven hacks and two hearses started on its way there were immense crowds of people lining every sidewalk there was a detachment of police at the cemetery and another posse accompanied the remains on their way through borden and rock streets to the northern end of the city where the cemetery is located the pallbearers were for mr borden abram g hart cashier of the union savings bank george w dean a retired capitalist jerome c borden a relative of the deceased richard b borden treasurer of the troy mills in which mr borden was a director james m osborne an associate of the deceased in several mills andrew borden treasurer of the merchant's mill in which mr borden was a large owner for mrs borden james c eddy henry s buffington frank l army j henry wells simeon b chase john h boone all of them gentlemen in the highest local social and business circles as the procession wended its way along north main street many old associates of mr borden were seen to raise their hats they forgot all knowledge of the curiosity seekers who stood gaping beside them miss lizzie and miss emma borden were of course the principal mourners miss lizzie went out of the house first leaning on undertaker winwood's arm miss emma was calm and she walked quickly and took her seat without hardly glancing at the crowd staring at her both ladies were without veils the last person to leave the house was mr morse who went into a carriage with rev mr buck and dr adams the procession arrived at the cemetery about twelve twenty three o'clock when several hundred people stood about the grounds awaiting the burial the crowd was kept back by a dozen policemen under direction of sergeant john brocklehurst no one left any of the carriages during the ceremonies except the officiating clergy the bearers and mr morse rev e a buck began the funeral exercises by reading new testament passages introduced with i am the resurrection and the life he was followed by rev dr adam who prayed for the spiritual guidance of all and the inclination of all to submit to divine control besought that justice should overtake the wrong that had been done also that those who are seeking to serve the ends of justice might be delivered from mistake be helped to possess all mercifulness as well as all righteousness and in conclusion prayed that all might be delivered from the dominion of evil there was a pause of perhaps five minutes during which the carriages kept their places and no one stirred toward the grave except an elderly lady in plain dress who hastened to the casket of mrs borden and was about to kneel in reverence before it when she was moved away by an officer and went to the fence around the ground where with back to the crowd she buried her head in tears it was whispered that she had been employed long ago by the bordens the bodies were not interred in the graves as a telegraphic order had been received from boston instructing that they should not be buried 
both caskets were returned to the hearses and were deposited in a receiving tomb end of chapter six chapter seven of the fall river tragedy by edwin h porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven a reward offered on the morning after the tragedy the following notice was sent to the newspapers Quote, five thousand dollars reward the above reward will be paid to any one who may secure the arrest and conviction of the person or persons who occasioned the death of andrew j borden and his wife signed emma l borden and lizzie a borden End quote. here was an incentive calculated to invigorate the work of those who were bent on solving the great mystery but the police officers did not stop to read this announcement it was as plain as a pike staff that they were not devoting their entire time and energies toward hunting up farmhands mysterious portuguese and westport horse traders yet it is an unquestionable fact that city marshal hilliard left no stone unturned to follow every clue of this kind to its end they all ended in smoke the hatchets which had been found in the cellar had been sent off to professor wood for critical examination and the public awaited with almost breathless anxiety the making of his report upon it depended much which would assist in clearing up the case after the bodies had been placed in the receiving vault at oak grove mr morse concluded to bury the clothing which the victims wore at the time of death he employed men to do the work under orders the clothing was interred in the yard back of the barn just after this incident mr morse locked the barn door with two boston reporters on the inside and when they demanded their release he found considerable fault with the liberties people were taking on the premises he was reminded that a reward of five thousand dollars had been offered and that therefore everybody was intensely interested on the same afternoon andrew j jennings an astute lawyer and a conservative man who had been employed by the mrs borden as before stated was questioned about the case he had no particular desire to talk about the family affairs of the bordens but he admitted that as far as he knew the murdered man left no will the estate would as a matter of course go to the daughters as to the crime itself mr jennings said quote, i have read many cases in books in newspapers and in fiction in novels and i never heard of a case as remarkable as this a most outrageous brutal crime perpetrated in midday in an open house on a prominent thoroughfare and absolutely motiveless the theory advanced these quarrels about wages and about the possession of stores and that sort of thing are simply ridiculous they do not offer a motive if it was shown that the thing was done during even such a quarrel in the heat of passion it would be different but to suppose that for such a matter a man will lie in wait or steal upon his victim while asleep and hack him to death is preposterous even with revenge in his heart the sight of the victim asleep would disarm most any man then for a man to enter commit the deed and escape without being discovered would be a remarkable combination of circumstances End quote. In answer to a question as to what he thought about the possibility of the murder being committed by a member of the family, he replied, quote, Well, there are but two women of the household, and this man, Morse. He accounts so satisfactorily for every hour of that morning, showing him to be out of the house, that there seems to be no ground to base a reasonable suspicion. Further than that, he appeared on the scene almost immediately after the discovery, from the outside and in the same clothes that he had worn in the morning now it is almost impossible that the frightful work could have been done without the clothes of the person who did it being bespattered with blood then came lizzie borden dressed in the same clothes she wore before the killing this together with the improbability that any woman could do such a piece of work makes the suspicion seem altogether irrational End quote complication after complication arose as the facts in the case slowly came to light not a scream nor a groan was heard coming from the borden house that morning neither did the family living in the buffington house which stands next north of the borden house 
see anybody coming out on that morning except Mr. Borden himself. He left his home, as had been stated, about nine o'clock. Mrs. Churchill, who lives with her mother, Mrs. E. P. Buffington, across the yard, watched Mr. Borden go out. There is a fence between the two houses, and Mrs. Buffington's kitchen windows look over the fence into the Borden yard, directly opposite the side door, and not twenty-eight feet from the Borden house. The barn is but twenty feet behind the house, and the distance from the east end of the house to the east end of the barn is not more than fifty feet. Behind the barn is a fence eight feet high, protected by barbed wire. This fence divides the Borden estate from that of Dr. J. B. Chagnon, whose house fronts on Third Street. On the rear of Dr. Chagnon's place are half a dozen apple and pear trees that stand up against the fence which partitions the Borden estate from that of Dr. Chagnon. On the south side of the Borden house is Dr. Kelly's residence. A low fence stands between. Miss Addie Cheatham lives with her mother and Mrs. Churchill with Mrs. Buffington. All these persons were about their own houses all of Thursday morning. Miss Cheatham sat writing a letter at ten o'clock and at ten fifty five went to the post office. She saw no one come out of the Borden house during the time she sat near the window, fronting on the Borden lawn. She could hear the side door bang if it opened at all, but it did not, she says. Mrs. Churchill was about the house until ten fifteen when she went to the market to secure dinner. She returned about 10.50, and it was perhaps 25 minutes later when she had occasion to go into the kitchen. She looked out of the window, and just at that moment Lizzie Borden pushed open the side door of her own house. Mrs. Churchill ran over to Mrs. Borden's, and just at that minute Bridget, who had been sent to summon Dr. Bowen, returned, saying that she could not find the doctor. Mrs. Churchill went over to Lou Hall's sail loft, where her hired man, Tom Bowles, was talking and asked him to run for Dr. Chagnon. Bowles ran around the square to find the Chagnon house locked up. The family had that day gone to Portucket, and the hired girl was down street from 10.30 until nearly 12 o'clock. Bowles came back and while running up 2nd Street saw Dr. Bowen driving in front of his office, and then it was that the family physician was notified. Boll saw Bridget cleaning windows on the north and west side of the house early in the forenoon, but she was not in sight at 11.20. All the members of the Buffington household agreed that if there had been any scream from inside the Borden house, it would certainly have been heard by them. In Dr. Kelly's yard some men were working, and if the assassin proceeding on the theory that a man attempted to escape the fence at that place, he would perhaps have been seen by the labourers. He would also have to pass the barn where Lizzie was, provided, of course, he got out of the house between 10.55 and 11.20. If he jumped over the Buffington fence, he might have been seen by the inmates of the house, and to try to escape by cutting his way over the Kelly fence would have been to fall into the hands of the labourers. It would have been dangerous for him to go out by the Second Street entrance, for there are always passers-by on this thoroughfare, as well as on Third Street. Clues are absolutely indispensable adjuncts to all criminal operations, and in the Borden case they were omnipresent. Everybody seemed to have a suggestion to offer. Around the police headquarters there congregated all kinds of men, including a number of cranks. Those of the latter class who could not report in form sent in their contribution by mail until Marshal Hilliard's death was piled high with curious and original documents. But the police themselves worked night and day and kept their doings as secret as possible, under the circumstances. Before two days passed, the press all over the country began to assail the work of the officers, and it was kept up with a vigour worthy a better cause. Undoubtedly, this criticism was brought about by the fact that the twenty-five or more newspaper men who interviewed the Marshal daily, or said they did, gleaned the fact that he harboured the suspicion that a member of the family had committed the crimes. But it was clear to all who wished to see it that he paid as much attention to hunting down outside clues as he did in pursuing his inquiries in the other direction. The more plausible clues were diligently followed. 
a theory which gave promise of good results was as follows on tuesday before the murder about nine o'clock in the morning a horse and buggy turned into second street out of spring street and came to a halt in front of the borden house a young man who was employed near by sat in his buggy which stood opposite the house and was facing south he took the trouble to watch closely the two men who occupied the buggy one of them got out and rang the doorbell mr borden answered the call and the stranger was admitted in about ten minutes he came out and resumed his seat in the buggy and the pair drove off in the direction of pleasant street this circumstance was considered of importance when it became known that the police had information of another person who had seen a strange man about the premises a boy named kirouac at the time of his trip down second street this man gave a most rigid examination by the police and he stuck to his story this clue was effectually disposed of by the authorities who found another person who was with kirouac at the time of his trip down second street this man gave a particular story of his movements that morning and denied that young kirouac had seen a suspicious character adjoining the yard of the borden place is the house occupied by dr chagnon on the evening in question the physician was unexpectedly summoned away and asked dr collett if as a favour he would allow the latter's little son to attend to the telephone during dr chagnon's absence the boy was absent and dr collett sent his daughter to dr chagnon's resident but upon her arrival the doctor had departed and the office was locked the little girl decided to await the arrival of some one and sat down in the yard for that purpose soon the man who had driven the doctor away returned and the office was opened miss chagnon remained in the yard adjoining the borden place she was there at the time it was alleged the unknown man jumped the fence and she declares that she saw no one attempt anything of the kind but the fact that there was a considerable extent of barbed wire along its top was submitted in answer barbed wire necessitates careful handling and it was argued in support of the truth of the girl's statement and the falsity of the other story that the passage of a man over such a barrier would require such time as to render detection possible notwithstanding the fact that mr morse had clearly established an alibi there were those who insisted that he knew more of the murder than he had made public proceeding on this theory the officers took up the task of investigating mr morse officer medley was given the work and in company with inspector hathaway of the new bedford police he discovered that mr morse had lived as before stated in dartmouth there was at that time a camp of itinerant horse traders in the town of westport it was related that mr morse had had dealings with these men and the sensational press soon coupled his name with a possible hired assassin a member of the gang of traders this story was given colour by the then unexploded story of young kirouac especially when it became known that officer medley had discovered a man who seemed to fit the description of the stranger alleged to have been seen around the premises this suspect was the head trader in the westport camp and when accosted he readily consented to come to fall river and surrender himself he succeeded in showing beyond a reasonable doubt that he was in the city of new bedford at the time of the borden murders within a few hours after the murder was reported a detail of police was sent to guard the house the policy was kept up for more than a week and as early as friday morning the officers on guard had instructions to keep the mrs bordens john v morse and bridget sullivan under the strictest surveillance and not allow either of them to leave the city if they left the premises they were followed the medical examiner the marshal and the officers at work on the case were constantly coming and going about the house and while it may have appeared to them that the problem was in a fair way of solution the public was getting more and more hopelessly involved in the mass of stories which were circulated from day to day the letter which was alleged to have been received by mrs borden on the morning of the tragedy continued to excite public interest once a week the new york journal offered a reward of five hundred dollars for the writer of the note and the fall river news implored its readers to unite in one in one effort in the cause of justice and if possible find the note and deliver it into the editor's hands the missive however was not found 
Miss Lizzie A. Borden seemingly put an end to that theory when she told Dr. Dolan that she had attempted to find the note, and being unsuccessful she feared it had been burned in the kitchen stove. Not one of the household seemed to be able to give more than a general idea of the contents of the note. It was from a friend who was ill, but as neither the friend nor the note could be found by the united efforts of the police and members of the family, the matter was dropped early in the investigation. End of chapter 7chapter eight of the fall river tragedy by edwin h porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight a sermon on the murders on saturday the case took on an unexpected phase superintendent o m hanscom of the boston office of the pinkerton detective agency appeared on the scene he was not employed by the mayor of fall river nor the marshal of police and it soon became noised abroad that he was present in the interests of the mrs borden with the avowed intention of clearing up the mystery in company with mr jennings he visited the borden house and was in consultation with members of the family for about two hours detective hanscom remained in fall river nearly two days and then disappeared as mysteriously as he came it was the universal opinion at the time that the pinkertons would unearth the assassin in a short while but the public was never informed as to the reasons why they withdrew from the case it was believed however that there was a rupture between marshal hilliard's men and the pinkertons this may or may not have been the cause of their sudden disappearance sunday morning the central church worshippers met with the first church congregation in the stone church on main street all of the pews were filled, many being in their seats, some half-hour before the service began. It was supposed that the Rev. W. Walker Jubb, who occupied the pulpit, would make some allusion to the awful experiences through which one family in his charge had been compelled to pass during the week, and the supposition was correct. Mr. Jubb read for the morning lesson a portion of Matthew, containing the significant words which imply that what is concealed shall be revealed. In his prayer, Mr. Jubb evoked the divine blessing on the community, rendering thanks for the blessings bestowed on many, and pausing, referred to the murder of two innocent persons. He prayed fervently that right might prevail, and that in good time the terrible mystery might be cleared away, that the people of the city might do everything in their power to assist the authorities, and asked for divine guidance for the police, that they might prosecute unflinchingly and unceasingly the search for the murderer. Mr. Jubb prayed that their hands might be strengthened, that their movements might be characterized by discretion, and that wisdom and great power of discernment might be given to them in their work. And while we hope, he continued, for the triumph of justice, let our acts be tempered with mercy. Help us to refrain from giving voice to those insinuations and innuendos which we have no right to utter. Save us from blasting a life, innocent and blameless. Keep us from taking the sweetness from the future by our ill-advised words and let us be charitable as we remember the poor grief-stricken family and minister unto them the clergyman asked that those who were writing of the crime might be careful of the reputations of the living which could so easily be undermined for his text mr jubb took the first chapter of ecclesiastes ninth verse the thing that hath been is that which shall be and that which is done is that which shall be done and there is no new thing under the sun the speaker continued the monotonies of life and expatiated on the causes of indifference in persons who would be nothing if not geniuses drawing lessons from successes in humble sphere at the end of the sermon mr jubb stepped to the side of the pulpit and said slowly and impressively quote, i cannot close my sermon this morning without speaking of the horrible crime that has startled our beloved city this week ruthlessly taking from our church household two respected and esteemed members i cannot close without referring to my pain and surprise at the atrocity of the outrage a more brutal cunning daring and fiendish murder i have never heard of in all my life what must have been the person who could have been guilty of such a revolting crime one to commit such a murder must have been without heart without soul a fiend incarnate 
the very vilest of degraded and depraved humanity or he must have been a maniac the circumstances execution and all the surroundings cover it with mystery profound explanations and evidence as to both perpetrator and motive are shrouded in a mystery that is almost inexplicable that such a crime could have been committed during the busy hours of the day right in the heart of a populous city is passing comprehension as we ponder we exclaim in our perplexity why was the deed done what could have induced anybody to engage in such a butchery where is the motive when men resort to crime it is for plunder for gain from enmity in sudden anger or for revenge strangely nothing of this nature enters into this case and again i ask what was the motive i believe and am only voicing your feelings fully when i say that i hope the criminal will be speedily brought to justice this city cannot afford to have in its midst such an inhuman brute as the murderer of andrew j borden and his wife why a man who could conceive and execute such a murder as that would not hesitate to burn the city i trust that the police may do their duty and lose no opportunity which might lead to the capture of the criminal i would impress upon them that they should not say too much and thus unconsciously assist in defeating the ends of justice i also trust that the press and i say this because i recognize its influence and power i trust that it will use discretion in disseminating its theories and conclusions and that pens may be guided by consideration and charity i would wish the papers to remember that by casting a groundless or undeserved insinuation that they may blacken and blast the life for ever like a tree smitten by a bolt of lightning a life which has always commanded respect whose acts and motives have always been pure and holy let us ourselves curb our tongues and preserve a blameless life from undeserved suspicions i think i have the right to ask for the prayers of this church and of my own congregation the murdered husband and wife were members of this church and a daughter now stands in the same relation to each one of you as you as church members do to each other god help and comfort her poor stricken girls may they both be comforted and may they both realize how fully god is their refuge End quote. marshal hilliard and his officers after two days and two nights work concluded that the case was of so much importance that it was advisable to call district attorney hosea m knowlton of new bedford massachusetts into their councils and accordingly he arrived from his home in new bedford on saturday morning a short consultation was held at police headquarters and then adjourned until the afternoon the district attorney marshal hilliard state officer seaver mayor coughlin and dr dolan met according to agreement in one of the parlours of the melon house the marshal took all the evidence which he had collected in the shape of notes papers etc together with other documents bearing on the case into the room where the five men were closeted and they commenced at the beginning at the close of the conference held earlier in the afternoon the district attorney had advised the officers to proceed with the utmost caution and was extremely conservative in the conclusions which he found at that time he had not been made acquainted with all the details at the melon house consultation the same caution was observed the quintet were working on one of the most remarkable criminal records in history and were obliged to proceed slowly the marshal began at the beginning and continued to the end he was assisted in his explanation by the mayor and the medical examiner mr seaver listened there were details almost without end and all of them were picked to pieces and viewed in every conceivable light considerable new evidence was introduced and then the testimony of officers not present was submitted which showed that miss lizzie borden might have been mistaken in one important particular the marshal informed the district attorney that the murder had occurred between ten minutes of eleven o'clock and thirteen minutes after eleven on thursday morning the time was as accurate as they could get it and they had spared no pains to fix it the alarm had been given by miss lizzie borden the daughter of the murdered man when she returned from the barn at the moment of the discovery she did not know that her stepmother was also dead though she explained afterwards that she thought her mother had left the house it was but a short distance from the barn to the house nobody had been found who had seen anybody leaving the yard of the borden house or entering it 
although a number of people who were named were sitting by their windows close by. It was also true that nobody had seen Miss Borden enter or leave the barn. She had explained that she went to the stable to procure some lead for a fishing line which she was going to use at Warren. Here there was a stumbling block which puzzled the district attorney and his assistants. On the day of the murder Miss Lizzie had explained that she went to the loft of the barn for the lead and an officer who was examining the premises also went to the loft. It was covered with dust and there were no tracks to prove that any person had been there for weeks. He took particular notice of the fact and reported back that he had walked about on the dust-covered floor on purpose to discover whether or not his own feet left any tracks. He said that they did and thought it singular that anybody could have visited the floor a short time before him and make no impression in the dust. The lower floor of the stable told no such tale as it was evident that it had been used more frequently and the dust had not accumulated there. The conclusion was that in the excitement incident to the awful discovery Miss Borden had forgotten just where she went for the lead. When she found her father lying on the lounge she ran to the stairs and ascended three or four steps to call Maggie. Maggie is the name by which Bridget Sullivan was called by members of the family. She did not call for her stepmother because, as she stated afterwards, she did not think she was in. Then came the history of the mysterious letter. Miss Lizzie had said that on the morning of the tragedy her stepmother received a letter asking her to visit a sick friend. She knew that at about nine o'clock her stepmother went upstairs to put shams on the pillows, and she did not see her again. It was that letter which led her to believe that her stepmother had gone out. Here was stumbling block number two. The officers had searched all over the house for that letter, the marshal said, but had failed to find any trace of it. Miss Lizzie had feared that it had been burned in the kitchen stove. Mr. Marshall's men had found other letters and fragments of letters in the waste paper basket and had put them together piece by piece. The one letter that was wanted had not been found. It was considered singular that, with all the furore that had been raised over this note, the woman who wrote it has not come forward before this and cleared up the mystery. It was also strange that the boy who delivered the note had not made himself known. It was believed that every boy in town old enough to do an errand had visited the house since the tragedy, but the particular boy was kept in the background. It was presumed that Mrs. Borden's correspondent feared the notoriety, which would come to her if she disclosed her identity, but it was unfortunate that she should allow any such scruples to overcome what ought to be a desire to assist in every way possible in unravelling the knot. The marshal, medical examiner and mayor then carefully rehearsed step by step the summoning of Dr. Bowen, who was not at home when the murder was committed, and his ghastly discovery on the second floor. No theory other than that Mrs. Borden was murdered first was entertained. Miss Lizzie Borden's demeanour during the many interviews which the police had with her was described at length, and the story of John V. Morse's whereabouts was retold. Thorough investigation of theories advanced upon the strength of Bridget Sullivan's statement that the crime was committed by the Portuguese employed upon the farm of Andrew Borden in Somerset resulted in placing them with the other numerous opinions and possibilities which have been exploded by the authorities. In the excitement attending the discovery of the bodies of the murdered couple, inquiries directed to the domestic elicited answers to the effect that the Portuguese must have done it. The individual referred to was a Swede labourer, and Marshal Hilliard thereupon drove to the Somerset farm. The investigation there was necessarily brief in its character, but such as it is satisfied the marshal that the labourer, whom the Sullivan woman designated as the Portuguese, was far removed from the house on Second Street at the time the murders were committed. In their persistent following of every possible clue, the authorities deemed it advisable to make an exhaustive examination regarding the whereabouts of the Swedish labourer. At the time of the tragedy, and with this end in view, another trip had been made to Somerset. The result confirmed the opinion of Marshal Hilliard. The man established a thoroughly satisfactory alibi, and the officials were forced to acquit him of the possibility of any knowledge or of complicity in the affair. Sometime before, Andrew Borden had purchased some property located across the river. The property was owned by a number of persons, heirs of a former owner, and among them was one who was strangely disinclined to part with the place, at least at the figures satisfactory to the other owners. 
his dissatisfaction was made manifest to such an extent that among the stories circulated regarding the affair was one which suggested the possibility of this dissatisfied individual having some knowledge of the ones responsible for the tragedy this story although without reliable foundation it was deemed best to investigate also and accordingly the person referred to received a visit from the government officials the desired knowledge was easily secured and the fact readily established that the party in question had no connection whatever with the murder of the aged couple after this extended conference of the highest authorities in the county it was given out that the district attorney was much pleased with the work of the police and that an inquest would be held immediately before judge josiah c blaisdell of the second district court of bristol which is the fall river local court End of chapter eight chapter nine of the fall river tragedy by edwin h porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine theories advanced by monday morning following the tragedy the fact that some member of the borden family was suspected of the crime by the police became a matter of public comment but withal there was nothing to substantiate this suspicion except that the officers kept up their daily and nightly watch of the house and its surroundings public sentiment began to be divided the police had a large following who believed implicitly in their ability to ferret out the crimes and it soon became nosed about that no lesser person than the district attorney himself was in hearty cooperation with the officers and shared with them the fear that some member of the household was the author of the crime whether this rumour was based upon fact or not will be decided by those who follow the course of subsequent events friends of the borden household became mightily aroused to the trend of public opinion and to the now undisguised work of the police four days had passed and the officers of the law seemed to find no other clue than that which kept them inside the borden yard those people who found that it was beyond the pale of human conception to suspect that the crime could have been committed by a member of the household began to rally to the support of the suspected parties and the influence was felt in certain quarters yet it did not disarm the frightful suspicion cruel and groundless though it might have been the public had been led to suspect that arrests would be made on or before saturday night people became confirmed in the view that there never would be a conviction and sentence of the guilty party up to this time absolutely nothing but circumstantial evidence had been discovered and for the most part it was fair to suppose that no evidence of any other nature had been gathered this was an unpleasant conclusion to reach and men did not arrive at it cheerfully but they were forced to accept it nevertheless they saw but one bright spot in the murky horizon and that was a tiny one the government might sooner or later strike a clue which would put them on the right track of the assassin who whether male or female might break down and confess but if the assassin had no confederates and kept his own counsel he was safe such was the course of reasoning pursued on monday and it seemed to be logical the police had been terribly in earnest in their work and they had pursued it efficiently and effectively they had been severely criticized as they undoubtedly expected to be but perhaps that was unjust at the start they were caught at a disadvantage they were the victims of circumstances which could entangle them but one day in the year and perhaps a mistake was made when they did not take absolute and immediate possession of the house barn and yard and place a guard in every room yet had this been done the well-meaning public would perhaps have been more caustic in criticism if they did make a mistake it was a matter which no human being could sit in judgment upon they had to deal with a horror calculated to stagger any detective force in the world whatever its training skill or experience an unparalleled horror it may be but one without an equal in the annals of new england crime that a false step was taken during the first hour of the commotion was not surprising among the many theories which were advanced as to who was responsible for the crime that of mr john beatty then an alderman of fall river was suffice to show how deeply the people had thought upon the subject mr beatty said in a published interview my theory and it is mine alone is one formed from the circumstances of the case 
The brain which devised this crime was cunning enough to devise beforehand the means to escape detention. Supposing it was a woman, she was cunning enough to wear a loose wrapper which would have covered her clothes, and gloves which would have protected her hands from the stains of blood. If so, there was time to burn both wrapper and gloves in the hot fire, which was known to have been burning in the kitchen stove at the time of the tragedy. The alderman's theory is simply given here to show the trend of public opinion, and while it was perhaps his own, there were many conservative people who shared it with him. On Sunday, two outside clues came up for consideration of the authorities. Special officers Harrington and Doherty were sent out to find one Thomas Walker, and succeeded. The man was taken to task concerning his whereabouts on Thursday, and he told his story. He was a tailor and worked for Thomas Carey on Main Street, had been recently married and moved into a tenement belonging to Andrew J. Borden, which was located on 4th Street. The rumour had been that Walker had experienced domestic troubles and after a long period of temperance had taken some intoxicants. Three weeks before the tragedy, Mr. Borden called at Carey's shop and had a talk with Walker. The rent was due and Mr. Borden wanted it paid or else he wanted Walker to move out. After some argument, the tenant concluded to move, and did so. It was rumoured that unpleasant words had passed between the two men, and the police deemed it advisable to give Walker a chance to make an explanation. Mr. Walker told so straight and clear a story of his whereabouts on that day that it was taken for truth, and especially so when Mr. Carey, his employer, corroborated every statement which he made. The other clue was to the effect that a Portuguese had been seen burying a bloody hatchet on the Borden farm in Swansea. Officer Medley visited the farm and searched in vain where the axe was alleged to have been buried. He found a Portuguese labourer who had been on the farm all day Thursday and who had killed some chickens for market. Another clue which showed a strong point in support of Miss Borden's story of having been in the barn was that told by one Hyman Lubinsky. He said that while driving on 2nd Street at 10.30 a.m. on Thursday, he saw a woman in the Borden yard, noticed her walk from the barn to the side door on the north and enter. The description which he gave of the woman fitted that of Miss Lizzie, and it appeared to verify her story of having been in the barn as before stated. This man was not introduced by the defence at the preliminary trial. But there was a clue which caused no end of comment, both personal and in the press. Information reached the police that Officer Joseph Hyde had seen a suspicious-looking stranger in the vicinity of 2nd Street on that morning. On the following Tuesday, Dr. B. J. Handy, one of the best-known physicians in the city, made public the fact that he also saw a very strange-appearing man on 2nd Street on the morning of the murder between 10.25 and 10.45 o'clock. The doctor took some notice of this man, and in the afternoon, while in conversation with his wife, he became more and more impressed with the idea that the stranger had some connection with the awful crime. This theory became a matter of much importance, and Dr. Handy did not at this time know that Officer Hyde was reported to have seen a similar person. Dr. Handy's statement was that at some time within fifteen minutes of 10.30 o'clock that morning, he was driving down 2nd Street when, as he was passing the residence of Dr. Kelly, which is the next house south of the Borden premises, his attention was attracted to a pedestrian walking slowly along the sidewalk near the Borden house. Ordinarily, the face of a stranger would not excite much interest in the mind of Dr. Handy, inasmuch as he was continually passing the streets of the city on his professional calls. In this case, however, he looked twice at the passer-by, and even turned in his carriage to inspect him more closely. Just what caused him to do this the doctor did not definitely explain. There was a peculiarity about the man which he could not exactly describe. The individual was about thirty years of age, five feet five inches in height, weight perhaps about a hundred and twenty-five or a hundred and thirty pounds. His clothes were of light grey, of just what cut and texture the doctor could not positively state, nor could he tell whether the man's hat was of felt or straw. It was not the dress which attracted Dr. Handy, it was the man's features which he saw. He was pale, almost white, not with the ghastly pallor of a sick man, 
but rather the whitish appearance of a man whose face had not been touched by the sun's rays, who might have been in confinement, or whose work was of such nature as to keep him constantly in a cellar. There was something beyond this paleness which aroused the doctor particularly to observe him, and that was that he appeared to be in a state of intense nervousness. Within an hour after Dr. Handy had heard of the terrible tragedy, and within three hours after he had seen the queer-looking stranger, he had in his own mind decided that the unknown knew something of the murders. He communicated his suspicions to the police and gave a complete description of the man. More unfavourable comment was directed at the authorities, because they failed to find this man as readily as they did other suspects than was apparently absolutely necessary. Column after column of the leading newspapers were devoted to the discussion of this stranger, until he became known as Dr. Handy's Wild-Eyed Man, and while the police were accused of neglecting this seemingly important clue, there are trustworthy men who know and can show beyond contradiction that he was sought after in the most diligent manner. So faithfully, in fact, did the officers search for the stranger, all the while neglecting, if it may be called by that name, to follow more plausible clues. Many of them finally said they were forced to the conclusion that the wild-eyed man was a myth, and that with all due respect to Dr. Handy's opinions and conclusions. But myth or reality, some of the friends of Miss Lizzie insisted that he be materialised if the former, or produced if the latter. There was a man known to the police as Mike the Soldier, and he, in a measure, seemed to fit the description of the wild-eyed. Pursuing the plan which Marshal Hilliard did from the beginning, of following every clue, no matter how trivial or unimportant, his men were sent in every direction to hunt the curious stranger. Mike the soldier was discovered, as will be seen later. End of chapter 9Chapter Ten of the Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten. There was intense excitement in Fall River the day the murder was reported. It grew hourly and showed no signs of abatement, but rather continued on the increase until on Tuesday following it was at fever heat. Men no longer gathered in knots on the sidewalks. On some of the streets, and particularly the thoroughfares in the vicinity of the police station, people were scattered along the curbing for blocks. The report that an inquest was to be held in the second district court before Judge J. C. Blaisdell was sufficient to draw the crowds. Everything was in readiness by ten o'clock, and when a hack started for the Borden house to convey Miss Lizzie and a friend to the police station where the inquest was to be held, the news spread with great rapidity. Business was partially suspended in the centre of the city, as it had been on Thursday noon, when the story of the tragedy was first made known. The report went out that a hack containing Marshal Hilliard and Officer Harrington had gone to the Borden House. Groups of men found time to rush to Court Square, and to the streets approaching, and await developments. Others still more curious ran after the carriage, and others more on the alert, to jump toward Main Street in case the driver took that route. Hundreds who were not so well informed were content to join the groups mentioned, and to stand still without asking questions. What was there to see? A hack drawn by two horses, with two ladies on the back seat, and two officers in the front seat, dressed in citizens' clothes. Men on wagons saw the vehicle coming, and they drove post-haste for the police station. Men, women, and children joined in a wild scramble for the narrow alleyway, and Court Square was choked in a twinkling. The crowd would have waited complacently all the afternoon, rather than have missed one brief glance at the carriage and its occupants. The driver saw what was going to happen, and he laid the whip on his horses, but to no purpose. The sightseers would not be outdone, and they arrived ahead of time. Windows were thrown open, heads were thrust out, Crowds pushed through the streets, and for ten minutes it seemed as if the whole town, within a stone's throw of police headquarters, was vibrating. It was not strange that the tension tightened. The community had reached a point when it felt that it must clear up the mystery or go insane. Men complained that they went to bed with murder on the brain, and that the same grim phantom was visible the moment they opened their eyes in the morning. 
It is the pace that tells, and for five days the pace had been furious. The human mind will not cease to work. Its possessor has no control over it when it takes hold of such a subject as this. It demands an assassin caught red-handed with the dripping axe concealed beneath his coat. It asks that the evidence of his guilt be made conclusive. It wants no guesswork. Then it attempts to rid itself of the horrible theory on which it had been feeding for one hundred and twenty hours, and travels off in another direction. It conceals a maniac in the upper part of the Borden house, watches him kill the woman, follows him as he descends the stairs and slays Mr. Borden, sees him pass out unobserved and takes him off, and sets him down a thousand miles from the scene of his work, safe from capture. This would be a relief to the mind, if it were more than temporary, but the mind does all this in the twinkling of an eye, and in the next moment asks why the maniac could not be appeased with one slaughter, and is back again at the beginning asking questions and hunting clues. This is not overstating the mental condition of the populace during the first few weeks subsequent to the killing. Up to the time of opening the inquest there had been nothing but circumstantial evidence found whereon to base a suspicion of guilt, and the fact that District Attorney Knowlton and Attorney General Albert E. Pillsbury, a distinguished and acute lawyer, had been called into the case showed that the authorities needed the wise counsel of the foremost legal talent in Massachusetts before taking the all-important step of making an arrest. If, after a thorough sifting of this circumstantial evidence, it was discovered that the theory of the state was wrong, then the guard would be called away from the Borden house, and the authorities would be compelled to start on a new trail. The police were free to admit that there was but one theory, one clue, and if it proved unsuccessful they had no other to take its place. Officer Doherty was sent to the Borden house to bring Bridget Sullivan to the police station, to appear as the first witness at the inquest. He had some difficulty at the house because the impression had gone forth that he intended to arrest the servant girl. For a time there were tears and lamentation, but finally the officer made it understood that the only intention was to have the young woman talk to the district attorney. On the way to the station Miss Sullivan's tears came forth again. She told the officer that she had given all information in her power to the police, and that she knew nothing more than what she had stated. Talking about the family relations, she remarked that things didn't go in the house as they should, and that she wanted to leave and had threatened to do so several times in the past two years. But Mrs. Borden, she declared, was a lovely woman, and I remained there because she wanted me to. Now that she is gone, however, I will stay there no longer than I have to, and will leave just as soon as the police will allow me. Bridget also said that the strain of remaining in the place was intense. All the women there, who were members of the household, the Borden girls and Miss Sullivan, were almost ready to give way to nervous prostration. Awaiting her presence were District Attorney Knowlton, State Officer Seaver, Marshal Hilliard, and Medical Examiner Dolan, and soon after they were joined by Mayor Coughlin. A report that an inquest was under way quickly spread, but received prompt denial by the marshal. When asked the meaning of the gathering, he said it was an inquiry, and the officers were searching for information. The domestic was in the presence of the officials for several hours, and was subject to a searching cross-examination, every detail of the tragedy being gone over exhaustively. After this informed conference in the marshal's office, the party adjourned to the district courtroom, which is situated on the second floor of the building. There were present Judge Blaisdell, District Attorney Knowlton, City Marshal Hilliard, District Officers Seaver and Rhodes, Medical Examiner Dolan, and District Attorney's stenographer Miss Annie White, and a couple of police officials who were among the first called to the house of the Bordens. Bridget Sullivan was in deep distress, and, if she had not already cried her eyes out, would probably have been very much agitated. On the contrary, while tremulous in voice, and now and then crying a little, she was calm enough to receive the interrogatories without exhibiting much emotion, and answered them comprehensively. The first question put to her was in regard to her whereabouts all through the morning of Thursday up to the time of the murder. She answered that she had been doing her regular work in the kitchen on the first floor. She had washed the breakfast dishes, 
She saw Miss Lizzie pass through the kitchen after breakfast time, and the young lady might have passed through again. Bridget continued that she had finished up her work downstairs and resumed window washing on the third floor, which had been begun the preceding day. She might have seen Mrs. Borden as she went upstairs. She could hardly remember. Mr. Borden had already left the house. The witness went up to the third floor and, while washing windows, talked down to the sidewalk with a friend. She went on with the windows and might have made considerable noise as she raised and lowered them. She heard no noise inside the house in the meantime. By and by she heard Miss Lizzie call her. She answered at once and went downstairs to the first floor, not thinking of looking about on the second floor, where Mrs. Borden was found dead shortly afterwards, because there was nothing to make her look around as she obeyed Miss Lizzie's call. She found Mr. Borden dead and Lizzie at the door of the room. The last point touched was the letter sent to Mrs. Borden, warning her that she might be poisoned. Bridget said she knew nothing about this matter at all. Bridget finished her testimony shortly after noon, and then returned to the matron's apartments. City Marshal Hilliard had served the summons on Miss Lizzie at the house, and she arrived at the station about two o'clock. About this time, attorney Andrew J. Jennings appeared at the City Marshal's office, and applied for permission to be present at the inquest in order to look after the interests of the witnesses, but he was refused. The counsel argued at length against being excluded, but the court would not yield, and he was compelled to withdraw. All the afternoon, Miss Lizzie was kept on the witness stand and testified to what she knew of the killing of her father and stepmother. And at the close of the day, District Attorney Knowlton gave out a bulletin stating that two witnesses had been examined. As the inquest was held behind doors closed and doubly guarded by the police, there was no way of finding out what had transpired within. Although the inquest was held in secret, the day was marked by numerous happenings which lent interest to the already famous case. The Attorney General, who had been in consultation with the local authorities, left the city in the afternoon, but before going he took occasion to say, to an assembly of newspaper men, that the case was not so mysterious as had been reported, and bantered them concerning their clues. Perhaps his conversation was a bit of sarcasm. He was informed that the murder was mysterious enough to baffle the police, and that five days had elapsed, and that there had been no arrest. Somebody took the pains further to inform him that the evidence was purely circumstantial. "'You newspaper men know, or ought to know,' said Mr. Pillsbury, "'that you may not be in a position to pronounce on the case. There may be some things which you have not heard of, and which may have an important bearing.' The reply was to the effect that the head men who had been working on the case had conceded at noon that day that they had no other evidence, and that they ought to be pretty good authority. "'Police officers do not always tell what they know,' was the parting shot of the Attorney General as he withdrew. At five o'clock Bridget Sullivan left the police station in company with Officer Doherty and passed down Court Square. She was dressed in a green gown, with hat to match, and appeared to be nervous and excited. Nobody knew her, however, and she attracted no attention whatever. She went to the Borden house for a bundle, and, still accompanied by Officer Doherty, walked to No. 95 Division Street, where her cousin, Patrick Harrington, lives, and where she passed the night. She was allowed to go on her own recognizance, and seemed to be much relieved to get away from the Borden house. The government impressed her with the necessity of saying nothing about the proceedings at the inquest, and she was warned not to talk with anybody regarding her testimony. Bridget Sullivan is one of fourteen children. She came to this country six years ago. For three years she worked for a number of families in this city, and the police reported that she bore an excellent reputation. For three years she had lived with the Borden family, and for some time had been threatening to return to Ireland. She said that Mrs. Borden was a very kind mistress, and that she was very much attached to her. Mrs. Borden used to talk to her about going home to Ireland, and used to tell her that she would be lonely without her. Accordingly, the girl said that she did not have the heart to leave, but she never expected to be in such an awful predicament. She had been terrified ever since the tragedy. Professor Wood of Cambridge arrived on the four o'clock train Monday afternoon, but was not called to testify at the inquest on Tuesday. 
he was questioned regarding the nature of his visit and stated that he had come to fall river to see what there was for him to do have you examined any axe professor was asked professor wood hesitated a moment and said i have seen an axe will you make an examination down here was the next question i do not expect to was the reply i could not very well bring down my laboratory at six o'clock miss lizzie borden accompanied by her friend mrs george brigham and marshall hilliard entered a carriage and drove to miss borden's home the excitement was not over for the day but the district attorney's bulletin made it plain that the authorities would make no further move that night when the inquest adjourned the situation in a nutshell was this the authorities were evidently convinced that they could rely on bridget sullivan and she was released from custody she had been in custody since thursday noon miss lizzie borden had been partially examined and the police had completed their work on the case so far as the collection of evidence was concerned there was almost as much mystery about the scenes incidental to the inquest as there was about the murder in the first place the authorities seemed to want it understood that there was no inquest some of them intimated that the government was simply conducting an informal examination with a view to drawing from the witnesses their last stories and making a comparison of them in fact that was the impression which prevailed up to noon and it was reported that the oath was not administered nevertheless the great pains which all connected with the proceedings took to keep information from the public made it plain that the officials were attempting to conclude the case it was common talk around the police station tuesday evening that there was something very significant in the fact that bridget sullivan the only government witness with the exception of miss lizzie borden and a person on whom the prosecution must rely to explain certain occurrences before and after the tragedy was allowed to go upon her own recognizance and the bearing of the officials who had worked up the case indicated that they were in possession of information which they considered very valuable and which they had before been unable to secure at a meeting of the board of aldermen held that evening the following order was adopted quote, inasmuch as a terrible crime has been committed in this city requiring an unusually large number of men to do police duty it is hereby ordered that the city marshal be and he is hereby directed to employ such extra constables as he may deem necessary for the detection of the criminals the expense to be charged to the appropriation for police end quote up to this time for all the public knew the police had been unsuccessful in the hunt for the weapon that was still one of the missing links in the chain of evidence which was claimed in the afternoon a story became circulated that peleg brightman a paper hanger had been at work in south somerset near the two farms owned by the late mr borden in that region the story went that a bloody hatchet had been found on one of the brayton farms the implement being wrapped up in a piece of newspaper and hidden in a labourer's house as the story circulated a great breeze of inquiry and excitement arose several vehicles containing newspaper reporters started immediately for the scene of the alleged discovery officer harrington was also dispatched to the farm by the marshal the several parties reached the place about four thirty o'clock and found a portuguese woman in charge of the house the woman was frightened by her visitors and being unable to understand english well there was no little excitement she called her husband from the fields and he understood he said he knew nothing about the finding of such a hatchet as had been described but gave the squad of investigators leave to search the house they looked it all over the only weapon with an edge which they found was a hatchet lying on the kitchen shelf it had no blood-stains upon it the police returned to the city in the evening but some of the newspaper men continued their search to the two borden farms and did not return till late after the issuance of the official bulletin with its practical announcement that there would be no further developments before the continuation of the inquest on wednesday morning there was a decided lull in the feeling of general anticipation which had existed for the past few days this brief lull and the authoritative knowledge that nothing of importance would develop until the renewal of the inquest and the reappearance of bridget sullivan and lizzie borden before the authorities came as a great relief temporary though its character was and confident in the assurance 
the wearied people and the weary workers retired from the streets and at midnight the city was asleep as was natural the newspapers throughout the country began at about this stage of the proceedings to take sides upon the question of the wisdom exhibited by the police the editorial quoted below is from the springfield republican and is a fair sample of the opinions of those who saw the investigation from a distance it read quote, all through the investigations carried on by the fall river police a lack of ability has been shown seldom equalled and causes they assign for connecting the daughter with the murder are on a par with their other exhibitions of lack of wisdom because some one unknown to them and too smart for them to catch butchered two people in the daytime on a principal street of the city using brute force far in excess of that possessed by this girl they conclude that there is probable reason to believe that she is the murderess because they found no one walking along the street with his hands and clothes reeking with blood they conclude that it is probable after swinging the axe with the precision and effect of a butcher she washed the blood from her hands and clothes End quote. wednesday morning the inquest was resumed at its close the district attorney issued the following bulletin quote, inquest continued at ten today witnesses examined were lizzie borden dr s w bowen adelaide b churchill hiram c carrington john v morse and emma borden nothing developed for publication End quote. among those present in addition to the prosecuting officials was professor wood of harvard to whom the stomachs of the murdered couple had been sent for analysis after an hour's stay in the police station a carriage was ordered by the marshal and upon its arrival professor wood entered next a trunk was brought out under the charge of medical examiner dolan and placed upon the carriage the latter bade professor wood good-bye and the cambridge man was driven to the station it was promptly presumed that included in the contents of the trunk were the axe and articles requiring analysis and an inquiry covering these points was directed to dr dolan he declined to affirm or deny anything and informed the newspaper representatives in a jocular vein that all the clues and secrets of the case were carefully secreted in the trunk all this time public interest was centred in the fact of miss lizzie's presence in the courtroom and it was felt that the most important hours of the investigation were dragging along if the young woman toward whom such suspicion had been directed should come forth and retire to her home but little more could be expected in this direction certainly after the searching examination which all knew she was undergoing any further questioning could but be useless and there were those in the gathered crowds in the vicinity of court square who openly proclaimed their earnest convictions that with the exit of lizzie borden from the station house the cloud of suspicions which had hovered about her must be dispelled with the accompanying practical admission by the authorities that they were unable to connect her with the commission of the crime this statement was based upon the widespread knowledge that the police had been moving with the greatest caution in their investigation upon the thoroughly understood line the members of the borden family held a high position their wealth was great and apart from the fact that their interests were being guarded by one of the ablest attorneys in the city it was known that influential friends of the family had deemed it wise to request the marshal to move with the utmost care before taking active steps toward the arrest of any member of that household perhaps the accusation that had certain suspected persons been possessed of less wealth and influence they would long ere this have been apprehended was unjust to the hard-working police but the fact was patent to everybody that the extreme care in this particular case reached far beyond the usual particularly as all the time every movement of the borden girls was only made under the surveillance of a police officer during the afternoon carpenter morris daly the marshal and officer harrington appeared at the borden house the first mentioned had a kit of carpenter's tools in his hand and the three men entered the house after half an hour they came out and were noticed carrying three bundles these contained parts of the woodwork about the doors and windows which showed blood spots marshal hilliard previous to the opening of the inquest had employed detective edwin d mchenry of providence rhode island to assist his men in running down clues mr mchenry was destined to form an important factor in the case and its subsequent developments as will be seen farther on his first work so far as the police knew 
was in connection with Officer Medley in following the clue given to the police by Dr. Handy. It was at a cottage at Marion, owned by Dr. Handy, that Miss Lizzie Borden intended to spend her vacation, and this, coupled with the prominence of the physician, made the authorities feel particularly anxious to ascertain the personality of this wild-eyed man. Confident, though they were, that he was entirely innocent of any complicity in the tragedy at the Borden house. The chase was not a difficult one, and the individual was located promptly by the officers. He was Michael Graham, better known as Mike the Soldier, a weaver employed in Border City Mill No. 2, and for some days previous to Thursday he had been drinking freely. The officers learned that Graham was in the vicinity of the Borden house just before ten o'clock on the morning of the murder, and that his physical condition, as a result of his excesses, was such as to render his countenance almost ghastly in its colour. He reached the mills where he is employed shortly after ten o'clock, and his condition was at once apparent, and the men in charge there declined to allow him to go to work. The officers found the saloons in which Graham spent Wednesday night, and learned there that he drank immoderately and was feeling badly as a result. The description of Graham corresponded in every particular with that given by Officer Hyde, who furnished more details as to the clothing of the man than could be advanced by Dr. Handy. His trousers were of a peculiar texture and hue, and were rendered extremely noticeable on this account. This, in itself, was believed to be sufficient identification, but in all other particulars there was an unmistaken similarity and the authorities arrived at once at the conclusion that the man was identical with the person described by Dr. Handy and the police officer. The explosion of this theory afforded much satisfaction to the authorities, yet there appeared many weeks afterward reasons known to the marshal alone which caused him to start Officer Medley in search of Mike the soldier again. The search ended in a day, and the suspect was again located. Superintendent Hanscom of the Pinkerton Agency was in Fall River for several days about the time of the inquest. He declined to be interviewed about his work, and as the public observed, made numerous visits to the law office of Mr. Jennings. The conclusion of some police officers, perhaps erroneous, was that he was present to protect the members of the household. He talked very little, but was credited with saying with a smile that Marshal Hilliard was doing good work. The local authorities, however, expressed themselves in very strong terms regarding the doubts which the Pinkerton man cast upon the reliability of a portion of their accumulated wisdom. End of chapter 10chapter 11 of the Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 Miss Lizzie Borden arrested. Thursday was the last day of the inquest, and in its evening hours a veritable sensation was produced. The same impenetrable secrecy was maintained all day long, and no one knew what progress was being made behind the grim stone walls of the central police station, wherein Judge Blaisdell and the chosen few sat in solemn conclave. The scenes of the day before were enacted in the guardroom and the streets about the building. Crowds surged about the doors, and a double guard of patrolmen were doing duty in the hallways. The forenoon session developed nothing so far as the public was concerned. In the afternoon, Eli Bentz, the drug clerk, Fred Hart, another clerk, and Frank Kilroy, who saw Mr. Borden on the morning of the tragedy, strolled into the guardroom and were shown upstairs. Later, Bridget Sullivan, escorted by two officers, walked up the alley. She attracted no attention and appeared to be at her ease. The fact that Bridget walked from her temporary residence at 95 Division Street to the police station, a distance of more than a mile in the heat of an August day, while other women witnesses rode in a hack from the Borden house, a distance of less than an eighth of a mile, caused some comment. About three o'clock in the afternoon, the closed carriage, which had become almost as familiar a sight as the police patrol, rattled over the rough pavement. Half a dozen men were in sight, and in a twinkling, two hundred men, women and children, swarmed around the coach. The city marshal gave an order. Stuart Geegan cracked a whip. Officers hustled the crowd back, and Mrs. George S. Brigham alighted. 
She was followed by Mrs. Emma and Lizzie Borden. Then Officer Doherty disappeared with the hack and returned with another witness. The same crowd collected, but no one tried to drive it back. The excitement subsided. It was growing tiresome in Fall River. The reaction had set in. The community was losing its patience. For two days it had been informed that the end was near and that the die was about to be cast. But at three o'clock the bulletin boards announced that no action had been taken and no verdict had been rendered, and the crowds muttered and grumbled. They wanted something done. Their interesting clues and theories and suspicious characters had about died out. More than that, they were no longer satisfied with reports of the proceedings and the inquest detailed step by step. They demanded the grand finale, which would bring the drama to a close or ring the curtain up on a new scene, but it seemed as if the grand finale had been indefinitely postponed. The hour dragged along, and the grey walls of the courthouse in the square kept their secrets, if they had any to keep. It was the same story over and over again. Witnesses known to be connected with the case appeared and disappeared. Officers were sent hither and thither, and various rumours were afloat regarding the probable outcome. From the time that the carriage rolled up to the entrance to the central police station at 4.30 o'clock, and Lizzie Borden, Emma Borden, and Mrs. George Brigham dismounted under the watchful eye of Marshal Hilliard, people commenced to congregate about the streets, contiguous to the station house. By that intuitive perception by which the general public becomes aware of all important proceedings looking towards the capture or apprehension of criminals in noted cases, it was recognised that the most important movements of the long investigation had been entered upon, and that their passing were fraught with the greatest import to all directly concerned in the case, as well as the public, restless under the week's delay in clearing the way for the arrest of the murderer. There was nothing remarkable in the appearance of the party, Miss Emma Borden being evidently the most agitated. The excitement grew as the hour passed, and there was no movement from the courtroom. In the meanwhile, information arrived that an expert safe opener had arrived from Boston, and had been driven hurriedly to the Borden house on Second Street. Investigation showed the truth of this story, and the further fact that he had commenced work upon the safe in which Andrew J. Borden kept his books and papers. This safe was found locked at the time of the tragedy, and the secret of the combination died with the murdered man. The expert believed he could easily open the safe, but he found the combination most intricate, and he worked away without apparent result. At five o'clock, Marshal Hilliard and District Attorney Knowlton came from the courtroom and entered a carriage. Soon the Marshal returned, but the District Attorney was absent for nearly an hour, and it was reported that he had visited the Borden house and had learned that the safe opener had not completed his work. Outside the courtroom, the stalwart officers kept guard, and at the foot of the stairs in the station house, the large force of newspaper representatives were on guard. The subordinate officers who had been working upon the case expressed their convictions that the long-delayed arrest was about to be made, and that Lizzie Borden would not depart from the station with the remaining members of the household. Soon Bridget Sullivan emerged, and escorted by a police officer walked slowly down the street. The gravity of the situation was apparent, for the natural sternness of some of the officials, including the marshal, was increased to such an extent as to warrant the inference that something of importance in connection with the case was about to happen. Soon the inquisition was apparently ended, and then Lizzie Borden, her sister, and Mrs. Brigham were escorted across the entry from the courtroom to the matron's room, which is situated upon the same floor. An officer came out and soon returned with supper for the party. Miss Lizzie Borden threw herself upon the lounge in the room, and the repast was disturbed but little. Across the room there was grave work, and the decision of the authorities to arrest Lizzie Borden was arrived at after a consultation lasting but ten minutes. The services of clerk were called into requisition. The warrant was quickly drawn, and the result of the long examinations and the week's work of the government was in the hands of the police force of Fall River. At this time the news was among the reporters, but none were certain enough of the fact to dispatch the intelligence to the journals they represented. 
The excitement became general, and men, women, and children stood about the street and waited. Soon Marshal Hilliard came out accompanied by Mr. Knowlton, and as they entered a carriage, a telephone message informed Andrew J. Jennings, attorney for the family, that the two men were about to pay him a visit at his residence. This information obtained but little publicity, and not a few in the assembled crowds believed that Mr. Knowlton was being driven to the Boston train. The marshal and the district attorney proceeded to Mr. Jennings's residence and informed that gentleman that the government had decided upon the arrest of Lizzie Borden, and recognising that his presence at the station would be desirable, had deemed it wise to notify him of the decision arrived at and the contemplated action. The officials returned to the courtroom and were followed in a few moments by the attorney. George Brigham also came to the station and entered the presence of the women in the matron's quarters. There was a moment's preparation, and then Lizzie Borden was informed that she was to be held by the government on the charge of having murdered her father. Marshal Hilliard and Detective Seaver entered the room, the former holding in his hand a sheet of paper, the warrant for Lizzie Borden's arrest, and after requesting Mrs. Brigham to leave the room, addressing the prostrate woman in the gentlest possible manner, said, "'I have here a warrant for your arrest, issued by the judge of the district court.' I shall read it to you if you desire, but you have the right to waive the reading of it. He looked at lawyer Jennings as he completed the latter part of the statement, and that gentleman turned toward Lizzie and said, Waive the reading. The first and only time during the scene that the accused woman uttered a word was in response to the direction of her attorney. Turning slightly in her position, she flashed a look at the marshal, one of those queer glances which nobody has attempted to describe except by saying that they are a part and parcel of Lizzie Borden, and replied, You need not read it. The information had a most depressing effect upon all the others present, particularly upon Miss Emma Borden, who was greatly affected. Upon the face of the prisoner there was a pallor, and while her eyes were moist with tears, there was little evidence of emotion in the almost stolid countenance. The remaining members of the party then prepared to depart, and the effects of the arrest became apparent upon the prisoner. She still displayed all the characteristics of her peculiarly unemotional nature, and though almost prostrated, she did not shed a tear. A carriage was ordered, and Miss Emma Borden and Mr. and Mrs. Brigham prepared to leave. As they emerged from the station into the view of the curious crowds, the women, particularly Miss Emma, looked about with almost a pathetic glance. The people crowded forward, and the police pushed them back. Miss Borden appeared to be suffering intensely, and all the external evidences of agitation were visible upon her countenance. Mrs. Brigham was more composed, but was evidently deeply concerned. The party entered the carriage, and were driven rapidly towards Second Street. Lizzie A. Borden was accused of the murder of her father, Andrew J. Borden. The warrant made no reference to the killing of Abby D. Borden. That night the prisoner was overcome by the great mental strain to which she had been subjected for nearly a week, and when all had departed, except the kindly matron, the burden proved heavier than she could bear. She gave way to her feelings and sobbed as if her heart would break. Then she gave up to a violent fit of vomiting, and the efforts of the matrons to stop it were unavailing. Dr. Bowen was sent for, and he succeeded in relieving her physical sufferings. The prisoner was not confined in a cell-room of the lock-up downstairs. Judge Blaisdell, District Attorney Knowlton, and Marshal Hilliard are men of experience, good sense, and reliable judgment, and no other three men on earth regretted the step they had taken more than they. But from their point of view it was duty, not sentiment, which guided their actions. No other prisoner, arrested in Bristol County, had been accorded the delicate and patient consideration which Marshal Hilliard bestowed upon Miss Lizzie Borden. No cell doors closed upon her until after an open, fair, and impartial trial before a competent judge, and defended by her chosen legal counsel, she was adjudged probably guilty. During the afternoon, Medical Examiner Dolan, Doctors Cone, Leary, and Medical Examiner Draper of Boston held another autopsy on the bodies of the murdered people at receiving vault in Oak Grove Cemetery. They discovered a wound in Mrs. Borden's back, 
between the shoulder blades. It was a frightful cut and was made by an axe or hatchet which entered the flesh and bone clear up to the helve. It alone would have produced instant death. In addition to this, the doctors severed the poor, mutilated heads from both the bodies, and Dr. Dolan took possession of the ghastly objects. They were taken to a suitable place and the flesh and blood removed from the bones. The glaring white skulls with great rents where the murderous acts had crushed were then added to Dr. Dolan's collection of evidence which could not properly be called circumstantial. The skulls were photographed. In view of the severe criticism which had been directed towards the police from many quarters and by newspapers from all parts of the country, a review of their conduct of this case might be interesting. City Marshal Hilliard, his position corresponding to that of the chief of police in other cities, was sitting in his office at eleven o'clock on Thursday, August the 4th, when a telephone message from John Cunningham announced that a stabbing affray had occurred on Second Street. Assistant Marshal Fleet was engaged in the Second District Court, and more than half the members of the police department were at Rocky Point on their annual excursion. Officer George Allen was alone on duty at the station. The marshal came from the office and sent Officer Allen to investigate the case. Allen ran to 92 Second Street and was dumbfounded at the sight which met his gaze. He stopped long enough to see Andrew J. Borden's body lying on the sitting-room sofa. The officer was back at the station in short order, and this action alone has caused the most severe criticism. The officer was, to put it mildly, taken considerably aback by the sight in the house, and, to put it not too strongly, was frightened out of his wits. He left no guard upon the house when he ran back to the station. A general alarm was sent out, and in half an hour every officer in the city had been notified, and a dozen of them were at the scene. They invaded the house and searched the yard and barn for some evidence to assist them in starting the work. The cry went out from some source or other that a Swedish farmhand, dubbed the Portuguese, had done the deed. This was the first clue, and it started half a dozen policemen and the city marshal over the river to the Borden farm. The hunt ended the same afternoon, and the clue was promptly exploded, for the farmhands were all in their accustomed places, and it was impossible to connect any of them with this crime. Before morning, six new clues, all more or less promising, had developed. Among them was one which pointed to the startling suspicion that some member of the family might have been a participant, directly or indirectly, in the awful crime. This was early, and naturally looked upon as the most important of all, and the officers worked day and night towards its solution. Others were not neglected, and all the different clues were investigated by officers, especially detailed to do the work, assisted by officers in neighbouring cities and private detectives. A small boy reported that he had seen a man jump over the back fence. A Frenchman had helped the same man escape toward New Bedford, and it was stated that he was the chief of a gang of gypsy horse traders encamped at Westport. Two officers from Fall River, and as many from New Bedford, searched for this man and found Beersley S. Cooper, who accurately answered the description. Cooper promptly proved an alibi. He was in New Bedford on the day of the murder, selling a horse to a well-known citizen. John V. Morse was at first suspected of having had something to do with these horse traders. Morse had told the officers a story of his whereabouts on that day, and a detail was sent out to verify his statement, or find something to the contrary. Morse's movements were easily followed, and it was soon well understood that he was not in the house at the time of the tragedy. During the time that had elapsed since the murder, a police cordon had surrounded the house day and night. The night after the murder, officers Harrington and Doherty were detailed to search the drug stores of the city to see if any member of the family had endeavoured to purchase poison, a hint to this effect having been received by the department. At the store of D. R. Smith, they found that Lizzie had but recently endeavoured to purchase ten cents worth of hydrocyanic acid. The clerk was taken that night before Miss Borden and identified her. This was considered important. A report was received that a stranger had boarded the train at Mount Pleasant on the afternoon of the murder. He was said to have been covered with dust, and his clothes showed spots of blood. Investigation showed that he was a respectable citizen of New Bedford, 
and was in no way connected with this affair. Dr. Handy reported that he had seen a man acting wildly and strangely on 2nd Street that morning. The police ran down two men, one of them in Boston, who answered the description. One was a Fall River man, and he was doubtless intensely surprised at being chased by detectives or police officers who were imbued with the idea that he might in some way have been connected with the Borden murder. The Boston man was badly frightened at being seized as a suspect and established an alibi without difficulty. Mrs. Chase said she saw a man on the back fence in the Borden yard at eleven o'clock. He was found and admitted, with some hesitation, that he was there. The hesitation being due to the fact that he had been engaged in the reprehensible occupation of stealing pears. A stonemason who was working nearby saw him and informed the police of his whereabouts. On Saturday the police narrowed down to the theory to which all their efforts appeared to direct in spite of themselves, and searched the Borden house and premises. On Monday they made another search. Tuesday the house was again besieged by the officers. Monday night the bloody hatchet was found on the farm in South Somerset. It belonged to an old man named Sylvia. The only thing that it had killed was a chicken. On Tuesday the district attorney and attorney general were called into the case, and an inquest was ordered by Judge Blaisdell. For three days it was in session, and all the evidence accumulated by the police was submitted. Medical examiner Dolan, Professor Wood of Harvard, and medical examiner Draper held an autopsy on the bodies and worked in conjunction with the police. In addition to all this, an endless number of minor clues were worked on, and they all resulted in failure to connect the parties alleged to have been concerned with the murder of Mr. and Mrs. Borden. While the detectives were running down clues, Marshal Hilliard and State Detective Seaver were giving their personal attention to everything that might establish the connection of any member of the Borden household with the crime. The conditions were such that haste would have availed nothing, for there was no possibility from the time that suspicion was first cast in that direction of any of the parties in question leaving the city. Thursday, the work of the police, as far as establishing in their minds beyond a reasonable doubt, the identity of the murderer of the aged couple was finished, and at four twenty o'clock in the afternoon, Lizzie Borden, daughter of the victim, was brought to the central police station and retained there as a prisoner. This, in substance, comprised the labours of the police force of Fall River upon this celebrated case so far as the public was informed. End of chapter 11"'Chapter Twelve of the Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. "'This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Chapter Twelve. "'Lizzie Borden pleads not guilty. "'Miss Lizzie A. Borden was to be arraigned in the Second District Court on Friday morning. "'By nine o'clock a crowd of people thronged the streets "'and stood in a drenching rain to await the opening of the door of the room "'in which the court held its sittings.' It was not a well-dressed crowd, nor was there anybody in it from the acquaintance circle of the Borden family in Fall River. Soon after nine o'clock, a hack rolled up to the side door, and Emma Borden and John V. Morse alighted and went up the stairs. They were not admitted at once to the matron's room. Reverend E. A. Buck was already present, and was at the time engaged in conversation with the prisoner. Judge Blaisdell passed up the stairs, while Miss Emma was waiting to see her sister, and entered the courtroom. Mr. Jennings, the counsel, also arrived. The district attorney was already in the courtroom, and soon the marshal brought in his large book of complaints, and took his seat at the desk. The door of the matron's room opened, and Mr. Jennings, Miss Emma Borden, and Mr. Morse met the prisoner. All retired within the room. A few moments later, Mr. Jennings came out and entered the courtroom. He at once secured a blank sheet of legal cap and began to write. The city marshal approached him, and Mr. Jennings nodded an assent to an inquiry if the prisoner could now be brought in. Lizzie Borden entered the room immediately after, on the arm of Reverend Mr. Buck. She was dressed in a dark blue suit, and her hat was black with red flowers on the front. She was escorted to a chair. The prisoner was not crying, but her features were far from firm. 
She has a face and chin betokening strength of character, but a rather sensitive mouth, and on this occasion the sensitiveness of the lips especially betrayed itself. She was constantly moving her lips as she sat in the courtroom, in a way to show that she was not altogether unemotional. Clerk Leonard called the case of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts against Lizzie Borden on complaint of murder. Mr. Jennings, who was still writing, asked for a little more time. He soon arose and went over to the prisoner. He spoke to her, and then she arose and went to his desk. He read what he had been writing to her and then gave her a pen. She signed the paper. Mr. Jennings then addressed the court, saying, Your Honour, before the prisoner pleads, she wishes to present the following. He then read as follows. Quote, Bristol S.S. Second District Court Commonwealth v. Lizzie A. Borden Complaint for Homicide Defendant's Plea And now comes the defendant in the above entitled complaint and before pleading thereto says that the Honourable Josiah C. Blaisdell, the presiding justice of the Second District Court of Bristol, before which said complaint is returnable, has been and believes is still engaged as the presiding magistrate at the inquest upon the death of said Andrew J. Borden, the person whom it is alleged in said complaint the defendant killed, and has received and heard and is still engaged in receiving and hearing evidence in relation to said killing and to said defendant's connection therewith, which is not and has not been allowed to hear or know the report of, whereof she says that said Honourable Josiah C. Blaisdell is disqualified to hear this complaint, and she objects to his doing so, and all of this she is ready to verify. Lizzie A. Borden, by her attorney, Andrew J. Jennings, her signature, Lizzie A. Borden, sworn to this day, 12th of August, A.D. 1892, before me, Andrew J. Jennings, Justice of the Peace. End quote. When Mr. Jennings concluded, the district attorney arose and asked the court if this paper was to delay the prisoner's plea. The court said it was not to, and ordered the clerk to read the warrant. "'You needn't read it,' said Mr. Jennings. "'The prisoner pleads not guilty.' The text of the warrant, however, was as follows. Quote, "'Commonwealth of Massachusetts. To Augustus B. Leonard, clerk, of the Second District Court of Bristol, in the County Bristol, and Justice of the Peace. Rufus B. Hilliard, City Marshal of Fall River in said county, in behalf of said Commonwealth, on oath, complains that Lizzie A. Borden of Fall River, in the County of Bristol, at Fall River aforesaid, in the County aforesaid, on the fourth day of August in the year of our Lord, 1892, in and upon one Andrew J. Borden, feloniously wilfully and of her malice aforethought did make assault and that the said lizzie a borden then and there with a certain weapon to wit a hatchet in and upon the head of the said andrew j borden then and there feloniously wilfully and of her malice aforethought did strike giving unto the said andrew j borden then and there with the hatchet aforesaid by the stroke aforesaid in manner aforesaid in and upon the head of the said Andrew J. Borden, one mortal wound, of which said mortal wound the said Andrew J. Borden, then and there instantly died. And so the complainant aforesaid, upon his oath aforesaid, further complains and says that the said Lizzie A. Borden, the said Andrew J. Borden, in manner and form aforesaid, then and there feloniously, wilfully, and of her malice aforethought, did kill and murder. Signed R. B. Hilliard. End quote. The prisoner must plead in person, said Judge Blaisdell. At a sign from City Marshal Hilliard, the prisoner arose in her seat. What is your plea? asked the clerk. Not guilty, said the girl, and then, having said this indistinctly, and the clerk repeating his question, she answered the same thing in a louder voice, and with a very clearly cut emphasis on the word not. Mr. Jennings now arose. It seems to me, said he, your honour, that this proceeding is most extraordinary. This girl is called to plead to a complaint issued in the progress of an inquest now only in its early stages. The complaint has been brought in spite of the fact that she was not allowed to be represented by counsel 
in the hearing before the inquest. She has no knowledge of the evidence on which the complaint is made. I spoke to the district attorney about this fact before she testified at the inquest, and I admitted that it might be legally done. But this has left the girl in this position, that she is charged with a crime in a complaint issued during the inquest, and I understand that inquest is still open. Your Honour sits here to hear this case, which is returnable before you, when you have already been sitting on the case in another capacity. We do not know what you have heard on this case in the inquest, or of the purport of the testimony there. By all the laws of human nature you cannot help being prejudiced from the character of the evidence, which has been submitted to you. You might look at things differently from what you do if certain questions that may have been asked in the inquest had been excluded, or if you had been allowed to hear both sides, with counsel to ask for rulings upon the character of the interrogatories. So it seems to me that you are sitting in a double capacity to hear a charge against my client based upon evidence of which we know nothing, and for all that we know you may have formed opinions which make you incompetent to hear this complaint under the rules of law. The Constitution does not allow a judge to sit in such a double capacity, and it guarantees a defendant from a prejudiced hearing. District Attorney Knowlton answered, saying, The Commonwealth demurs from the plea. My brother is entirely in error in stating that there is anything extraordinary in this proceeding. This is exactly the line laid down that has been followed in other cases that have excited less attention than this one. More than twenty times to my certain knowledge, has a similar thing been done, and I should not be doing my duty if this thing should not be done now. You have your duty at the inquest, and you are also obliged by statute to hear cases of this kind. I must respectfully submit that it is not a compliment to your honour's conception of your duty to suggest that you cannot faithfully and impartially perform the duties that, that devolve upon you in this case. The inquest was against no one. It was to ascertain who committed these murders. The inquest is still proceeding, and the evidence before it has nothing to do with this case. It is your honour's duty to hear this complaint, and you ought not to be deterred. Mr. Jennings then said, I don't think that the district attorney comprehended my point. The inquest is generally held early in a case of this kind, and you can see where suspicion falls. The difference between the custom and this case is that after the police determined whom they thought the guilty person was, then, without holding an open trial at once, they settled on the guilty party and held an inquest to examine her, without anybody to defend her. That's what this inquest is, and because your honour has been sitting here before the inquest, you can't help being prejudiced. To illustrate, a person comes to your law office and states his case, and then, after that, you go into court and hear the case and pronounce judgment on it. Judge Blaisdell, I think Mr. Jennings is mistaken. The statutes make it my imperative duty to hold an inquest, and upon the testimony introduced at that hearing, to direct the issuance of warrants. The motion is overruled, and the demurred sustained. Mr. Jennings, then, Your Honour, we are ready for trial. Mr. Knowlton, the evidence in this case could not be completed at once. It could hardly all be gathered by next week. He moved continuance till one week, Monday, August 22nd, at two o'clock, when the State hoped to be entirely ready with the case. Mr. Jennings, we are very anxious to proceed at once. We ask for a trial at the earliest possible moment. District Attorney Knowlton, I didn't know but what you would waive examination here, so I am not ready now. The two lawyers consulted for a moment and then announced that they had agreed on Monday, August 22nd as the date of the preliminary hearing. District Attorney Knowlton moved that the prisoner be committed till that date. Judge Blaisdell granted the motion, remarking that other procedure was impossible, the offence not being a bailable one. Bridget Sullivan had entered the courtroom during the talk between the court and the lawyers. Mr. Morse had not entered the room, neither had Miss Emma Borden. The district attorney now addressed the court again. He said the importance of Mr. Morse and Bridget Sullivan to the case of the state was so great that he wished to move that they be placed under bonds to guarantee their presence inside the court's jurisdiction. Judge Blaisdell said he would grant the request and asked how much the bonds should be. Mr. Knowlton, 
three hundred dollars is the usual amount but on account of the gravity of this case i suggest the amount of five hundred dollars mr morse can procure bail we suppose but we don't know about bridget sullivan the servant girl was called from the corner where she sat and mr morse got up bridget was as pale as a ghost and her eyes plainly said she did not understand what was going on the order of the court was read to the man and woman they standing side by side they were then led across the room by the marshal and given seats far away from the outside door mr jennings had two of the notary publics whom he keeps at his office in the courtroom and he at once dispatched one of them down town for a bondsman or bondsmen lizzie borden had in the interval left the room on the arm of reverend mr buck she went back to the matron's room her sister and mr buck remained with her for fifteen or twenty minutes then mr morse having obtained bail came out the elder sister soon after left the court building with mr morse being driven home in the same carriage they came in the crowd about the carriage when the old man and his niece entered it was a large one messrs army and milne proprietors of the fall river daily news went bail for mr morse bridget returned to her friend's residence on division street the prisoner remained in the matron's room to await transportation to the county jail at taunton for the first time in six days the strain was lifted from fall river and people breathed and thought and transacted routine business more naturally the suspense was temporarily over and everybody felt relieved this would have been the result whatever the verdict reached thursday evening the decisive step had to be taken in one direction or another and when the final announcement came the mind of the community grew more settled there was more or less excitement of course and the impulse to dart into court square whenever a coach or the patrol wagon made its appearance was nearly as strong as ever but on the whole men talked and acted more rationally they were anxious to learn what the breaking of the safe had revealed how the prisoner passed the night the particulars of the arraignment and other minor details but when they were informed that the safe had hidden nothing which bore on the case that miss borden had slept quietly and appeared to be self-contained and composed in her quarters in the matron's room and that there were likely to be no further developments of importance for a week or more the life of the town settled back into the old ruts rev e a buck called on the prisoner at noon and from the sidewalk near the station a bouquet could be seen in the windows of the matron's apartments after the vigorous protest of andrew j jennings esquire relative to the preliminary trial had electrified the courtroom audience and his motion had been overruled it was decided to take the prisoner to taunton on the three forty train fall river has no house of detention and no quarters suitable for sheltering persons who are held on suspicion court square was choked as usual with the crowd of sightseers one carriage drew up at the main entrance and miss emma borden and andrew j jennings esq entered it and were driven to the depot miss lizzie borden the prisoner stepped into a carriage which was in waiting at the side entrance and was also driven off to all outward appearances she was as calm as though she had been going for a visit to relatives rev e a buck city marshal hilliard and state officer seaver accompanied her a small valise containing the prisoner's clothing was placed on the box the representatives of the press followed the carriage containing the prisoner in cabs and at three thirty court square was quiet the newsboys who had taken possession and held high revel in it for a week had gone off with their bundles the curious no longer loitered on the sidewalks and no more rumours floated out from the guard-room on thursday night when the finale was known the friends of the borden family were cool and philosophical friday they denounced the course pursued by the authorities from beginning to end in partnership with her sister miss emma borden had offered a reward of five thousand dollars for the conviction of the murderer of her father and stepmother and had secured the services of a detective to track the butcher on the government side it was fair and natural to presume that she above any person on the face of the earth desired to bring the wretch who had committed the deed to the gallows the very fact that she was suspected was of itself sufficient to warrant such a conclusion all other considerations aside 
The only surmise possible, therefore, was that she would assist the authorities to the best of her ability in unravelling the mystery and in freeing herself from the chain of circumstances, weak or strong, which surrounded her. It was to be supposed that she would not only answer every question cheerfully, but that she would volunteer every particle of information in her possession, and that the more searching the examination, the better she would be satisfied. She had everything to gain and nothing to lose by a full revelation of the truth. Anybody in his sober senses would have been slow to even suggest that District Attorney Knowlton, or any other prosecuting officer, was eager to convict the innocent, to embarrass witnesses, or to impose any unnecessary hardships upon them. At the inquest every person examined was a government witness. There was no defendant, and of course no witnesses for the defence. Whether Miss Borden did assist the court and the authorities to clear up the grim problem which confronted them was not known. If the government officers were possessed of the ordinary intelligence, they were aware that it was a terrible thing to swear out a warrant for the arrest of a young lady and charge her with killing her father. If, as it was openly alleged at the time, the government did so because it did not appreciate the full significance of such a charge, it must be admitted their conduct was more extraordinary and inexplicable than any feature of the crime itself. The government authorities knew that once the warrant had been issued, Miss Borden's character at the time of the trial, which had always been irreproachable, was blotted for ever. It must have known that even if she left the superior courtroom acquitted, nothing that it could do could lift the blight from her life. The route taken by the carriage containing Lizzie Borden, Marshal Hilliard, Officer Seaver and Reverend Mr. Buck, toward the Fall River Railroad Depot, was most peculiar. It is a direct road from the central station to the depot. Along the main thoroughfare were people eager to catch a glimpse of the prisoner, and the Marshal, considerate of his charge, decided to disappoint the curiosity-seekers. Accordingly, the journey was uphill and down dale, through side streets and along thoroughfares skirting the river. Following the carriage were others containing the representatives of the leading newspapers of the East, and these latter drew up at the depot a few seconds in advance of the official vehicle. A squad of officers was on duty there, and as the crowd surged, they pushed it back. The train for Taunton was a few minutes late, and until its arrival, Lizzie Borden and Mr. Buck remained in the carriage. As the clang of the engine bell was heard, the marshal pulled up the carriage curtains and assisted Lizzie Borden to alight. She was prettily dressed and appeared quite prepossessing. She wore a blue dress of new design and a short blue veil. At the realisation that the moment for departure had arrived, she seemed overcome by a momentary weakness and almost tottered. She was at once supported by the marshal and Mr. Buck, and leaning upon the arms of these two, she walked through the ladies' waiting-room and out towards the cars. The eager crowd pushed and stared and gossiped as the party entered the rear car of the train. Reverend Mr. Buck carried a box containing a number of religious and other papers and magazines, and also some books. A telescope bag containing Miss Borden's apparel was placed in the cars. The prisoner sat near the window in a seat with Mr. Buck, and behind them was Mr. Hilliard. The blinds were drawn in order to prevent annoyance to Miss Borden by curious persons. Her glance was vacant, and her thoughts were manifestly removed from her present surroundings. Not a word was exchanged between the members of the party, and the prisoner still remained in the same position, staring at nothing. In some manner the information that Miss Borden was upon the train spread, and at the few stations at which it stopped, small knots of inquisitive people were gathered. Taunton was reached at 4.20 o'clock. Awaiting her arrival was a gathering of hundreds, and they crowded about every car. Officer Seaver, in order to attract their attention, hurried to the north end of the station, and the throng hurried in that direction. At this time Mr. Hilliard and Mr. Buck escorted the prisoner from the south end of the station and into a carriage. Mr. Seaver joined them, and the crowd found itself disappointed. After the vehicle rolled the cabs of the newspaper men, Taunton Jail is not far removed from the centre of the city and is a picturesque-looking stone structure. There is the main building and the keeper's residence, which is attached. On the outside of the structure, ivy grows in profusion, and the building does not resemble 
except in the material of its construction, the generally accepted appearance of a place of confinement. It has accommodations for 65 prisoners, and the women's department is on the southeast side. In this portion of the building there are but nine cells, and before the arrival of Lizzie Borden but five of these were occupied. These were confined for offences of a minor nature, as it was not customary for the officials of Bristol County to send many women to Taunton, the majority being committed to the jail at New Bedford, where there is employment for them. The matron is Mrs. Wright, wife of Sheriff Andrew J. Wright, keeper of the jail, and her personal attention is given to the female prisoners. The officers had been notified of the coming of Miss Borden, and her arrival was unattended by any unusual ceremony inside the jail. Her step was firmer than ever, as, unassisted, she walked up the three steps and into the office of the keeper. From there she was directed to the corridor which runs along the cells of the women's department, and here Mr. Hilliard left her. Returning to the office, he handed the committing mittimus to Sheriff Wright, who examined it and found it correct. In the meanwhile, Lizzie Borden was alone with the clergyman. He spoke words of cheer to her and left her in the care of the matron. Mr. Buck said she was not shocked at the sight of the cells, and knowing that she was innocent, accepted the situation with a calm resignation. He said her friends would call upon her from time to time, this being allowed by the institution. The cell in which Lizzie Borden was confined is nine and one-half feet high and seven and one-half feet wide. Across the corridor, looking through the iron bars, her gaze will rest upon whitewashed walls. The furniture of the cell consists of a bedstead, chair, and washbowl. At her personal request, she saw none of the daily newspapers. Consequently, she was not familiar with the comments of the papers regarding the case. Taken in charge by the matron, Lizzie Borden was escorted to the cell, and the iron doors clanged behind her. Perhaps no person in Taunton experienced a greater surprise and shock at the arrival of Lizzie Borden than Mrs. Wright, the matron, in whose care the prisoner was committed. Sheriff Wright was, for years, a resident of Fall River, and at one time held the position of marshal of the city police, the place now occupied by Mr. Hilliard. Mr. and Mrs. Wright were well acquainted with the Borden family, but the first names of their acquaintances had slipped from their memory, and the sheriff and his wife did not connect the Borden they formerly knew with the prominent actors in this tragedy. When Lizzie Borden entered the presence of the matron, the latter noticed something familiar in the countenance of the young woman, and after the retirement of Reverend Mr. Buck commenced to question her. Finally, after a number of questions, Mrs. Wright asked, are you not the Lizzie Borden who used, as a child, to play with my daughter Isabel? The answer was an affirmative one, and the information touched Mrs. Wright to the quick. When she appeared in the keeper's office a few moments later, her eyes were moist with tears. End of chapter 12
A great dark cloud has settled down upon one of our families, but God is in that cloud. He is with that poor, tried, tempest-tossed girl. He will give her strength and peace. He will make her glad. It is impossible for a wrong to be done in this world that eternity will not undo. Good is coming, good out of evil, light out of darkness. The Father is over all. He will vindicate and raise and glorify. End quote. At a meeting of the Women's Auxiliary of the Young Men's Christian Association of Fall River, held about this time, a prayer was offered for Miss Borden by Mrs. Hezekiah C. Brayton of Fall River, and the religious societies all over the country called upon the divinity to assist the unfortunate woman. Throughout the whole proceeding against Miss Borden, she was called unfortunate, but no man or woman good, bad, or indifferent, was heard to say that the murdered man or woman were unfortunate. Judge Blaisdell, who presided at the inquest, and who, being the justice of the Second District Court, was to be the presiding judge in the coming preliminary trial, came in for more than his share of criticism. He was a man of advanced years and remarkable vitality, had served in both branches of the state legislature, and was one of the first mayors of the city of Fall River. He had presided as justice of the Second District Court since its establishment about twenty years ago. He said that he thought he knew enough to attend to his duties, no matter who sought to criticise him. A sample of the editorial attacks which were being made upon the judge was shown to him. It related to the harsh words used in the complaint which accused Lizzie A. Borden of murdering her father. The judge said that he did not know before that such ignorance existed. The form of complaint was decided upon at least 150 years before Miss Borden was born, and was adapted to fit capital crimes. Reverend W. W. Jubb, Miss Borden's pastor, characterized Judge Blaisdell's action in sitting on the bench while presiding at the inquest as indecent, outrageous, and not to be tolerated in any civilized community. He proposed to use every means to have another judge preside at the preliminary hearing. Reverend Mr. Jubb, formerly of Morsley, England, had at that time been a resident in America about twelve months. The act which he criticised was an American constitution nearly two hundred years old. The preliminary trial of Miss Borden was assigned for Monday, August the 22nd, and the prisoner was on the morning of that day taken from Taunton Jail and brought by rail to Fall River. Clad in the same gown that she wore at the time of her departure from Fall River, and with her face partly concealed with the same blue veil, she stepped from the train in custody of Marshal Hilliard and Reverend Mr. Buck. As she was still possessed of all that wonderful nerve, there was no indication in her manner nor bearing that she was a prisoner who had been taken from jail after several days' confinement to face the mass of evidence which the state announced it had accumulated against her. And for aught that her appearance might indicate, she was the same undemonstrative traveller returning to her home, and quietly welcomed by her friends. The trip to Fall River had been made without incident, she sitting motionless in her seat, and not even raising her eyes to see the passengers who walked through the car in ostensible search for seats, but really to satisfy their curiosity with a glance at the young woman. In Fall River, it was common knowledge that she was to arrive just before two o'clock, and so the arrival of Miss Emma Borden and Mrs. Holmes at the police station at 10.30 attracted no attention. The police gave no sign, but after the arrival of Miss Emma, half a dozen of them sauntered slowly towards the depot. As the train from Taunton pulled up at eleven o'clock, Lizzie Borden and the others alighted. Some newspaper men were on the train and others were at the depot. The services of the police were not needed, for there was no crowd to keep back, and the carriage of the authorities drove away in an opposite direction to that of the police station. Then it wound around through alleys and back streets and finally reached the police headquarters through a rear thoroughfare. As a result, there were just five persons at the side entrance through which the party passed, and before the gathering had swelled to hundreds, which it did very promptly, Miss Borden was greeted by her sister and friend in the room of the matron, adjoining the courtroom. Lunch was served there, and preparations were made for facing the ordeal of the afternoon. 
Soon after noon, the regular session of the Second District Court concluded. City Marshal Hilliard, acting under orders from the judge, did not allow everybody to enter the courtroom. Only those persons who had good reasons for being present were to be at any sessions of the hearing. The scenes attendant upon the commencement of the hearing, which, in public estimation, was to take more of the form of a trial, will long be remembered in Fall River. During the noon hour, the crowds commenced to gather in Court Square, and the passageway through the centre of the narrow streets upon which the central police station stands were rendered impassable. There are two entrances to the building on the side, and from each of these lines strung out, formed at first of men in single file, and then widening out until toward the end they formed large crowds. There they stood for hours and perspired while the police laboured strenuously to keep them in order. In the meanwhile, the little courtroom, with seating capacity for three hundred, was rapidly being occupied without the knowledge of the patient crowds who were waiting for the doors to open. The curious individuals were not confined to the males, for at twelve thirty o'clock all the seats in the large guard room of the station were occupied by women. Apparently none of them were from the lower walks of life, and the majority were good-looking and well-dressed. In but a few cases they were accompanied by escorts, and an hour before the announced time for the commencement of proceedings they were allowed to file upstairs. Upon arriving in the courtroom they promptly occupied all the best seats, and then spread out on the sides. After them prominent citizens of Fall River were admitted, and these comprised a goodly number. Judge Carter of the Haverhill Police Court, a friend of Judge Blaisdell, accompanied by his wife, were prominent figures in the centre of the room. Despite all the talk about limited accommodations for the press, tables and chairs in sufficient quantities were placed inside the railing. There were about forty newspaper representatives present. Many members of the Massachusetts Bar came to the building and were admitted, and other professional men came into the courtroom. A peculiar feature was the presence of a large number of physicians, and they manifested a great curiosity in everything related to the affair. As time passed, the crowds outside the building received accessions, and a few minutes before two o'clock the jam was almost frightful. An immense delegation of mill girls had swelled the throngs at the entrances and had managed to get near the doors. There they waited while the hundreds in back pushed them about and created work for the officers. At the main entrance a large force of women had succeeded in getting into the guard room, and this compelled the placing of more officers at the stairway, leading from there to the courtroom. At any of the doors it was worth one's life to attempt to enter or leave the building. The traffic in the vicinity was necessarily abandoned. The seats on the left of the courtroom were reserved for witnesses and those on the right for friends of the family. The first person of consequence to enter was Bridget Sullivan, and she grew white under the glances of the crowd and the buzz of conversation that her presence created among the women. She was followed by Dr. S. W. Bowen, Mayor John W. Coughlin, and others prominent in the case, the advent of each adding excitement to the occasion. Five minutes later the district attorney entered. Inside the courtroom the atmosphere was torrid. Judge Blaisdell entered the room at two o'clock and took his seat. All the witnesses were present. Half an hour passed, and there was no movement toward commencing the proceedings. Attorney Jennings's books and documents were piled up on his table, but he was nowhere to be seen. It was finally learned that he was closeted with his client. The presence of Eli Bentz, the drug clerk, among the witnesses, caused general belief that one of the theories upon which the state was placing dependence was that relating to the purchase and use of poison. Reverend Mr. Burnham, Andrew J. Borden's former pastor, now occupying a pulpit in Springfield, was also present. Mr. Jennings's consultation with his client lasted but a few moments, and then he commenced a conference with District Attorney Knowlton. Time passed slowly in the courtroom, and the presiding justice frequently glanced impatiently at his watch. Everybody was offering surmises as to the cause of the delay, and it was finally learned that there was a disagreement of opinion between the attorneys representing the prosecution and defence regarding the amount of testimony to be submitted by the government. 
Mr. Adams, associated with Mr. Jennings for the defence, was also present at the conference, and the attorneys continued to argue as the minutes dragged on. The government desired to place in evidence reports of certain experts, and the attorneys for the defence insisted that they should be furnished in evidence at the hearing. It was understood that the report on which there was a disagreement was that of Professor Wood of Harvard. Finally, at 2.50 o'clock, the attorneys entered the courtroom. A few minutes' conversation ensued between the lawyers, and then District Attorney Knowlton, addressing Judge Blaisdell, said, "'Your Honour, some parts of this case required the examination of various things belonging in the house of the prisoner, and attached to her person, and these things are now in the hands of gentlemen who are experts in the examination of such matters. We have not been able to get reports of the examination sufficiently extensive to allow the experts to be called as witnesses. My learned friends both agree that this case cannot therefore be ready to-day, to-morrow, or the next day, and we are thus forced to ask that the trial be adjourned till Thursday at ten o'clock. I think my brother will agree to what I ask. Mr. Jennings arose and assented to what Mr. Knowlton had said, and Judge Blaisdell at once declared the hearing adjourned till Thursday the 25th at ten o'clock a.m. The prisoner remained in charge of the police matron and was not taken back to Taunton Jail. The day before the preliminary hearing commenced, a scene was reported to have occurred in the matron's room between Mrs. Lizzie and Emma Borden, which surprised the attendant, Matron Reagan. During the day, Miss Emma entered the matron's room and, to her great surprise, was greeted with this remark from Miss Lizzie. "'You gave me away, Emma, didn't you?' Then said Emma, "'I only told Mr. Jennings what I thought he ought to know.' Miss Lizzie was apparently very much agitated at this and said to her sister, "'Remember, Emma, that I will never give in one inch, never.' Mrs. Reagan was interviewed by the writer shortly after this incident, and next day some of the leading newspapers published an account of the quarrel. The doubting Thomases stamped it as a fake, and an effort to prejudice the public against the prisoner. Next day, and after the court had adjourned, Attorney Jennings made himself the object of much interest in and around the police station. He and his associate, Colonel Melvin O. Adams of Boston, with Reverend Mr. Buck and other staunch friends of the accused, attempted to show to the public that the story of a quarrel between the sisters was a lie, pure and simple. But the plan probably did not succeed as well as anticipated. Detective Edwin D. McHenry, of Providence, who had from the beginning been actively engaged under orders of Marshal Hilliard, happened to see the friends of Miss Borden in the act of drawing up a document which he learned was to be presented to Matron Reagan to sign. He promptly notified Assistant Marshal Fleet and the two officers awaited developments. The paper was drawn up and its content set forth that Mrs. Reagan, the undersigned, never overheard a quarrel between the two women as related in the many papers of that day and that, moreover, she never told anybody that she had. It also set forth that she was to assert upon her oath that the story of a quarrel was false from beginning to end. This carefully prepared statement was placed in the hands of Mr. Buck, and he was entrusted with the delicate mission of inducing Matron Reagan to affix her name thereunto. But Mrs. Reagan refused, saying that she would have to consult the marshal. Meanwhile, the two officers mentioned had informed the marshal of what was passing, and he was prepared for the advent of lawyer Jennings. This action on the part of the defence had taken place upstairs, and upon the refusal of Mrs. Reagan to sign, lawyer Jennings carried the document to the marshal's office. The writer was present when the marshal refused to allow Mrs. Reagan to sign the paper, even if she were willing to, and Mr. Hilliard's advice to Mrs. Reagan was that she remain silent until called upon to testify to what she had heard. To say that Mr. Jennings was excited would be putting it mildly. He left the marshal's office in a state of rage, and with the paper in his hand called loudly to the half-hundred newspaper men in the guardroom, saying, "'This is an outrage. The marshal has refused to allow Mrs. Reagan to sign this denial of the quarrel story.' The lawyer was informed that Mrs. Reagan had not agreed to sign it, therefore the marshal had nothing to do in the matter. An exciting scene followed in which there was animated talk. On the morning of 
August the 25th, the day set for the beginning of the trial, the same old scenes were enacted in and around the police station. At eight o'clock, crowds of men, women and children were upon the sidewalks, and half an hour later their numbers had been increased to such an extent that an extra detail of police was placed at the entrance in a vain endeavour to keep the roadways passable for vehicles. The ordinary session of the court commenced at nine o'clock, and at that very hour every seat outside the railing was occupied. As before, the gathering was composed almost exclusively of women, many of whom marched boldly into the courtroom swinging lunch baskets in their hands. There were fewer of these from the station of life occupied by the Borden family than on Monday, but those who were present listened eagerly while a man was tried and convicted of being a common drunkard, craned their ears to listen to the testimony of wives who bore marks of their husband's brutality, and smiled at the children who were charged with violating the laws of the Commonwealth by refusing obedience to their parents. In the room of the matron across the passageway, Lizzie Borden awaited the commencement of the hearing. Her first visitor of the day was her sister, and soon after Reverend Mr. Buck arrived full of solicitude for the comfort of the prisoner. In the meanwhile, the session of the court dragged on in the midst of considerable disorder. This was not occasioned by those in the spectators' row, for they were fully occupied, and no more were admitted. Inside the railing, however, the great body of newspaper correspondents laboured vigorously, while the court officers hurried in and out with chairs and tables in their efforts to accommodate the largely increased number of reporters. These latter reached nearly fifty, and they touched elbows all around as they wrote. Attorneys from nearby cities were present, courtesy of admittance being extended to them. The Fall River Bar and the medical profession were, as before, largely represented in that section of the room generally reserved for witnesses, and there were clergymen of all denominations scattered about the place. The entrance of Bridget Sullivan, at ten minutes before ten o'clock, transferred the interests of the spectators from the trial of a Sunday liquor seller to the most important government witness in the Borden case. Miss Sullivan stood the curious glances and loud whispers much better than on Monday, and though evidently a trifle disconcerted, the pallor noticeable upon her countenance at her previous entrance to the courtroom was absent. She was accompanied by her attorney, James T. Cummings. The other witnesses commenced to arrive at this time, and then Mr. Jennings entered the matron's room for a consultation with his client. At ten o'clock the session of the ordinary court was still in progress, and the gathering was amusing itself by listening to the trial of an individual who declared that he had purchased many hogsheads of beer to celebrate the accession of Gladstone to power, and had no intention of selling the stuff. This concluded the minor cases, and there was a great bustle of expectation as the numerous prisoners were taken from the room. Their places were quickly occupied, while outside the building the waiting hundreds stood patiently in the streets. The latter included many out-of-town people who had come to the place in the hope that they might secure admission to the courtroom. So large was this influx of visitors that all the rooms in the hotel were engaged at an early hour of the morning. At 10.15 o'clock, attorneys Jennings and Adams of the defence entered and took positions at the table two green bags filled with books being brought after them. The excitement immediately increased, and the eyes of all the spectators were riveted on the door, awaiting the entrance of the prisoner. "'Make way for the witnesses!' cried out the court officer, and the remaining persons summoned filed into the room. Their number was a general surprise, for they extended in a long line around the room. Among them the figures of John V. Morse, Dr. Bowen and the drug clerk Bents were conspicuous, and their presence heightened the interest. Conversation was brisk and loud for a few moments, and then it lagged perceptibly, and everybody fell to wondering why District Attorney Knowlton was not present, and when Lizzie Borden would come into the sight of the curious throng. The District Attorney arrived at 10.30 o'clock, and a few minutes later Lizzie Borden entered. First came Emma Borden, escorted by Mr. Holmes. She was dressed in black and appeared somewhat excited. Following her came Mrs. Holmes and Mrs. Brigham, and behind them was the prisoner, leaning on the arm of Reverend Mr. Buck. 
Lizzie Borden was dressed in the blue gown which she wore to Taunton, and at her entrance everybody grew so excited that nearly half of those present were on their feet almost unconsciously. The prisoner was composed, and beyond a slight twitching of the lips, betrayed no excitement whatever. At 10.31 o'clock, District Attorney Knowlton arose and asked the judge, "'Is your honour all ready?' Judge Blaisdell answered that he was. Then, without other words of introduction, he called on the medical examiner, Dr. William A. Dolan, to testify. Dr. Dolan testified as follows. Quote, "'Have made a good many autopsies. First saw the bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Borden about a quarter of twelve, August the 4th. Saw the body of Andrew Borden first. It was lying on the north side of a lounge, which was on the south side of the room. The head of the sofa was to the west. There was a Prince Albert coat on the top of the sofa cushion. On that rested Mr. Borden's head. His feet were on the floor. His head was towards the front door, and the face was looking toward the sitting-room windows. Examined the wound sufficiently to make a view then, and removed and sealed up the contents of the stomach, and sent the same to an expert. Saw the body of Mrs. Borden a few moments after I saw Mr. Borden's body. She was lying face down on the floor. She was dressed in a calico dress. There was a silk handkerchief on the floor that might have been on her head. She was touching her head as she lay there. Can't say if it was cut. End quote. At this moment, Thomas Kieran, an architect who had drawn plans, was sworn. He said he was at the house August the 10th and described the plans in detail. Mr. Jennings and Mr. Knowlton looked over the plans together. Mr. Kieran said the length of the room where he had found the carpet taken up was 15 feet and 5 inches, and that there was a space of 2 feet 11 inches. A board had been taken up in this room, and witness had seen a spot of blood on it when the marshal showed it to him at the police station Sunday. Mr. Kieran said he had also drawn a map of the outside of the house, with measurements of the height of the fences and the character of the fences. Witness had seen a spot on the casing of the kitchen door leading to the sitting-room, and one on the wallpaper by the sofa. The witness was asked to designate the head of the sofa on which Mr. Borden's body was found, and said that it was toward the parlour. There was also a spot of blood on a picture in the sitting-room hanging on the wall back of the sofa. After questions bringing out these replies, the district attorney inquired of Judge Blaisdell if he were familiar with the premises, and upon an affirmative response from the judge, the district attorney said he would not bring out any further facts in relation to measurements. Dr. Dolan was called back to the stand. He testified that when he removed the sheet that had been over Mr. Borden's head, he saw one of the most ghastly sights he had ever known. He was told to speak without generalising, and drew from his pocket a report of the autopsy taken one week after the murders. He proceeded to read a description of the wounds from his report. Mr. Jennings objected to the reading of these notes, and Mr. Knowlton told him to put them away. Dr. Dolan put up his paper and gave a description of the wounds from memory. There were ten in all, from four to an inch and a half long. The largest was four inches long and two and a half inches wide. There was no other cause of death. The body was warm when he got there, blood oozing from the wounds. Mr. Borden, the witness thought, could not have been dead half an hour. There were, in all, eighty-eight blood spots behind Andrew Borden's head, dropping towards the east of the wall. These eighty-eight blood spots were in a cluster, beginning three or four inches from Mr. Borden's head. Quote, I then found on the paper of the wall a spot of blood six feet one inch and three quarters from the floor another spot was near that one these two were the highest spots of any except one found on the ceiling they were the largest spots of blood found they were about three quarters of an inch in diameter the blood spot on the picture was fifty eight inches from the floor i found spots on the moulding back of the lounge also had to move the lounge to find the spots also found seven blood spots on the upper two panels of the parlour door. There were two spots on the ceiling, but only one of them was human blood. I think an insect had been killed on the other spot. Another spot was on the west door jamb of the door leading to the dining room. 
It was not a spot, but a string, so to speak, of blood, two and one half inches long, as it was drawn out. There were two spots on the kitchen door, one on the groove of the door, and another on the edge of the casing. The spot I describe as a stain on the jamb of the door leading to the dining room was such a mark that the murderer of Andrew J. Borden might have made. A hatchet or axe was, in my opinion, the weapon with which the murder was committed. A weapon weighing four or five pounds could easily have made the cuts. Couldn't see any part of Mrs. Borden's face, for the arms were thrown about it. As it lay there, you could see there were a number of wounds. There were at least seven or eight blows which went through the skull into the brain. I turned the body up. Altogether there were eighteen distinct wounds on the head, and all but four of them were on the right side of the head. Imagine a line drawn from the nape of the neck around the ear. That would include fourteen of the wounds. They were from the left side back and downward to the right side. One of them was five inches in length. They were diagonally. Seven or eight of them went through the skull into the brain. Others took pieces of the skull out. The other four were on the left side, but none of them went through the skull. Those on the left were flat scalp wounds, half an inch in depth. There was a contusion on the nose and two over the left eye. They were such as might be made by falling. I found one immediately over the spine some time later. It was two and one-half inches long and two and one-half inches deep. It was a conical wound. These were made by a sharp cutting instrument and might have been caused by a hatchet or small axe. Under her head, and pretty well down on her breast, she was lying in a pool of clotted blood. The front of her clothing was very much soaked and also the back. On the pillow sham there were three spots. On the rail of the bed were thirty or forty spots. Those on the sham were near the wall. The sham was eighteen inches from her head. The spots on the rail were lateral. On the drawers of the dressing case there were three or four spots on the first one and six or seven on the second, as if they had gone up in the air and come down. On the moulding of the east window there was a spot, and above that, and about two feet, there was a spot on the paper. These were six or seven feet from the head, on an angle. End quote. The witness saw Mrs. Borden's body immediately after viewing that of Mr. Borden, and was asked by Mr. Knowlton if there was anything inconsistent in his opinion of the appearance of the body with the supposition that she had been dead for two hours. Mr. Adams objected, and Mr. Knowlton said he had asked a similar question in every murder case he had tried. Mr. Adams retorted that there were a number of bad habits the district attorney had acquired which should be corrected. The court thought the question could be allowed. Mr. Jennings thereupon objected and commenced to argue. Mr. Knowlton said the habit of arguing after a decision was not one of his bad ones, and Mr. Adams objected to Mr. Knowlton's hitting him over Mr. Jennings's shoulder. Dr. Dolan said there was nothing inconsistent with the appearance of the body and the opinion that she had been dead for two hours. Mrs. Borden died from shock. He removed her stomach and forwarded it by express to Professor Wood. I went down the cellar six stairs and found four axes or hatchets resting against the cellar partition. One was a peculiar hatchet, the head being a hammer claw. There were three others, and all were lying six or eight feet from the cellar door. I examined two of them, which were brought to me by the officers. One of them looked as though it had been scraped on the blade. This had a cutting surface of five inches and would weigh from three to five pounds. The officer took it. Afterwards I examined it with a glass and found two hairs upon it, and what appeared to be blood. I could not swear it was blood. I gave this hatchet and the axis to Professor Wood. On all of them there was what appeared to be blood. Took certain dresses also told Mr. Jennings I wanted them, and he got them of Miss Borden, sent them to Professor Wood. The court took a recess for dinner, and Mr. Adams furnished for publication a copy of a letter received by Emma Borden. He produced the original copy and the envelope, and according to the latter, it was mailed in Waltham, Massachusetts, August the 18th at 11.30 a.m., and received in Fall River on the same day at 4.30 p.m. The letter is as follows. Quote, Wartham, Massachusetts, August 17th, 1892. Miss Emma Borden. Dear Madam, 
You must excuse that I take the liberty in sending you these few lines. I ought to have written you before this, as I was unable to do so, as I was travelling every day. My name is Samuel Robinski. I am a Jewish peddler. When the fatal murder in Fall River occurred, I was only a few miles from Fall River. That day, while sitting on the roadside towards New Bedford, I met a man who was covered with blood. He told me that he worked on a farm and that he never could get his wages, so he had a fight with the farmer. He said he ran away and did not get any money after all. All he had was a five-dollar bill. He bought from me four handkerchiefs, one looking-glass, one necktie, collar, and shoe-blacking. His boots were covered with blood, and he put lots of blacking on them. I helped him fix up again and get cleaned, but by this time I did not know anything about the murder. I felt sorry for him and thought only he gave the farmer a good licking. I advised him to travel at night, which he said he would do, as he feared arrest during the day. I gave him my lunch and he gave me a quarter, and told me not to say anything that I met him. He asked me what time the train left for Boston after eight o'clock at night and I told him. He had also a bundle with him which was about two feet thick or big. When I was peddling I did not read any papers, only Sundays, as I am studying the English language. When I was in Boston last Sunday a friend of mine told me about the Fall River murder. I told him about the stranger and my friend said, And why did you not report this to the police? I told him I was afraid as they would lock me up as a witness. And another thing, I did not have any license so I was afraid. I told my friend I would write to you, or Mr. Jennings. I read last Sunday's Boston Globe and thought I might have seen the murderer. If I should see him in Boston, I am sure, yes, dead sure, I know him again. He is of medium height, dark brown hair, reddish whiskers or moustache, weight about 135 pounds, a grey suit, brown derby hat. His shoes were what they call Russian leather. No blacking on so-called summer shoes. He put my blacking on to make them look black, so that people could not see the blood. It was about one o'clock noon that day. I had only heard about the murder at six or seven o'clock that night. I kept quiet as I had no license and feared to be arrested. My stranger was very much afraid. He asked me a million times if he looked all right again, and I brushed him off with my shoe brush and told him to wait till dark. If I come again to Fall River next week, I shall call on you if you think it is necessary, but all I can swear he is the stranger which I have seen that afternoon. That is all, but if this man was the murderer, I cannot say, but I shall find him out of fifteen thousand. We'll close now. We'll go to Fitchburg tomorrow morning and return to Boston Saturday night. Please do not say anything to the police. I will be arrested. If I had known about the murder the time I met my stranger, it would have been different, as I would have followed him up and perhaps got the reward. I thought it was a poor farm hand, and so took pity on him, as I know as a rule farmers seldom pay their hands during summer. Hoping that my information may be of some use to you, I remain very respectfully, Samuel Robinski. P.S. Please excuse paper and mistakes, as I am a foreigner. End quote. Immediately upon the receipt of this letter, Mr. Jennings dispatched the following telegram. Quote, August 19, 1892. To George L. Maybury, Mayor, Waltham, Massachusetts. Does Samuel Robinski, a Jewish peddler, live in Waltham? Andrew J. Jennings. End quote. The answer received from the Mayor of Waltham was as follows, dated Waltham, Massachusetts, August 20th, 1892. To Andrew J. Jennings, Fall River. Quote, Cannot find that he lives here. Am told that a peddler of that name is living in Boston and sometimes comes out here. Signed, G. L. Maybury. End quote. This satisfied the attorneys for the defence that such a person as Rubinsky existed, and Mr. Adams assured the newspaper representatives that they were making strenuous efforts to find him. He said a search had been made around the vicinity of Manchester and that they were now looking for the man. He appeared to think that the publicity attendant upon publication of the letter might assist in locating the individual. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Dr. Dolan Cross-Examined In the afternoon, Dr. Dolan was placed upon the stand and continued his testimony under the cross-examination of Colonel Adams. He said, It was about noonday when I got to Andrew J. Borden's house. First heard of the murder when I was in front of the Borden house. Was out driving to visit patients. It was in consequence of questions I asked when I saw the crowd before the house that I learned what had happened. I went into the hall or entryway in the rear of the house. I met Bridget Sullivan and Dr. Bowen in the kitchen. I then went into the sitting room. Andrew Borden lay in such a way as to face me. There were two officers present. I looked at the body and inquired where Mrs. Borden was. I went up the stairs. They were winding stairs to a certain extent. There was a Brussels carpet on the floor. I had to turn to the left to enter the doorway. On my left side between me and the bureau was a bedstead. The bedstead was opposite the front of the house. Can't remember if anybody was in the room when I entered it. Dr. Bowen gave me my information about Mrs. Borden. Dr. Totolo and Dr. Hartley were with me afterwards to examine the room. I looked across the bed when I got into the room and saw the body. The woman's arms were raised a circle above her jaw, and her head lay in the circle. The woman lying on her face. I pointed out three things to the architect or engineer when he was there. As nearly as I saw then, should say the distance between the bureau or dressing case and bed was more than two feet ten inches, which the architect gave as a distance this morning. Mrs. Borden was a stout woman. Her body did not fill up the space between the bureau and the bedstead. There was a foot of space left on either side of her. She was lying a little on her left side. It was diagonally on her left side. This left the right and a portion of the left side of her head fairly well exposed. It must have been twelve o'clock nearly before I went upstairs. The body had not been changed in position at that time. I was told by Dr. Bowen it had not been. I put my hands into the wounds of the old lady. I'm very confident no blood dropped from my hands when I drew them away. I got several spots of blood on me, either upstairs or downstairs. I think downstairs. Cannot recollect if my hands touched Mr. Borden before I went upstairs. I think I touched Mrs. Borden first, when I saw her the second time. Colonel Adams spent an hour in questioning the witness about irrelative matters, and then the medical examiner continued, saying, I took notes the second time I was in the room. After that I assisted officers Mulally and Doherty in searching the house. We searched the lower floor first, I think. Don't know where Miss Lizzie was at this time. She was up in her room, where I saw her last before the search. I think she was up in her room when we began the search. Think she went upstairs by the front way. Saw her in her room three or four times. Wouldn't say I saw her in her room when I took the view. I'm not positive whether I made the examination of Mrs. Borden before or after the search. Saw Miss Lizzie last at one thirty o'clock. At the time of the examination of Mr. Borden, others were also present. Mrs. Borden was dressed in a calico gown. The lawyers for the defence now both began to cut the strings of a bundle which had been placed on Mr. Jennings's desk. As they were doing it, Judge Blaisdell asked Dr. Dolan if he wouldn't sit down. The doctor said not just yet, but Mr. Adams, looking up, asked if he was the one referred to. The court said he wasn't, and Mr. Adams remarked that he wasn't quite ready yet. Out of the bundle which Mrs. Jennings and Adams were opening, there now rolled a doll about ten inches in height, and the head of a record doll. Mr. Adams called the doll a mannequin in talking to the court afterwards, but it was simply a doll. As it was produced, the crowd in the courtroom laughed. Dr. Dolan testified that a pillow sham with spots of blood on it was on the bed in the room where Mrs. Borden was. The piece of door jam was brought in, and with it a piece of plastering. After careful examination of the moulding, Dr. Dolan indicated a tiny spot on the paint. It was about the size of two pinheads. After Mr. Adams had finished with the piece of moulding, 
Mr. Jennings took it and showed it to Reverend Mr. Buck, who sat behind him, pointing out the spots to the Reverend gentleman. Reverend Mr. Buck smiled incredulously and settled back in his chair. Mr. Brigham, whose wife was the firm friend of the Borden girls, looked at the moulding and said nothing. The relic was being passed along further when Mr. Knowlton suggested it be returned to the desk and it was placed there. Mr. Adams discussed the wounds of Mr. Borden next and had them carefully described to him with marks in the doll's head and by measuring the extent of the blows on his own face. Dr. Dolan continued, Did not go to the house Friday, went there Saturday and met Marshal Hilliard, Mr. Jennings, Assistant Marshal Fleet, and Mr. Seaver, took up and carried away a great many things, took away a white underskirt. There was a spot of blood on the meshes of this skirt. The spot was about a foot from the ground. There was also a smooch found at the upper part of the opening to a pocket in a dress. I saw this through a microscope. All these things went to Professor Wood. I think Mr. Jennings gave them to me. There were, in all, a dress, a blouse waist, and an underskirt, and a pair of shoes. The shoes were sent for afterward. We had searched everywhere on Saturday and been afforded every opportunity for looking around. There were two hairs on one of the hatchets found in the cellar. They were grey hairs, and one was very short. The short one was three-quarters of an inch long and was caught in the rough end surface of the handle. I looked at it under a microscope. I did not know whether or not this was a human hair, but it looked as if one end was broken. The other end was fine. At this point the hearing was adjourned to Friday morning at ten o'clock. District Attorney Knowlton stated that as his presence at the hearing was purely voluntary, he would ask the court to question three or four witnesses who might be called before his arrival in the morning. He said they would testify to the movements of Mr. Borden while out of doors on the morning of the tragedy. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of The Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Second Day of the Trial Dr. Dolan was placed upon the stand again and dwelt at length upon the question of his opinion as to which of the Bordens was murdered first. He said, I will say that the condition of the blood indicated that it had been out of the living tissues an hour and a half to two hours. Did not, the first time I was upstairs, examine the edges of the wounds of Mrs. Borden, formed my opinion of the time since Mrs. Borden's death when I first saw her, think she must have been dead an hour and a half to two hours. Abram G. Hart was then called to the stand. He is the treasurer of the Union Savings Bank, of which the late Mr. Borden was president. He testified, Saw Mr. Borden about 9.30 o'clock at the bank on the day of his death. He usually called at the bank at that time in the morning. The day before, at a quarterly meeting of the trustees, he was not present. He said on the morning of the day he died that he would have been present on the preceding day, but had been ill. The defence did not cross-examine the witness. John T. Burrow cashier of the National Union Bank, in which institution Mr. Borden was a depositor and stockholder, saw Mr. Borden come into his bank on the morning of August the 4th, the day he died. Did not know if Mr. Borden came back to the bank again. The two banks are in the same building. The defence did not cross-examine. Everett Cook, cashier of the First National Bank, of which Mr. Borden was a director, saw Mr. Borden at the bank August the 4th. He came in about quarter of ten and went out five minutes of ten. He did not come in again that day. He usually came in daily. Charles T. Cook, insurance agent, had charge of one of Mr. Borden's business blocks on the corner of Anawan and South Main Streets. He had been in the habit of seeing Mr. Borden, but did not see him on the day of the murder. The last time the witness talked with Mr. Borden was on the Sunday before the murder. There was no talk with reference to a will. Three weeks before that, he had told the witness he had no will, but said nothing about making one. The witness positively denied 
that he had spoken to Inspector Medley about the fact that Mr. Borden was making a will. Mrs. Dr. Kelly, who lives next door south of the Borden residence, testified that she was at home on the morning of August the 4th and saw Mr. Borden walking around from the back door as if he had been trying to get into the house. He had a small white package in his hand at the time. This was at 27 or 28 minutes before 11 o'clock, and she fixed the time by an appointment which she had with the dentist. Jonathan Clegg saw Mr. Borden in his store on the morning of the murder at 10.20 o'clock, and he left there exactly at 10.29 o'clock. On leaving the store, Mr. Borden went south. John Cunningham, a news dealer, testified that he was in front of a house four houses north of the Borden place when he first heard of the murder. Saw Mrs. Churchill cross the street. Was told that Mrs. Churchill wanted a policeman and telephoned to the city marshal by a clerk in the paint shop. It was ten minutes to eleven. Cross-examined by Mr. Jennings. When I telephoned, I was going up towards the store. Mrs. Churchill I saw coming from her own house, I should think. Mrs. Churchill came over to some men. I passed them, and after I had gone three or four feet, a boy told me Mrs. Churchill wanted me to telephone. Officer Allen then came along. He went in the house right off and came out. Charles Sawyer went into the house with Mr. Allen. Then I went down street, and when Mr. Allen came out, I asked him what the matter was, and went in. Found Mr. Manning and Mr. Stevens, two reporters, in the yard. Did not notice anybody go in the barn. Mr. Jennings. Did you notice the cellar door, Mr. Cunningham? I did, particularly. I tried it, and it was locked. I remained there about ten minutes more. Officers Doherty and Mulally came. Francis H. Wixon, a deputy sheriff, was in the marshal's office when he heard of the murder. The marshal was talking through the telephone. It was about ten or fifteen minutes past eleven, as on his way to the office he heard the bell of the city hall strike eleven. The witness went up five or six minutes after the message was received and arrived at about eleven thirty o'clock. There were not many people in the house, and the witness saw Dr. Bowen there upon his arrival. Officer Doherty overtook the speaker in the yard, and together they went in the house and looked at the body of Mr. Borden. He knew nothing about Mrs. Borden's murder and had some consultation with Dr. Bowen. The result was that the witness removed Mr. Borden's watch, saw nothing of Lizzie Borden. Dr. Bowen then went upstairs and the witness and the officer followed. He saw Dr. Dolan there before the witness left. Continuing, Mr. Wixon said, I went out in the yard and looked south. There I saw a man in an open space who was sawing wood. In the same lot I saw two other men at work. They had not heard of the murder, and I told them. At this point the court took a recess for dinner, and upon coming in again, John Shortsleeves testified to having seen Mr. Borden in a shop on South Main Street at 10.30 or 10.40 o'clock. Then John V. Morse, a brother of Mr. Borden's first wife, was called and said, I am fifty-nine years old, live at present at the Borden house. My permanent home is Dartmouth. I used to live in Iowa, in the West. I returned from the West after living there twenty years, three years ago last April. I first lived in Warren and then in Dartmouth. My sister, the past Mrs. Borden, died about 1863. Heard of the marriage to the second wife before I came from the West. Have resided in Dartmouth the past year, coming to Fall River every month or two. In connection with the tragedy, left New Bedford to come here August the 3rd on 12.35 train. Saw Lizzie at the Borden house. Arrived there about one thirty o'clock. Dined there. Stayed till after three, then went over to Swansea. Hired a horse and wagon and got back about a quarter of nine. Visited Borden's farm and another place went there on business relating to Mr. Borden, went there to see about cattle that day, invited Mr. Borden to go with me. I saw Mr. and Mrs. Borden on my return. Emma did not arrive until the night of the tragedy at about six o'clock. I did not see Lizzie until after the couple were killed. I heard her come in the night before and go up the front stairs. This was about 9.15. 
Her room was at the head of the front stairs, and I occupied the spare chamber. This room was not accessible at night from the stairs. Mr. and Mrs. Borden slept in the east room next to Lizzie's room. Miss Emma's room was just north of Lizzie's, just back of the spare room. Stairs lead from Miss Lizzie's room to the spare room. I did not hear Miss Lizzie's voice when she entered. I retired about ten o'clock. Mrs. Borden retired first. I rose about six o'clock and came downstairs a few minutes afterwards. When I came down, I found no one, and I first saw Mr. Borden. This was fifteen minutes after I came down. He entered the sitting room, and Mrs. Borden appeared soon afterwards. I took breakfast with the family, Mr. and Mrs. Borden and myself. We ate breakfast at about seven o'clock, and I then saw the servant. She waited upon the table, coming in when the bell was rung. There were bananas on the table. After breakfast, we went into the sitting room and engaged in conversation. Mrs. Borden came in and out of the room and was dusting. She had nothing on her head. I went away at a quarter before nine, and Miss Lizzie had not been down, to my knowledge. I went down to the post office and mailed a letter. Then I went up Pleasant to Waybosset Street to visit a niece at the home of Daniel Emery. This is about a mile away. District Attorney. Where did you go when you went away from the house? I don't ask this for my own sake. The witness is no client of mine. But it's only fair in view of what has been said that he should tell his story. The last I saw of Mrs. Borden, she was in the front entry. The last words Mr. Borden said were, John, come back to dinner. I fixed the time I left the Borden house at a quarter of nine by having my watch with me. I saw Mrs. Borden go into the front hall before I left home. Can't say if she had a feather duster in her hand. It was the last time I saw her alive. It was Mr. Borden who let me out that morning. The letter I posted was, I think, to Mr. William Lincoln. I walked up to Emery's, left there at 11.20 o'clock. The dinner hour at the Borden house was usually 12 o'clock. I came back on the horse car down Pleasant Street and went right up 2nd Street. At the door, the servant girl told me of the affair. Inside the house were Mr. Sawyer, Dr. Bowen, and two policemen. I did not see Dr. Dolan there. Then it was about a quarter of twelve, I should estimate. After I had been in the house two or three minutes, I saw Miss Lizzie in the dining room, on the sofa. I spoke to her, but I do not remember what I said. I saw the bodies, and then went downstairs and saw Lizzie. I did no searching. The last time I was at the house before this was in the middle of July. I did not see Miss Lizzie then. I was there in June and stayed a day, and did not see Miss Lizzie at that time. I was on corresponding terms with Mr. Borden and Emma when I was west. I have never had a letter from Lizzie in my life. Mr. Morse testified that Mr. Borden had told him that most of the family had been sick the day before. He was also questioned at length concerning the condition of things at the house when he arrived. Bridget Sullivan was then called and said, My name is Bridget Sullivan, and I was known by the name of Maggie at the Borden house. I was employed there for two years and nine months. I swept the front hall every other week and had no duties in the bedrooms. At the time of the tragedy, Miss Emma was not at home. She had been out of town for a week, and when she was gone, the family consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Borden and Miss Lizzie. Miss Lizzie went with Miss Emma when she went away, but came back. I first saw Mr. Morse between one thirty and 2 o'clock on the day he arrived. I saw him again walking out in the afternoon. I did not see him when he arrived home that night. I got up at 6.15 o'clock Thursday morning, and it was 10 o'clock the night before when I retired. I locked the screen door and the back wooden door before I went to bed. When I came down in the morning, I found the doors exactly as I had left them, and I opened them. I went out for milk and afterward hooked up the screen door. The back door remained open. Nobody else came in or out that I can remember, except members of the house. I did not go out of the house again until Mr. Borden went out. Nobody was up when I came down, and the first one I saw was Mrs. Borden. I saw her in the kitchen and on the back stairs at half-past six. Never knew anybody to go up the back way to the front part, or the front way to the back part. Mr. Borden came down about two minutes after Mrs. Borden. 
He went outdoors before breakfast. He went into the barn and got some water. He emptied a pail from the house and came back. I was in the kitchen all the time. After Mr. Borden came in with his pail, he washed up. He put his dressing coat on after washing up. Think he put his necktie and collar on after breakfast. We had for breakfast cold mutton, soup, johnny cakes and coffee. Breakfast, as nearly as I recollect, was at 7.15. After breakfast they were in the sitting room. Mr. Morse had come down to breakfast. He went out at quarter of nine, I should judge. Mr. Borden let him out. Mrs. Borden, I expect, was in the sitting room when Mr. Morse went out. I saw Mr. Borden there about nine. I don't know when Mr. Morse went. After Morse went. Mr. Borden went up the back stairs. Did not see him when he came down or went out. Don't know if he went out the front or back door. I went out in the backyard a while. I was sick at my stomach and vomited. Did not see Mrs. Borden when I came back. Was out in the yard four or five minutes and came back into the kitchen and washed dishes. Mrs. Borden told me she wanted the windows washed inside and outside all around the house. I did not see Mrs. Borden after that. She went into the kitchen. The next time I saw her, she was dead. Lizzie was then through with her breakfast. She came downstairs before I went outside. She was then in the kitchen. When I came back, I don't know where she was. I asked Lizzie what she wanted for breakfast, and she said she didn't feel like eating anything. When I saw Mrs. Borden, she had a dusting cloth and was dusting the dining room. I didn't know where Lizzie was. That was after both men had gone. I don't know whether or not I locked the screen door after I came in from vomiting. I then cleaned up the kitchen and straightened up and commenced to prepare to wash the windows. I went down cellar and got a pail, got a brush from the closet and went out to the barn to get a stick. Miss Lizzie then came into the back entry and asked where I was going. I told her I was going to wash windows and that she need not hook the door. I told her I'd get the water in the barn and she said all right. The door was then hooked, and I had to unhook it. I was down in the cellar earlier in the morning to get coal and wood. The next time I went down was when I got the pail. It was half an hour after Mrs. Borden told me to wash the windows before I commenced. During that time I did not see Miss Lizzie except when she came to the screen door. Where she was, I don't know. I had not been doing any work in the spare room. Lizzie Borden never did work in the spare room when her friends had occupied it. After I went out to wash the windows, I saw Lizzie. She had asked me as I went out if I was going to wash the windows. I told her yes, and that if she wanted to close the windows, I would get water in the barn. Five windows I had to wash. I shut three before I went out. The two others were already shut. I did not see Miss Lizzie after I got out. I had not seen anybody while I was in the barn after the dipper. When I went downstairs after the pail, I went down the kitchen stairs. We wash on Monday and I on Tuesday, and on Monday and Tuesday the cellar door was open. I opened the door the day I hung my clothes out, and don't know if anybody else went in or out of it that week before the murder. I shut and locked the door Tuesday myself. I got through washing the windows at twenty minutes past ten, I think, "'Washed the sitting-room side first, and then the parlour, and last the dining-room. "'The windows were shut upstairs. "'I then went inside at the screen door, hooked it, "'and getting a hand-basin washed the sitting-room windows inside. "'Did not see Lizzie or Mr. Borden in the house while I was washing the sitting-room windows. "'Didn't see anybody outside or in the house while I was washing windows. "'I heard Mr. Borden try to get in at the front door.' Afterwards went to the front door and found the bolt and lock turned. Miss Lizzie was upstairs at that time. She might have been in the hall, for I heard her laugh upstairs as I let Mr. Borden in. I went to open the door and it was locked, and I made some exclamation when she laughed aloud. I did not see her until five or ten minutes afterwards. I was in the sitting room. Mr. Borden came in and sat down at the head of the lounge in the dining room. He was reading, and I was in the sitting-room washing windows. I did not see her when I let Mr. Borden in. I heard her tell her father that Mrs. Borden got a note and went out. Lizzie spoke very low. I don't know where Lizzie went then, and I don't know whether or not she stayed in her room. 
After I finished in the sitting room, Mr. Borden took the key from the sitting room shelf and started upstairs the back way. When he came down, I was just going into the dining room. I did not see Miss Lizzie then. She was not in the dining room, sitting room or kitchen. Then Mr. Borden sat down near the window in the sitting room with a book or paper in his hand. He brought the key back and put it on the shelf. He sat in an easy chair, and I had started to wash the first window in the dining room. I did not see Miss Lizzie, and only saw her when she came into the dining room, and then to the kitchen, and then back again to the dining room with an ironing board. She placed the ironing board on the dining room table. Where she came from, I do not know. She put the ironing board on a corner of the table. It was about two feet long. She always ironed the handkerchiefs. I did not hear Mr. Borden leave the chair in which he was sitting. After I finished, I came into the kitchen, and Miss Lizzie asked me if I was going out. I told her I didn't know, as I was feeling sick, and she said if I went out to be sure and lock the door, as, quote, I may be out, end quote. And Mrs. Borden had got a note and gone out. I then went upstairs to my room, and Miss Lizzie was downstairs working at the ironing board. She came out and told me there was a sale of dry goods at Sargent's. If Mr. Borden changed his position to the sofa, I didn't know it. Soon after I got upstairs, it struck eleven o'clock. I was then lying in bed, but I didn't take my clothes off. I thought I had time enough to get dinner at half-past eleven. I always went upstairs before dinner if I had time. Didn't look at the fire before I went upstairs. The dinner was to be soup to warm over and cold mutton. Had not put the soup on, and the potatoes were in the soup. A coal fire was started in the morning. I was going downstairs about 11.30. Had not gone out of the screen door again after I commenced to wash the windows inside. I next heard something when Lizzie called me. It might have been 10 or 15 minutes after I came upstairs. She hollered at me. I knew from the way she hollered something was the matter. She hollered loud. She said her father was dead. She told me to run after Dr. Bowen. I wanted to run in ahead and see, but she told me to run quick and tell the doctor. I went and told Mrs. Bowen about it. Mrs. Bowen told me to get Miss Russell about it, and I went back and told Miss Lizzie. She told me to go after Miss Russell. When I got back from the Bowens, Miss Lizzie was still at the door. When I got back from Miss Russell's, Dr. Bowen had just got out of his wagon, and I think Mrs. Churchill was there. Miss Lizzie was then in the kitchen. We talked, and Miss Lizzie said she'd like us to search for Mrs. Borden. I said I'd go upstairs, and Mrs. Churchill said she'd go with me. I went up and saw Mrs. Borden before I went in. When the house was searched that day, a box of hatchets was behind the furnace. I don't know if the cellar door was open when the officers were searching the house the day of the murder. I asked Lizzie where she was, and she said she was out in the back yard. When was it she said that? After I got back from Mrs. Russell's. Do you know what dress she had on? I don't know. Had Mrs. Borden said anything to you about going out? No, sir. Was it her habit to notify you when she went out? Mr. Adams promptly objected to this, and the court excluded the question. Then the only thing you know about her going out was what Lizzie told you. Mr. Jennings objected to this question, and said that while he did not object to the district attorney asking leading questions, on important matters, this was altogether too serious a point to allow such queries. District Attorney Knowlton declined to take this view of the matter, and a discussion commenced, pending which an adjournment for the day was taken. End of chapter 15「of The Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Third and Fourth Days of the Trial Mr. Knowlton called Bridget Sullivan to the sand, and she continued her testimony. Mrs. Borden came downstairs Wednesday morning, saying she and Mr. Borden had been sick that night. They looked pretty sick. Lizzie said she had been sick all night, too. I came down to start the fire. Miss Lizzie had been ironing eight or nine minutes when I went upstairs. There used to be a horse kept in the barn. Since the horse was kept there, I have seen Lizzie go to the barn. 
Miss Lizzie spoke about her mother going out and said her mother had received a note that morning. Mr. Knowlton, did Lizzie say anything about hearing her mother groan? Bridget, she said she heard her father groan. Mr. Knowlton, did you at any time that day see Lizzie crying? Bridget, no, not in all the day. Mr. Adams conducted the cross-examination and commenced by politely asking the witness if she would be seated. She declined a chair, and questions commenced rapidly. The counsel inquired her to review the history of her life, and then commenced questioning her regarding her movements on the fatal day. She said, quote, I always carry a night key and lock the doors as I pass in and out. The night before the murders I was out, but came home alone. Never had a man call on me at that house. When someone came, it was not a Fall River man was out in the yard Wednesday morning, and Lizzie told me she had been sick. That day had pork steak, johnny cakes, and coffee for breakfast, had soup and mutton for dinner, soup, bread, cake, and tea for supper. Tuesday night, when they were taken sick, we had swordfish warmed over for dinner, had baker's bread too, got the bread myself, went of my own notion to get the bread, and when I got back, Mrs. Borden gave me five cents, I didn't eat any of that bread. I was taken sick that night. Didn't see Lizzie Wednesday after breakfast. They were all sick. Wednesday morning, I went downstairs after coal and kindlings, then opened the blinds in the dining room. I never rang a bell for breakfast. They all got up without calling. Didn't have anything particular to do in the dining room till after breakfast. Mrs. Borden came downstairs and told me Mr. Morse was in the house. I asked her if he slept in the attic and she said no in the spare chamber. That Thursday morning, Mr. Borden had brought in a basket of pears from the tree. He had brought in some a day or two before. They got rotten, and he had dumped them under the barn. The only rooms I had been in Thursday morning up to breakfast time were the kitchen and dining room. Mrs. Borden often asked after breakfast what I had to do that day. The ice chest was in the closet opening from the entry. We went upstairs out of that entryway. Never saw any clothes but my own on the nails in the entry. There was a shawl sometimes hanging there. It belonged to the house. Didn't see a felt hat that morning. In the closet were kept the bonnets and shawl of Mrs. Borden that she would come and get and go out with any time. Sure I didn't go into any room except the dining room and kitchen the day of the murder. Think it was before nine o'clock when Mrs. Borden said, What have you got to do today, Maggie? She told me that I had better wash the windows outside and in. Lizzie took her breakfast in the kitchen. She took coffee, I'm sure of that. Lizzie was in the dining room, I think, when her mother asked me what I had to do. Lizzie said, coming out into the kitchen, that she was going to have a cookie and coffee for breakfast. She sat down by the kitchen table. There were old magazines in the closet. Had seen Lizzie sit down in the kitchen sometimes and read the old magazines. When I went out into the backyard, she was eating her breakfast. Didn't mean to say the first time I saw Lizzie was when I saw her at the screen door. First saw her coming out of the dining room door to the kitchen when I was at the sink. It was about an hour after she came down that she came to the screen door. During that hour, I was washing up the dishes. I was out in the yard when she was at her breakfast. I felt sick that morning getting up. I drank some of the milk, but I didn't eat any of the bread. I don't know whether they drank milk before being taken sick or not. I had eaten some mutton soup and some of my own bread before being taken sick. I had not eaten any of the pears, for I'm no great lover of them. I came back in again, and Lizzie had had her breakfast. I went to work washing windows. I didn't know where Lizzie was then, but she wasn't in the kitchen. Mr. Morse went away while I was washing the dishes, but I don't know whether this was before or after Lizzie had had her breakfast. When I was taken sick to my stomach and came back, Mr. Morse had gone out. I went downstairs into the laundry, got a pail and brush, and then went out into the barn to get a handle for the brush. I got it in one of the stalls. As I went out, I spoke to Lizzie at one of the screen doors. Lizzie asked me if I was going to wash the windows, and I said yes. She followed me into the entry. Didn't say yesterday that I came back from the barn and then spoke to Lizzie at the screen door. When I told her she needn't fasten the screen door, she didn't do it. 
must have got six or seven pails of water from the barn to wash the windows. The dipper I went in and got was an ordinary tin dipper. Got it in the kitchen. Mr. Borden was in the habit of going out the back door, but I didn't see him. Didn't see Mr. Borden go out before I washed the windows. Raised the sitting room windows to wash them from the inside. The window nearest the hall was open when I heard Mr. Borden at the front door. Can't say if he rang bell. Made a coal fire that morning. Didn't finish the dishes in the house. They always put the ironing board on the dining room table. Washed Monday. Hanging out the clothes Tuesday and ironed Wednesday. Finished ironing that evening. Then I laid the clothes ironed out in piles, and Mrs. Borden and the girls took them upstairs. I mean Lizzie took hers up instead of the girls took them up. They took the piles of clothes up Thursday morning. I separated the clothes before breakfast. The little ironing board was not quite as big as a large board. Sometimes in hot weather the girls ironed in the kitchen, but usually it was in the dining room. Can't say if Lizzie was in the dining room when I came in for the dipper. The court then adjourned until next morning when the hearing was resumed. Mrs. Adelaide B. Churchill, a neighbour and friend of the Bordens, was called to the witness stand as soon as Judge Blaisdell announced that he was ready. She said, The first that I knew about the tragedy was when I saw Bridget Sullivan going to Dr. Bowen's house. I was on Second Street, coming from the City Hall. She was going in the direction of Dr. Bowen's house and appeared frightened. I went to my house, into the kitchen, the back door of my house is opposite the back door of the dining room. I looked out to the Borden house and saw Lizzie Borden standing inside the screen door. She looked distressed. She had her hand to her head. I asked her what was the matter. She said, Somebody has killed father. Come over. I went over and went inside the house. Lizzie was sitting on the second stair inside the screen door. The stairway is at the right as you come in. I put my hand on her arm and said, "'Oh, Lizzie, where is your father?' She said, "'In the sitting-room.' I said, "'Where were you?' She said, "'I went out to the barn to get a piece of iron.' I heard a distressing noise and came back and found the screen door open. I asked Lizzie where her mother was. She said she had a note inviting her to go visit someone who was sick. She didn't know, but she was killed too, and wished we'd try and find her, for she thought she had heard her come in. She said, Father must have an enemy, for we have all been sick. She thought they must have been poisoned. Then she said she must have a doctor. I said I would get one and went to find somebody. There was no one in the sitting room, I thought. I saw no one else in the house or coming to it. I went down Second Street to Hall Stable to get a young man I thought I could find there. I went back again, and in a few moments Dr. Bowen came. Lizzie told him to go into the sitting room. We went, Bridget, Lizzie, and I, to the dining-room door. Pretty soon Dr. Bowen came out and asked for a sheet. Bridget did not want to go upstairs alone, so I went up with her. Bridget got the sheets and gave one to Dr. Bowen. I think Dr. Bowen went out then. Soon after Miss Russell came in, Lizzie said she wished somebody would hunt for her mother. Bridget would not go up alone, and I went with her. I went up the stairs and saw on the far or north side of the bed the prostrate form. I didn't go any further. I was halfway up the stairs and my eyes were about on a level with the floor. I went right down. Miss Russell asked if I had made the noise and asked me if I had found another. Dr. Bowen was not there then. A gentleman named Allen came in next and then Charles Sawyer. I saw Mr. Borden in the yard about nine o'clock before he went down street. He stood by the screen door. Afterwards saw him headed down street. In the cross-examination concluded by Mr. Jennings, the witness said she saw one of the windows open. It was opposite the screen door. Miss Alice C. Russell was then called. She said she lived on Borden Street, 300 yards from the Borden house, and had known Lizzie 11 years. She thought it was about 11.30. Bridget Sullivan told her of the affair, and she went right over. Lizzie was there in the door. Did you say anything to Lizzie, or she to you? I don't remember. Was Dr. Bowen there? I didn't see him. Did you go in and see the bodies? No, sir. Do you remember how Lizzie was dressed? No, I don't. Do you remember anything about it? Nothing very connected. Do you remember talking to Miss Lizzie after that? Yes, but I don't remember what was said. I remember she said she was out in the barn getting a piece of tin or iron with which to fit the screens. 
Do you recall when that was that she said that? I think it was upstairs. Were there many people there, and did you remain there, Miss Russell? There were people downstairs. I stayed four nights at the house. Mr. Knowlton, have you often visited the house, Miss Russell? Yes, have stayed there nights, have been the guest of the girls. Made my quarters in the guest chamber with the girls. Went there as often as I had reason to go, sometimes twice or three times a week. Was there a bed in that chamber? Yes, sir. Mr. Jennings, when you went in, where did you say Lizzie was? She was standing at the screen door and asked me to sit down in the chair in the kitchen. Saw no blood on her dress. Saw her hands. Rubbed them. There was no blood on them. Rubbed her cheek. There was no blood on them or her hair. Her hair, I think, was done up as usual. Her clothes had no blood on them. Don't know if she had on the same shoes I have seen her wear before. Was she fainting from exertion? No, she wasn't fainting. Do you remember if Lizzie went upstairs before the officers did? No, she did not. How do you know? Because I remember they were all down talking to her. Do you know if an officer went upstairs? They went upstairs. I don't know if I went with them. I can't connect it with them, if I went too. I remember being upstairs. Did they go into Miss Lizzie's room before she went up? Yes, they tried to open Miss Lizzie's door, and it was locked. They had to break it in and pull the hook out. I told them to let me look in first. I went in, and they came in after I looked around. Do not know who the officers were. Did not know Officer Doherty by sight. Know him now. I was in the parlour with them downstairs. Do recollect now one of the officers. It was Assistant Marshal Fleet. Did the officers go up to Miss Lizzie's room when she was there? Yes, they went up then and afterwards. It seems to me they were coming all day. They asked her questions and she answered them freely. Miss Lucy Collette said that she was at Dr. Chagnon's house on August the 4th. She went there at ten minutes before eleven in answer to a telephone message from a clerk at Dr. Shannon's. She was to take any telephone message for Dr. Shannon's family were away. All the doors were locked, and so the witness sat on the piazza in front of the house. She was there up to twelve o'clock and saw nobody either in the yard or passed through. She could see the whole yard, and there was nobody there during the time she sat on the piazza. The calling of the next witness in the judgment of many of the spectators in court produced evidence of uneasiness on the part of Lizzie Borden. He was Eli Bentz, the drug clerk. He said he remembered the day of the tragedy and knew the defendant. She was in his store the day before the tragedy between 10 and 11.30 o'clock. She asked me for 10 cents worth of prussic acid. I told her we didn't sell it without a doctor's prescription. She said she wanted it to use on a sealskin cape and I again told her we couldn't sell it without a prescription, and she said she had bought it before. Then she went out. Is the defendant the person who tried to purchase that poison? She is, was the answer. Who was there? Mr. Hart and Mr. Kilroy, the clerks. This was all that Mr. Bentz was required to tell by Mr. Knowlton, but Mr. Adams cross-examined him at great length. His testimony was not shaken. Frederick E. Hart who worked for Smith the druggist, said he saw Miss Borden between 10 and 10.30 Wednesday morning. A woman came in and said she wanted 10 cents worth of prussic acid to put around the edges of a sealskin sack or cape. She did not speak to me, though she was very close to me. Is the defendant a woman? Yes, sir. Frank H. Kilroy was in Smith's drugstore at the time. He said, I saw this lady come in. She went to the counter and asked for prussic acid. Mr. Bent said, I can't sell prussic acid without a prescription. The only other thing I heard was the woman use the words seal skin cape. She left the store then. That was all I heard. Mr. Knowlton, are you sure this is the woman? Yes, sir. Assistant Marshal John Fleet testified as follows. I was home when the news came from the marshal, who had sent word to me by a man in a team. I drove down to the Borden house and arrived about ten minutes of twelve. I saw Officer Allen and Mr. Manning at the front door. Mr. Sawyer was at the rear door. Inside I found Bridget, Mr. Morse, Dr. Dolan, Dr. Bowen, and Miss Lizzie. I went into the sitting room 
and saw Dr. Dolan standing over Mr. Borden. Then I went upstairs and saw Mrs. Borden. Soon after, I went into Miss Lizzie's room and had a conversation with her. She was sitting in the room with Reverend Mr. Buck. I asked her if she knew anything about the man who killed her father and mother. She said it was not her mother, but her stepmother. Her mother was dead. I asked her if she had seen anyone around the premises, and she said she had not. Then she said she heard a man talking to her father at nine or half-past nine, and she thought they were talking about some store. I asked her if this man would do her father any injury, and she said no. I asked her if she knew this man, and she said no. She said she did not know that anyone had threatened her father or would do him harm. At this point, Miss Russell said, Lizzie, tell him all about that man. Then Lizzie said that two weeks ago a man had come to the front door and had held a long conversation with her father. The man seemed to be angry and was talking about a store he wanted her father to let. She said she heard Mr. Borden say he wouldn't let it for that purpose. She said she thought the man was a stranger in Fall River. I asked her if Bridget was in the house during the morning, and she said she had been washing windows and came in after her father came and then went upstairs. She said she didn't think Bridget had anything to do with it. Lizzie said that when Bridget went upstairs, she went up in the barn. Up in the barn? I said, and she said, yes. What do you mean by up? I asked. Upstairs, she said. I asked her how long she remained in the barn, and she said half an hour. She said her father was lying upon a lounge in the sitting room when she went out, and when she came back she found him all cut up, lying in the same position as she had left him. She also said John V. Morse had been there, and I asked her if Mr. Morse had anything to do with it. She said it was impossible, for he went away at nine o'clock in the morning and didn't come back. She didn't tell me what she was doing in the yard. Reverend Mr. Buck and Miss Russell were present during the conversation. I then started to search all the rooms I could go into. What did you find down in the cellar? Found Mr. Mulally with a number of axes on the floor of the washroom. We reached the cellar and found nothing other than the two axes and two hatchets. The two axes were dusty or covered with ashes, and so was the little hatchet. The large hatchet was clean with the exception of a small rust spot. It was about four inches long from the head to the edge six inches, and it had a claw handle. I tried the cellar door and then went out to the barn. I satisfied myself there was nobody there to do this deed. Then I went into the house again and consulted with two of my officers and State Officer Dexter. I made another search and saw Lizzie again in the presence of two officers. Dr. Bowen was holding the door. I told him I wanted to search the room. He said something to her. He went in. He came out and asked me if I must search the room. I said I must examine the room to make my report. He let me in then. When I got in, Miss Borden said, How long will it take you? I said I didn't know, but that I had to search the room. She said, I do hope you will get through soon. This is making me sick. I searched the room. Mr. Knowlton, did you say anything more to Miss Borden? Assistant Marshal Fleet. Yes, I said, you say, Miss Borden, that you went out to the barn and that you were out there half an hour while your father and mother were killed. You still say that? She said, I do not. I say I was in the barn twenty minutes to half an hour said I. You told me this morning that you were out there half an hour. I don't say so now, she said. It was twenty minutes to half an hour. What makes you say twenty minutes to half an hour, I asked her. Which is it now, twenty minutes or half an hour? She said, it was twenty minutes to half an hour. Mr. Knowlton, did you search the premises then? Did you have any more talks with her then? Marshal Fleet, I searched the room and bureau and then went behind Lizzie's door to another door. It was locked. I asked her what that room was. She said, that is father's room. Is there another way to get into it? I asked. She said there was by going by way of the back stairs, that the door from her room was always locked. I started to go around as there was no other way. When I got into the entry, I asked her what was in the clothes press. She asked me if I must search that. I told her I must. She said she had the key and would open it. She produced the key and opened it. Mr. Knowlton, describe the room. Marshal Fleet, it was about five by eight. There was a window in it, but it had not been opened in some time. We took nothing, and then we searched the rest of the house. 
I tried the door of Mrs. Borden's room from Lizzie's room. It was fastened by a bolt, I think, on the other side. Mr. Knowlton, did you go in there? What else did you say to Miss Borden? Marshal Fleet, when I went into Miss Borden's room, Miss Lizzie said there was no use going there, that she always locked her door, and there was no possible way for anybody to get into it. I asked her when she saw her mother last. She said about nine o'clock, when she was going downstairs. Her mother was in the room where she was found murdered. Miss Lizzie also said that Mrs. Borden had received a note or letter from someone that morning. She thought it was from somebody of the house. Mr. Knowlton, was Lizzie in tears while in her room? Marshal Fleet, no. The cross-examination of the witness brought out nothing of importance. End of chapter 16Chapter 17 of the Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Fifth Day of the Trial. There was a deathly stillness in the little courtroom as Professor Edward S. Wood of Harvard College, the expert in chemistry upon whose evidence it was believed so much would depend, was called to the stand. Lizzie Borden did not look as strong as on preceding days and the look which she concentrated upon the countenance of Professor Wood was absolutely pitiful. Emma Borden's face wore a slight flush, and the other members of the party did not stir a muscle. Every eye in the room was upon the witness, and not a sound broke the silence except the startling testimony which the professor at once commenced to give. He said, I received a package containing two stomachs, August the 5th. The package contained four jars. The first one was labelled Milk of August the 4th. The second was labelled Milk of August the 5th. The third was labelled Stomach of Andrew J. Borden. And the fourth, Stomach of Mrs. Andrew J. Borden. I opened the packages which bore their original seals and found both stomachs perfectly natural in appearance. There was no evidence of any inflammation. I opened and examined the contents of the stomachs. The stomach of Mrs. Andrew J. Borden contained 11 ounces of semi-solid food, the rest being water. At least four-fifths and perhaps nine-tenths was solid food. The rest was water. It was partially digested. The solid food contained bread, or rather wheat, starch, and a good deal of fat. That is, the contents were chiefly bread or similar food, meat and oil. It also contained many vegetable pulp cells, which might be potatoes, and also some vegetable tissue, which might be apple or onion skins. The digestion seemed to be advanced two or three hours. To the best of my opinion, it had advanced two and one-half hours, more or less. The stomach was immediately tested for prussic acid with negative results. There was no prussic acid in the stomach. I made a more complete analysis later with the same result. The stomach of Mr. Borden contained six ounces, mostly water. Nine-tenths was water and one-tenth solid material. In connection with Mrs. Borden's stomach, there were many solid bits of meat. In Mr. Borden's stomach, the food contained but small quantities of starch. The principal part of the solid food was vegetable pulp, and digestion in his stomach had advanced three and one-half to four hours. Digestion was very much further advanced than in the case of Mrs. Borden. There was about two and one-half hours difference. There were a few shreds of vegetable tissue in his stomach. I tested Mr. Borden's stomach for prussic acid with negative results. I did not test it for any other poison, but there was no evidence of irritation in either. I have not yet analysed the milk. There was a pause as Professor Wood concluded the sentences and a notable relaxation of the tension which prevailed through the room. It was but momentary, however, and in a second everybody was on edge again, as the district attorney propounded the next inquiry. "'Did you receive a trunk?' he asked. "'I did,' answered the professor. "'I was in Fall River August the 9th, and on August the 10th I received from Dr. Dolan a trunk. In the trunk there was a hatchet and two axes, a blue dress skirt, a blue dress waist, a white starched skirt, a lounge cover, and a large envelope which contained three small envelopes, 
One was marked Hair Taken from Andrew J. Borden, a second Hair Taken from Mrs. Andrew J. Borden, a third Hair Taken from the Hatchet. On August the 16th I received from Marshall Hilliard a box containing a pair of shoes and a pair of woman's black stockings. Of these I examined the hatchet. It contained quite a number of suspicious-looking spots, which looked as if they might be blood spots. They were on the edge and handle. There were no blood spots, however, on the hatchet, as my examination showed. The same was true of the axes. Every spot that it seemed possible might be blood I tested, and found no blood whatever on the instruments. On the blue dress there was a stain near the pocket. It was a smirch, and looked as if it might be a blood smooch, but it was not. There was a lower stain of similar appearance, but it was not blood. There was no spot whatever on the blue dress waist. The white skirt had one very small spot which was plainer outside than on the inside of the garment. It was almost a foot and six inches from the bottom. It was one sixteenth of an inch in diameter. That was a spot of blood, and there was no other spot on the skirt. The carpet was light brussels and had two dried pools of blood. I recognised it as the sitting-room carpet. The other carpet was saturated. It was from the spare room and was found under the body. There was a stain on the lounge cover which looked like blood, but it was not. The envelope marked hair from Andrew J. Borden contained a lock of white hair stained with blood. The envelope marked hair from Mrs. Andrew J. Borden contained a lock of dark grey hair stained with blood. The envelope marked hair from the hatchet contained a hair of red-brown colour. The root and end were there, and the hair was like that of a cow or some other animal. It was not human hair. I next examined the pair of shoes. On the bottom of the right shoe there was a stain that looked like blood, but a careful testing showed that it came from the tanning. There was no spot on the shoe, and I found nothing on either of the other two axes. Then pent-up excitement could be contained no longer, and great sighs of relief from the strain were heard as the professor concluded the important portion of his testimony. The friends of Miss Borden looked greatly relieved, and the prisoner herself appeared easier, but there was no change upon the placid countenance of the district attorney. Mr. Knowlton then asked some questions regarding the stains on the hatchet. Professor Wood said the material that looked like blood was chiefly wood and other fibres. There was a little stain and a long narrow stain on the bended edge, and on the blade was a spatter of water and iron rust. I examined the stains on the handle for blood spots with negative results. This ended Professor Wood's testimony, and Captain Philip Harrington was called. He said, after hearing of the murders, I went to the house and entered at the side door, went into the sitting-room, and on the lounge was a body. It was very much mutilated. Went upstairs and saw Mrs. Borden's body. Came down, and looking into a room, saw Miss Lizzie and Miss Russell. I stepped into the room and asked Miss Lizzie if she knew anything about the crime, and she said no. She was cool and collected, and said she could tell me nothing at all. I then asked her when she last saw her father. She said, when he returned from the post office. She said Maggie was in the house and she was in the barn. I asked her how long she was there, and she said twenty minutes. I asked her if she was sure it was fifteen minutes or half an hour, and she said, no, it was twenty minutes. Then I told her she had better be careful what she said, and that tomorrow she might have a clearer frame of mind. She made a curtsy and said, no, sir, I can tell you all I know now, just as well as at any other time. I asked her if she had seen anybody go by, and she said no. I said the barn is not a great distance, and as the screen door would have made a noise if anybody had passed it, would she not have heard it? She said she was up in the loft. She said she saw nobody in the yard or about. I asked her if she had any suspicion, and she told me about a man who had angry words with her father about a store. She heard her father say he would never let his store for that business. The man came again about two months ago, and there was another angry interview. Then she heard her father tell him the next time he was in town to call and see about it. I asked her if the man was from out of town, and she said yes, she should judge so. 
I said, Miss Borden, I would advise you not to submit to any further interviews. By tomorrow you may be able to recollect more about this man. I asked her if she had heard her father say anything about this, and she said no. I then went downstairs, and Dr. Bowen was there. There was a small fire in the stove, and what appeared to be the remains of some burned paper lay in the fireplace of the stove. The fire was very low. Officer Harrington then detailed the story of the search of the barn. The hay, he said, was tossed about. When he had finished, the district attorney read the shorthand report of the testimony of Miss Lizzie Borden, given at the inquest and taken by Miss White, the official stenographer. It was as follows. My father and stepmother were married twenty-seven years ago. I have no idea how much my father was worth and have never heard him form an opinion. I know something about what real estate my father owned. How do you know? Mr. Adams promptly objected. He said he did so on the ground of the admissibility of a statement, which was detrimental to her. Judge Blaisdell said he didn't know that any statement the defendant might make would not be competent. Mr. Adams argued in support of his objection. He said any statement that did not bear directly on the issue between the prosecution and the defence was not material. Judge Blaisdell allowed the introduction of the question, and the answer was, two farms in Swansea, the homestead, some property on North Main Street, Borden Block, some land further south, and some he had recently purchased. Did you ever deed him any property? He gave us some land, but my father bought it back had no other transaction with him. He paid him $5,000 cash for this property, never knew my father made a will, but heard so from Uncle Morse. Did you know of anybody that your father had trouble with? There was a man who came there some weeks before, but I do not know who he was. He came to the house one day, and I heard them talk about a store. My father told him he could not have a store. The man said, I thought with your liking for money you would let anybody in. I heard my father order him out of the house. Think he lived out of town because he said he could go back and talk with father. Did your father and anybody else have bad feelings between them? Yes, Hiram C. Harrington. He married my father's only sister. Nobody else? I have no reason to suppose that that man had seen my father before that day. Did you ever have any trouble with your stepmother? No. Within a year? No. Within three years? No. About five years ago. What was it about? About my stepmother's stepsister, Mrs. George Whitehead. Was it a violent expression of feeling? It was simply a difference of opinion. Were you always cordial with your stepmother? That depends on one's idea of cordiality. Was it cordial according to your ideas of cordiality? Yes. Continuing. I did not regard her as my mother, though she came there when I was young. I declined to say whether my relations between her and myself were those of mother and daughter or not. I called her Mrs. Borden, and sometimes mother. I stopped calling her mother after the affair regarding her sister-in-law. Why did you leave off calling her mother? Because I wanted to. Have you any other answer to give me? No, sir. I always went to my sister. She was older than I was. I don't know but that my father and stepmother were happily united. I never knew of any difficulty between them, and they seemed to be affectionate. The day they were killed, I had on a blue dress. I changed it in the afternoon and put on a print dress. Mr. Morse came into our house whenever he wanted to. He has been here once since the river was frozen over. I don't know how often he came to spend the nights, because I had been away so much. I have not been away much during the year. He has been there very little during the past year. I have been away a great deal in the daytime during the last year. I don't think I have been away much at night, except once when I was in New Bedford. I was abroad in 1890. I first saw Morse Thursday noon. Wednesday evening I was with Miss Russell at nine o'clock, and I don't know whether the family were in or not. I went directly to my room. I locked the front door when I came in was in my room Wednesday, not feeling well all day, did not go down to supper, went out that evening and came in and locked the front door, came down about nine next morning, did not inquire about Mr. Morse that morning, 
did not go to Marion at that time, because they could go sooner than I. I had taken the secretaryship of the Christian Endeavour Society, and had to remain over till the tenth. There had been nobody else around there that week but the man I have spoken of. I did not say that he came a week before, but that week. Mr. Morse slept in the spare room Wednesday night. It was my habit to close my room door when I was in it. That Wednesday afternoon they made such a noise that I closed the door. First saw my father Thursday morning downstairs reading the Providence Journal. Saw my mother with a dust cloth in her hand. Maggie was putting a cloth into a mop. Don't know whether I ate cookies and tea that morning. Know the coffee pot was on the stove. My father went downtown after nine o'clock. I did not finish the handkerchiefs because the irons were not right. I was in the kitchen reading when he returned. I am not sure that I was in the kitchen when my father returned. I stayed in my room long enough to sew a piece of lace on a garment. That was before he came back. I don't know where Maggie was. I think she let my father in and that he rang the bell. I understood Maggie to say he said he had forgotten his key. I think I was upstairs when my father came in, and I think I was on the stairs when he entered. I don't know whether Maggie was washing windows or not when my father came in. At this point, the district attorney had called Miss Borden's attention to her conflicting statements regarding her position when her father came in, and her answer was, You have asked me so many questions, I don't know what I have said. Later, she said she was reading in the kitchen and had gone into the other room for a copy of the Providence Journal. I last saw my mother when I was downstairs. She was dusting the dining room. She said she had been upstairs and made the bed and was going upstairs to put on the pillow slips. She had some cotton cloth pillows up there, and she said she was going to work on them. If she had remained downstairs, I should have seen her. She would have gone up the back way to go to her room. If she had gone to the kitchen, I would have seen her. There is no reason to suppose I would not have seen her when she was downstairs or in her room, except when I went downstairs once for two or three minutes. I ask you again what you suppose she was doing from the time you saw her till eleven o'clock. I don't know, unless she was making her bed. She would have had to pass your room, and you would have seen her, wouldn't you? Yes, unless I was in my room or down cellar. I suppose she had gone away because she told me she was going, and we talked about the dinner. Didn't hear her go out or come back. When I first came downstairs, saw Maggie coming in, and my mother asked me how I was feeling. My father was still there, still reading. My mother used to go and do the marketing. Now I call your attention to the fact you said twice yesterday that you first saw your father after he came in when you were standing on the stairs. I did not. I was in the kitchen when he came in, or in one of the three rooms, the dining room, kitchen, and sitting room. It would have been difficult for anybody to pass through these rooms unless they passed through while I was in the dining room. A portion of the time the girl was out of doors, wasn't she? Yes. So far as I know, I was alone in the house a larger part of the time when my father was away. I was eating a pear when my father came in. I had put a stick of wood into the fire to see if I could start it. I did no more ironing after my father came in. I then went in to tell him. I did not put away the ironing board. I didn't know what time my father came in. When I went out to the barn, I left him on the sofa. The last thing I said was to ask him if he wanted the window left that way. When I went to the barn to get some lead for a sinker, I went upstairs in the barn. There was a bench there which contained some lead. I unhooked the screen door when I went out. I don't know when Bridget got through washing the windows inside. I knew she washed the windows outside. I knew she didn't wash the kitchen windows, but I don't know whether she washed the sitting room windows or not. I thought the flats would be hot by the time I got back. I had not fishing apparatus, but there was some at the farm. It is five years since I used the fish line. I don't think there was any sinker on my line. I don't think there were any fish lines suitable for use at the farm. What? Did you think you would find sinkers in the barn? My father once told me that there was some lead in the nails in the barn. How long do you think you were occupied in looking for the sinkers? About fifteen or twenty minutes. Did you do nothing besides look for sinkers in the twenty minutes? Yes, sir. I ate some pears. Would it take you all that time to eat a few pears? 
I do not do things in a hurry. Was Bridget not washing the dining-room windows and the sitting-room windows? I do not know. I did not see her. Did you tell Bridget to wash the windows? No, sir. Who did? My mother. Did you see Bridget after your mother told her to wash the windows? Yes, sir. What was she doing? She had got a long pole and was sticking it in a brush, and she had a pail of water. About what time did you go out into the barn? About as near as I can recollect, ten o'clock. What did you go into the barn for? To find some sinkers. How many pears did you eat in that twenty minutes? Three. Is that all you did? No, I went over to the window and opened it. Why did you do that? Because it was too hot. I suppose that is the hottest place on the premises. Yes, sir. Could you, while standing looking out of that window, see anybody enter the kitchen? No, sir. I thought you said you could see people from the barn. Not after you pass a jog in the barn. It obstructs the view of the back door. What kind of lead were you looking for, for sinkers? Hard lead? No, sir, soft lead. Did you expect to find the sinkers already made? Well, no. I thought I might find one with a hole through it. Was the lead referred to tea lead or lead that comes in tea chests? I don't know. When were you going fishing? Monday. The next Monday after the fatal day? Yes, sir. Had you lines already? No, sir. Did you have a line? Yes, sir. Where was your line? Down to the farm. Do you know whether there were any sinkers on the line you left at the farm? I think there was none on the line. Did you have any hooks? No, sir. Then you were making all this preparation without either hook or line. Why did you go into the barn after sinkers? Because I was going down town to buy some hooks and line, and thought it would save me from buying them. Now, to the barn again. Did you not think I could go into the barn and do the same as you in a few minutes? I do not do things in a hurry. Did you then think there were no sinkers at the barn? I thought there were no sinkers anywhere there. I had no idea of using my lines. I thought you understood that I wasn't going to use these lines at the farm because they hadn't sinkers. I went upstairs to the kind of bench there. I had heard my father say there was lead there, looked for lead in a box up there. There were nails and perhaps an old doorknob. Did not find any lead as thin as tea lead in the box. Did not look anywhere except on the bench. I ate some pears up there. I have now told you everything that took place up in the barn. It was the hottest place on the premises. I suppose I ate my pears when I first went up there. I stood looking out of the window. I was feeling well enough to eat pears, but don't know how to answer the question if I was feeling better than I was in the morning, because I was feeling better that morning. I picked the pears up from the ground. I was not in the rear of the barn. I was in the front of it. Don't see how anybody could leave the house then without my seeing them. I pulled over boards to look for the lead. That took me some time. I returned from the barn and put my hat in the dining room. I found my father and called to Maggie. I found the fire gone out. I went to the barn because the irons were not hot enough and the fire had gone out. I made no efforts to find my mother at all. Sent Maggie for Dr. Bowen. Didn't see or find anything after the murders to tell me my mother had been sewing in the spare room that morning. What did your mother say when you saw her? She told me she had had a note and was going out. She said she would get the dinner. The district attorney continued to read. My mother did not tell me when she was coming back. I did not know Mr. Morse was coming to dinner. I did not know whether I was at tea Wednesday night or not. I had no apron on Thursday. That is, I don't think I had. I don't remember, surely. I had no occasion to use the axe or hatchet. I knew there was an old axe downstairs, and last time I saw it, it was on the old chopping block. I don't know whether my father owned a hatchet or not. Assuming a hatchet was found in the cellar, I don't know how it got there, and if there was blood on it, I have no idea as to how it got there. My father killed some pigeons last May. When I found my father, I did not think of Mrs. Borden, for I believed she was out. 
I remember asking Mrs. Churchill to look for my mother. I left the screen door closed when I left, and it was open when I came from the barn. I can give no idea of the time my father came home. I went right to the barn. I don't know whether he came to the sitting-room at once or not. I don't remember his being in the sitting-room or sitting down. I think I was in there when I asked him if there was any mail. I do not think he went upstairs. He had a letter in his hand. I did not help him to lie down and did not touch the sofa. He was taking medicine for some time. Mrs. Borden's father's house was for sale on 4th Street. My father bought Mrs. Borden's half-sister's share and gave it to her. We thought what he did for her people he ought to do for his own, and he then gave us grandfather's house. I always thought my stepmother induced him to purchase the interest. I don't know when the windows were last washed before that day. All day Tuesday I was at the table. I gave the officer the same skirt I wore that day, and if there was any blood on it, I can give an explanation as to how it got there. If the blood came from the outside, I cannot say how it got there. I wore tie shoes that day and black stockings. I was under the pear trees four or five minutes. I came down the front stairs when I came down in the morning. The dress I wore that forenoon was a white and blue stripe of some sort. It is at home in the attic. I did not go to Smith's drug store to buy prussic acid. Did not go to the rooms where mother or father lay after the murder. Went through when I went upstairs that day. I wore the shoes I gave to the officer all day Thursday and Friday. I now ask you if you can furnish any other suspicion concerning any person who might have committed the crime. Yes, one night, as I was coming home not long ago, I saw the shadow of a man on the house at the east end. I thought it was a man because I could not see any skirts. I hurried in the front door. It was about 8.45 o'clock, not later than 9. I saw somebody run around the house last winter. The last time I saw anybody lately was since my sister went to Marion. I told Mr. Jennings, may have told Mr. Hanscom. Who suggested the reward offered, you or your sister? I don't know. I may have. Mr. Knowlton now stopped reading and announced, This is the case of the Commonwealth. Colonel Adams for the defence called Dr. Bowen, who testified to the facts as related in the interview published before. City Marshal Rufus B. Hilliard was also called by the defence and gave his testimony, which was not different from that of the other officers. The evidence was then concluded and the court adjourned for the day. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of The Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18. Sixth Day of the Trial. The proceedings opened by Judge Blaisdell announcing that he was ready to hear the arguments of counsel. Mr. Jennings arose and said, May it please your honour, this complaint upon which you have to pass today, in substance, alleges that on the 4th of August last, Andrew J. Borden was murdered by his daughter Lizzie. I must say I close this case with feelings entirely different from those I have ever experienced at the conclusion of any case. This man was not merely my client, he was my friend. I had known him from boyhood days, and if three short weeks ago anyone had told me that I should stand here defending his youngest daughter from the charge of murdering him, I should have pronounced it beyond the realm of human credibility. But such is the fact and upon the decision of your honour will rest the liberty and good name of this young woman. There are some things of which there is no doubt. There is no doubt that Andrew J. Borden was murdered in his house at the time given by Bridget Sullivan, Mr. Shortsleeves, and Jonathan Clegg. All these give the time from the City Hall clock. Mr. Clegg sees Mr. Borden leave his store at 10.30 o'clock, a time he fixes by looking at the clock. As Mr. Borden entered his other store, one of the men working there saw it was twenty minutes before eleven. It seems to me it is fixed almost beyond a peradventure that the last time Andrew J. Borden entered the house was between quarter and ten minutes before eleven. Mrs. Kelly is wrong, unless the others are wrong. 
Mr. Borden did not enter his home at twenty minutes before eleven, unless Mr. Shortsleeves is wrong and Bridget Sullivan is wrong. The time between his entering the house and giving of the alarm is from twenty-five minutes to half an hour. Now what took place after he got there? Bridget Sullivan says she left him in the sitting-room reading the paper, and within this narrow limit of half an hour, Andrew Borden has to talk with Lizzie, talk with Bridget, go upstairs, go downstairs, compose himself in the chair and place himself upon the sofa. If the theory of the government is correct, it certainly took five minutes or perhaps ten minutes from the time Miss Lizzie gave the alarm to the time information was received at the central station. Now I claim that you must deduct ten minutes from the time at which he left the centre of the city to the time he was found dead. If you do that, you limit the time of the committing of this crime to fifteen, to thirteen, or perhaps to not more than ten minutes. We have had a description of the injuries, and I suggest that even the learned district attorney himself cannot imagine that any person could have committed that crime unless his heart was as black with hatred as hell itself. At this point, for the first time in public since the commission of the crime, Lizzie Borden almost broke down. Her form was convulsed, her lips were trembling, and she shaded her eyes with her hands in order to partially conceal the tears, which were freely flowing. Mr. Jennings continued as follows. Blow after blow was showered upon them, cutting through blood, bone, and flesh into the very brain. Not one, not two, but in the case of the woman, eighteen. I know it will be said that the person who did this wanted to make sure. There is an unnecessary brutality about this that suggests nothing but insanity or brutal hatred. There is another thing. Every blow showed that the person who wielded that hatchet was a person of experience with the instrument. Every blow shows its own line of demarcation, and taking with this the fact that all the blows were parallel, I venture to say that no hand could strike those blows that had not a powerful wrist and experience in handling a hatchet. But now, Your Honour, it is a maxim of law that better one hundred guilty persons should escape than one innocent man perish. But more of these wounds. Professor Wood told you it was almost impossible for a person to commit these crimes without being almost covered with blood, from the waist upward in the case of Mr. Borden, and from the feet upward in the case of Mrs. Borden. Now, what takes place? It becomes the duty of the Commonwealth to investigate an atrocious crime like this, with the greatest care. It is of the utmost importance that the guilty party should be found, and not someone accused of it. The Commonwealth seems to have made up its mind that the crime was committed by someone in that house. All their labours have been directed with that view. It is perfectly evident to lawyers that this was one of the views the Commonwealth was taking in presenting its case. They say no one could get out on the south because Mrs. Kelly is there. Crow's Yard is there. Men are working there, and there is the Shanyon House. You have Mrs. Churchill on the north and others on the west. The first thing they've got to do in order to draw the line around the people in the house is to isolate that house. Now, what is the fact? They know that the house has been burglarized and the barn broken into within a few months. Whether they know it or not, a person would say they ought to think that there was someone who knew that there was money in Mr. Borden's room. You know that Mrs. Manley saw a man standing at that gate. The police have had I don't know how many men in this case, but they never found this woman. They never found the man Dr. Handy saw. They can find the axes Lizzie Borden killed her father with, but they cannot find this man. I don't say they haven't tried to, but the fact is they haven't. Certain men got over that back fence that day, and Mrs. Churchill didn't see them, nor did Miss Collette. Miss Collette didn't see Frank Whitson get over that fence and walk on it before twelve o'clock that day. John Crow's man didn't see him either. The district attorney will tell you that Mrs. Shanyon and her daughter heard pounding. They described it as of someone getting over a fence. If your honour will think a minute, you will see that it was not pounding which was in their mind, but the thought of a man getting over a fence. We claim, Your Honour, that this shows an idea that nobody else could have got into that house and escaped. 
Mr. John Morse appears to have satisfactorily accounted for his time, and that brings us to two parties, Bridget Sullivan and Lizzie Borden. In the natural course of things, who would be the party to be suspected? Whose clothing would be examined, and who would have to account for every movement of her time? Would it be the stranger, or would it be the one bound to the murdered man by ties of love? And right here, what does it mean when we say the youngest daughter, the last one whose baby fingers have been lovingly entwined about her father's head? Is there nothing in the ties of love and affection? The words of Mr. Jennings about the youngest daughter caused the prisoner strong feelings. She bit her lips, and then the tears began to shine in her eyes. She raised her hand to her eyes and then placed her handkerchief there. She did not cry, however, and as soon as Mr. Jennings left this line of talk, she wiped her eyes and was as before, except that her eyes were now red as any woman's who lets tears get the best of her. And I do not wish to be misunderstood. I do not believe that Bridget Sullivan committed that murder any more than I believe Lizzie Borden did. Why don't the district attorney make Bridget Sullivan explain what she was doing during the twenty minutes which elapsed while she is supposed to be washing the upper sitting-room windows? Does it take her twenty minutes to wash the upper part of one window? Why isn't she questioned regarding every second as Lizzie Borden was? Yet, according to her story, it was three quarters of an hour. She didn't wash in all but three windows and a half. Yet the prosecution thinks nothing of this. If Miss Lizzie cannot escape being tripped up by one officer and another, she must be guilty. Now to commit a crime, there must be opportunity. I submit that unless she alone had an opportunity to commit the crime, there is no ground for holding her. Bridget Sullivan was out washing windows. Nobody saw her but Mrs. Churchill. Bridget was three quarters of an hour washing windows. Mind you, I don't say Bridget Sullivan did it. I distinctly state she did not but I call attention to these points which the State haven't considered yet. Now, in regard to the length of time which those two people have been dead, Professor Wood testified under cross-examination that, providing the digestion had been normal, Mrs. Borden was killed an hour and a half or two hours before Mr. Borden. If she was killed at 9.30 or 10 o'clock, Mr. Borden was there in the house. He goes to the Union Savings Bank a few minutes before 9.30. Surely Lizzie never killed her mother while her father was in the house. Surely she did not get her father out of the house to kill the mother. Now in regard to this, it is perfectly clear to me why the answers to the questions of her whereabouts at the time of the killing of her mother and later that morning should be inconsistent. I have stated before that I considered the inquisition of the girl an outrage. Here was a girl they had been suspecting for days. She was virtually under arrest, and yet for the purpose of extracting a confession from her to support their theory, they brought her here and put her upon the rack, a thing they knew they would have no right to do if they placed her under arrest. As in the days of the rack and thumbscrews, so she was racked mentally again and again. Day after day the same questions were repeated to her, in the hope to elicit some information that would incriminate her. Is it a wonder there are conflicting statements? Here is an intelligent lady, Mrs. Churchill, who went into the house with Bridget Sullivan and can't tell what became of the servant. Bridget Sullivan could not melt into thin air, but this intelligent lady can't tell whether she went upstairs or down. Here is Lizzie Borden, who has been under surveillance for days, who has been compelled to take preparations to induce sleep. She is brought here, and because she couldn't remember the minutest details, that is a sign of guilt. Now she tells that she got up that morning, goes downstairs at nine o'clock, not feeling very well. Bridget Sullivan saw her, but can't say if she was reading an old magazine. She goes upstairs and then comes down again. She irons some handkerchiefs. I don't know, but the state is going to say those handkerchiefs were being cleaned of blood. It wouldn't be more presumptuous than several other ideas they have tried. How about that fire? I am surprised the state hasn't taken up that. Perhaps he has not found out that it is hard to start a fire. Now about her whereabouts at the time her father came in. She first says she is upstairs. Then she says she is downstairs and sticks to that. I submit that if she was on the stairs when Bridget opened the door to let Mr. Borden in and laughed, as Bridget says she did, she must have been insane. 
and was insane at the time of the commission of the crime. No human being could do a deed like that and then stand and laugh at a remark like that made by Bridget Sullivan. It is beyond the bounds of human belief. Then she says she went out in the yard and stayed there and then went into the barn. I don't believe she can tell how long she was in the barn. Look at the testimony in this case and see if you ascribe guilt to Lizzie Borden because she couldn't tell whether she was in the barn twenty minutes or half an hour. She goes into the barn and looks for this lead. Is there anything improbable or unreasonable in this? If one theory is correct, she couldn't have been there twenty minutes or half an hour. It is simply a guess. Then she comes in and finds her father. It is said that she is guilty because she didn't call for her mother. She knew Bridget was in the house, and she hollered and called her down. Is she the calm, collected being who hasn't been moved by this? Mrs. Churchill looks over and sees a sign of distress. She says, what's the matter? And Lizzie says, come over quick, my father is killed. Then her emotion is such that she requires the attention of two friends. The testimony of everybody else in the case is that this girl had received a terrible shock. She asks her friends to search for her mother. She tells them her mother has said she was going out to see a sick friend and that she thought she heard her come in. Was it unnatural that, being unable to find Mrs. Borden, she should think she had been killed? Now Lizzie's story conflicts with Bridget's. Lizzie says she thinks her mother went out. Bridget says no. Bridget don't see Mr. Borden go out. Why should she see Mr. Borden? Now the government is bound to show that there is a motive for this crime, in the absence of it, unless there is direct evidence, their case has got to fall. What was the motive? The papers all over the country have published it as it was given out to them. Has there been a motive shown here? No, only that five years ago something happened. It was a result of Mr. Borden's giving his wife's stepsister a residence, and the girls said they thought their father ought to have done as much as that for them. After that, Lizzie called her Mrs. Borden. But now what kind of a motive would it have required to commit this crime? A man sometimes when pressed for money will commit crime, and in the case of Mrs. Robinson we know there was murder to get insurance money. I beg you to remember if crimes of this sort are committed, unless there is a pressing want of money, and yet to get the motive, they've got to say that without hatred, bitterness or previous quarrel, she murders him to get permission of the money which, in the natural course of events would be hers within a few years. I say that this is beyond the bounds of human credibility. They say the attempted purchase of prussic acid by Lizzie Borden shows she was going to do some deadly deed. If there is one thing which is weakest in criminal cases, it is the matter of mistaken identity. The books are full of such references. These three persons say it was Lizzie Borden who went into that store and attempted to buy prussic acid. Neither of them knows her, but all three assert it is she. One of them, Bents, is taken to her house, and he says he recognised her by her voice. He says he recognised it because it was tremulous. Kilroy says her voice was clear and distinct, yet Bents, with the life and liberty of this girl hanging upon his words, says he identified her by her voice. If it pleases your honour, Lizzie Borden did not attempt to purchase prussic acid and she has asked to have her testimony taken upon this point. She declares that she never left her home Wednesday morning, and by a special providence, which seems to have watched over us in parts of this case, her words are corroborated by the dead woman, who told John Morse that Lizzie had been sick in her room all day, and had not left the house. And later, when Mrs. Bowen comes to the house and asks for Lizzie, Mr. Borden says she was in the house all day, and only went out at night, when she called on Miss Russell. I ask you, Your Honour, taking this testimony of Professor Wood, that no prussic acid was found in the stomachs of the murdered people, who told the truth. I don't mean to say that these young men meant to tell anything untrue, but in the light of these facts, was it Lizzie Borden who entered that drug store and attempted to purchase prussic acid, or was it some person who looked like her? Now, if they had proved a motive, if the motive they have given satisfies you, let us look at other evidence in the case. This girl has got at the most ten to fifteen minutes to commit the crime and conceal the weapon. Why didn't she wait before she called Bridget Sullivan downstairs? What is her condition just afterwards? 
Is there anything on her, when the neighbours come, to show that she committed the crime? If she did have time to kill her mother and clear the bloodstains from her garments, she did not have time to clear up the evidence of her work downstairs. If she had on an apron, where is that apron? Where is the apron? Officer Doherty attempted to describe the dress he saw her have on. Mrs. Churchill thinks it was of another colour. The lighter the dress, the better to find out if she did it, and if she did it with the white skirt on, where are the blood spots? Where did she get rid of the weapons? The dress, the shoes she had on that morning. Are there any shoe buttons found in the fire? Is there any smell of burnt clothing? No. Why, at the time of the arrest of this girl, we were enveloped in an atmosphere of poison, gore, hatchets, and bloody hairs. Why, until Professor Wood stepped on the stand, it had been given out, whether by the police I do not know, that the hatchet Professor Wood had was the weapon with which the crime was committed, and that it bore signs of having been used to commit it. I confess that until Professor Wood went upon the stand, my heart almost stood still with anxiety. The government is in this position. The more closely they hold Lizzie Borden in the house, the more they show she couldn't get out. They shut that bloody hatchet up there with her. Day after day, hour after hour, they have searched and examined, and the only thing they produced was the hatchet, which Professor Wood says contained no blood. I don't believe Dr. Dolan would willingly harm a hair of this defendant's head and yet his description of this hatchet was one of the most terrible things of this trial. It would be such a hatchet as would commit this deed, he said, and it appeared to have upon it what seemed to him was a blood spot. The end, he said, was such as to cause the crushing wound in the head. But then comes Professor Draper, who says there was no such crushing wound. You can imagine, Your Honour, the feelings of the counsel, who sat here almost heartsick day after day, waiting for that report and guarding the interests of a client whom they believe to be innocent, and who insists she is innocent. I have no doubt that every person with a feeling of sympathy for that girl felt their hearts leap with joy as Professor Wood gave his testimony. If I could have had my way, I would have shouted for joy. That was the deliverance of Lizzie Borden. If that hatchet had been lost on the way by a railroad accident— Lizzie Borden would have been a condemned woman upon the testimony of Dr. Dolan, regarding the description of that hatchet. Lizzie Borden's life was in Dr. Dolan's hands, and by the goodness of God's providence, Professor Wood came, and, like that shot at Concord which rang round the world, his story went like a song of joy from Maine to Mexico, and from the Atlantic to the Pacific. They haven't proved that this girl had anything to do with the murder. They can't find any blood on her dress, on her hair, on her shoes. They can't find any motive. They can't find the axes, and couldn't clean the axe. And so I say, I demand the woman's release. The grand jury, if they meet more evidence, can indict her. She is here. She can't flee. She isn't going to flee. The great public is going to take your decision, as they took the arrest upon the strength of Mr. Knowlton's experience. They can't find a motive, no blood, no poison, and so I say that this woman shan't be sent to prison on such evidence as this, shan't be sent to jail for three months, shan't be deprived of her liberty and her good name. Don't, Your Honour, when they don't show an incriminating circumstance, don't put the stigma of guilt upon this woman, reared as she has been, and with a past character beyond reproach. Don't let it go out in the world as the decision of a just judge that she is probably guilty. God grant your honour wisdom to decide, and, while you do your duty, do it as God tells you to do it, giving to the accused the benefit of the doubt. As Mr. Jennings concluded, there were tears in the eyes of a majority of those present. Colonel Adams, the associate counsel, was deeply affected, and Mr. Phillips, Mr. Jennings's assistant, was weeping. The prisoner's lips were trembling, and the tears in her eyes were hidden from view by her hands, which were placed there. As Mayor Coughlin, Dr. Dolan, and other prominent persons stepped forward to grasp the hand of the attorney, a ripple of applause started, which rapidly swelled into a loud expression of admiration and sympathy, and with the echo of this applause, which there was no attempt to suppress, the court was adjourned till the afternoon. End of chapter 18
Chapter 19 of The Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 District Attorney Knowlton's Argument Knowledge of the splendid presentation of the case of the defence by Mr. Jennings reached the streets almost in advance of its conclusion, and the effect was apparent at the opening of the afternoon session. The courtroom was crowded to excess, and there were larger throngs at the entrances on the square than had been noticed since the opening of the hearing. Everybody expected an interesting answer from the district attorney, and the gathering assembled to listen to it included the leading professional men of the city. Attorney General Pillsbury arrived at noon and was seated beside the district attorney as the latter began to speak. Lizzie Borden was pale as she entered, but she flushed a vivid crimson as the district attorney arose to speak. He said, I can fully appreciate your honour's feelings now that the end of this hearing is about to be reached. The crime of murder touches the deepest sensibilities of feeling. There is the deepest feeling of horror about it, and above all, in the unnaturalness that brings the thrill of horror to every mind. The man who is accustomed even to conflicts of arms may not be expected to be free from horror at the thought of the assassin. While it was not a pleasant summons that came to me, the almost despairing cry that came to me to come over here, I should not have been true to duty if I had not undertaken to ferret out the criminal. It was so causeless a crime. The people interested in it were so free from ordinary bickerings or strife that of all cases that transcend the ideas of men, this case was that case. The murdered man's daughter was arrested. I perfectly understood the surprise and indignation that started up. I am sorry that your honour was criticised. Does not your honour believe my own soul is filled with anguish that I must go on and believe the prisoner guilty? And yet the path of duty is not always the path of pleasure. The straight and narrow path is often full of anguish, and does not have the popular voice behind it. What is it we have done? There are three stages, yes, four, which are junctions of the law in a case like this. First, the stage of simple inquiry. I am sworn on that book before your honour, that an inquest shall be held, which is necessarily private. That step has been taken. There then comes another stage, when by the laws of inquiry it finally sees the evidence points to any particular person, and such an occasion as this follows. That is the present state. To that tribunal it is your honour's duty to direct such cases as seem too grave for your honour to decide. Then the evidence appears to indicate that the balance of probabilities is in favour of finding the accused guilty of the act. The Commonwealth advances no statements as to probable guilt. Your honour's duty is before you. Let us go back to the pictures. They are before you. Such was the scene presented four weeks ago this morning. What are they? One is a man retired from business, of simple and frugal habits, and so far as we know, without an enemy in the world. If there was some friction between him and his wife's relatives, that domestic and honourable lady was absolutely without harsh feelings on the part of the world. Yet she was murdered, and there was a hand that dealt those blows, and a brain that directed them. There was not a man, woman, or child in the world of whom we could not have said they would have done it. But it was done. The presumption that some enemy killed him, and then killed her, for I presume that your honour will prefer the evidence of the chemist, Professor Wood, rather than the story of a medical examiner who has not examined the stomachs, is that Mrs. Borden was dead fully an hour and a half before the murder of Mr. Borden. Who could have done it? As an eminent attorney once said, there is no motive for murder. There is reason for it, but no motive. I never in all my experience saw a man so utterly low as to believe him guilty of such a deed. But it was done. By what? Obviously by a hatchet. The blows were struck from behind. It was the act of a physical, if not a moral, coward. It was the act of a person who, while willing to murder, was not willing to let the murdered people see who was doing it. As you listened to the description of the blows, you are convinced of the fact that no man could have struck them. You are struck with the thought that it was an irresolute, imperfect feminine hand that could strike, and yet not with the strength of a man, and we do not know who did it. It was not the result of spite, as first thought, but the blows were fast, swift blows of somebody who had a reason for doing it. 
The first obvious inquiry is, who is benefited by that removal? God forbid I should impute that motive, but what have we before us? I don't know what was the cause of it. I have discovered the fact that she has repudiated the relation of mother and daughter. I knew once two boys who, in growing to be men, discovered that their father had committed a crime and called him Mr., but I never heard of another case of that sort. We've got the terrible fact. She has repudiated the name of mother. Has your honour, as I have, ever learned that no more lasting hatred ever springs up than between step-parents and their children? We have seen that he didn't provide the house with gas, that he hadn't in the house what those daughters very much wanted, a bath-tub, and that they quarrelled about property. Do you suppose that was a sufficient motive? I grant that that is not an adequate motive for killing her. There is no adequate motive for killing her. But I have found the only person in the world with whom she was not in accord. Let us look around, and it cannot be imagined how anybody could have gone in or out. I listened to the eloquent remarks of my brother and failed to hear him tell how anybody could have gotten in there, remained an hour and a half, killed the two people, and then have gone out without being observed. Doors locked and windows closed. Here was a house with the front door locked, the windows closed, the cellar door locked, and the screen door closed, with somebody on guard in the kitchen. Nay, Mr. Borden locked the barn every night, and you can't go from one part of the house to the other without keys. That makes us begin to think. Of course, this is negative evidence. Of course, it is neither sufficient, reliable, or conclusive. But all evidence is made up of circumstances of more or less weight. Yet from this house, on a main street, near the centre of the city, passed by hundreds of people daily, no man could depart without being seen. And that isn't the most difficult part of it. I can't devise any way by which anybody could have avoided those locks. Tell me not about the barn which Mr. Borden always locked himself. The front door was locked when Mr. Borden came in. There was not a hiding place when they came in. They could not get upstairs to the front of the house by the back way. They must be seen passing through the house, and I haven't dwelt on the chances of anybody escaping the notice of these five people and the refusal of the human mind to accept such a possibility. I can conceive of a villain. I can't conceive of the villain who did this. And I can't also conceive of a villain who is a fool. All the movements of this family must have been known, and so the mind, not the mind which is actuated by sympathy and which I understand but cannot follow, because I am sworn to my duty, but the impartial mind looks toward the house. There has been no idle and unjust suspicion. It was natural that suspicion should be directed towards the inmates of that house. Morse is out of the way, and then comes the servant girl, perhaps the next one thought of. The discharge of my duties have found in my eyes no difference between one class and another. When I came to Fall River I knew no difference between honest and reputable Lizzie Borden and honest and reputable Bridget Sullivan, and so Bridget Sullivan was brought here to what my learned friend calls a star chamber inquiry, and was questioned as closely and minutely as any other member of the family. The innocent do not need fear questioning. In all my twenty-five years' experience will my learned brother say that he ever heard or knew me to treat a female witness discourteously. She sitting in one chair, and the inquirer in another, presumably as innocent as anybody. And yet fault is found that she is suspected when she answers questions in two ways. I'm going to assume that your honour believes Bridget Sullivan has told the exact truth. What took place, Bridget Sullivan? Mr. Morse went off that morning and left Lizzie in the kitchen alone, the only time when Mrs. Borden could have been killed. Mrs. Borden told her to wash windows, and she goes out to do it. Lizzie didn't go up the back way, because she couldn't get up that way. In the lower part of the house there was no person left, and Lizzie and her mother were upstairs. Then Lizzie comes to the screen door. Maggie says, don't lock the screen door. Mr. Borden was then alive. Mrs. Churchill saw Mr. Borden go off and then saw Bridget washing windows. Then the hatchet was driven into the brain of Abby Borden. Many a man has been convicted because he alone could have committed a crime. Maggie finishes her work and then, until Mr. Borden comes in, Lizzie and Mrs. Borden are alone upstairs. And this is not all. 
Mr. Borden comes to the front door. I don't care to comment on Lizzie's laughter at Bridget's exclamation, but Lizzie was where, if Mrs. Borden fell to the floor, she could not have been twenty feet away from her, and where, if the old lady made any noise, she could have heard it. Then Lizzie comes downstairs and commences to iron. Bridget leaves her alone with her father. Less than fifteen minutes later the death of Mr. Borden takes place. She could have but one alibi. She could not be downstairs. She could not be anywhere except where she could not be seen by any person come from the house. It is now more difficult in the cool of September than it was at the inquest to imagine the improbability of the story told by Miss Lizzie. Where he was, she can't tell. Where he came from, she didn't know. Where was she between the hours of nine and ten, when her mother was killed? Whatever else I may not say of Lizzie Borden, I will say that for one to even suggest that from the time she found her father dead, she was not in full control of all her faculties, is to confess that they do not know the facts. She has not shed a tear, and it is idle for anyone to say she has been confused or dazed. I asked her where she was when her father came back and we get this story. I was down in the kitchen. That's the kind of thumbscrew I apply. And it was a most vital thing, almost a moment after. Where were you when the bell rung? I think I was upstairs in my room. Were you upstairs when you heard the bell? No thinking now. No days. I think I was on the steps coming down. Isn't it singular? Isn't it a vital thing that upon this most important subject she should not tell the same story upon two pages of the testimony? I prefer to take the story of one who gives the same answer twice, for I am not affected by the heat and the turmoil which surrounds this case, and for which I have no hard feelings towards anybody. Then I ask her, what were you doing while your father was out? And she said she was waiting for the irons to heat. Unsatisfactory explanations. Isn't it singular that I can't get a satisfactory explanation from her as to how she spent the hour and fifteen minutes while her father was out and her mother was being killed upstairs? Finally, however, she says after urging twice, she saw him take off his slippers when the photographs show he did not take off his boots. And after speaking to her father, she tells him that she thinks her mother has gone out and then she tells us that she went to the barn and when we ask her, where was your mother, she answers, she is not my mother, but my stepmother, and her bosom friend, Miss Russell, is compelled to testify that Lizzie told her she went out to get a piece of something to fix her window. Then she tells Dr. Bowen it was to get a piece of iron. When she tells the story of the fish line and the sinker, I say to her, where did you spend twenty minutes or half an hour on that hot morning? She says she went to fix a curtain at the west end of the barn and ate pears there. Let me say I never saw an alibi labour as this one does. You can see by reading that testimony how she was away from home during the questioning. She was going to that barn on the hottest of days to get something unnecessary. I don't say this is enough to convict her, but with Maggie's story that she had been where she could have committed the crime, there is something to challenge our credulity. Relation of mother and daughter. There was so little in common between the daughter and the mother that it was to Bridget the mother gave notice of her intended movement and not to the daughter. We have it from Lizzie that her mother received a note from sick friends. Who sent it? Where did it come from? It did not come in the screen door because Bridget was in the kitchen. Mr. Borden knew nothing about it. Lizzie says she told him. Some laughter was heard when a witness said a reporter was found sitting on the steps when the first officer arrived. I am not one who joined in that laughter, for the reporter in this case represents the anxious and agonised public, who wish to know any fact in this matter and every point of evidence true or false. If there was any person in the world who wrote that note, would he not in the interest of humanity come forward? There never was a note sent. It was a part of the whole cunning scheme, and if there had been, and the writer of it had been in the remotest corner of the world, he would certainly have come forward. It's an easy thing to say, but it is one of those things that, when a matter becomes public property, cannot be concealed. Nobody, Your Honour, has said this family was poisoned with prussic acid. All that the Commonwealth says is that this was the first proposition. I intended to say at the outset that the crime was done as a matter of deliberate preparation. 
Those young men recognised her not by her voice, but recognised her and her voice. Is there any different point of view in Lizzie Borden from any other person who is accused of crime? We find here the suggestion of a motive which speaks volumes. The druggist told her plainly she couldn't have it. Then how could this thing be done? Not by a pistol, not by the knife, not by the arsenical poisoning. There was but one way of removing that woman, and that was to attack her from behind. That is a dreadful thing. It makes one's heart bleed to think of it. But it is done. I'd rather everybody is dazed there. I'd rather resign my office than deal with it. But I will not flee from duty. I haven't alluded to, and I think I will not comment upon the demeanour of the defendant. It is certainly singular. While everybody is dazed, there is but one person who, throughout the whole business, has not been seen to express emotion. This somewhat removes from our minds the horror of the thing, which we naturally come to. Atrocious and wicked crime is laid to the door of some women. The great poet makes nurgeresses, and I am somewhat relieved that these facts do not point to a woman who expressed any feminine feeling. When Fleet came there, she was annoyed that anyone should want to search her room for the murder of her father and stepmother. I know there are things that have not been explained. It has been a source of immense disappointment that we have not been able to find the apron with which she must have covered her dress, and which must contain blood, just as surely as did the shoes. It is a source of regret that we have not been able to find the packet, but she had fifteen minutes in which to conceal it. This was not a crime of a moment. It was conceived in the head of a cunning, cool woman, and well has she concealed these things. If your honour yielded to the applause which spontaneously greeted the close of the remarks of my earnest, passionate brother, if your honour could but yield to the loyalty of his feelings, we would all be proud of it, and would be pleased to hear him say, We will let this woman go. But that would be but temporary satisfaction. We are constrained to find that she has been dealing in poisonous things, that her story is absurd, and that hers and hers alone has been the opportunity for the commission of the crime. Yielding to clamour is not to be compared to that only, and greatest satisfaction, that of a duty well done. There was a deathly silence in the crowded courtroom as the district attorney concluded, and every eye was upon Judge Blaisdell. The features of the kindly old magistrate were saddened, and he was visibly affected, as he commenced his remarks. He said, The long examination is now concluded, and there remains but for the magistrate to perform what he believes to be his duty. It would be a pleasure for him, and he would doubtless receive much sympathy, if he could say, Lizzie, I judge you probably not guilty. You may go home. But upon the character of the evidence presented through the witnesses, who have been so closely and thoroughly examined, there is but one thing to be done. Suppose for a single moment a man was standing there, he was found close by that guest-chamber which, to Mrs. Borden, was a chamber of death. Suppose a man had been found in the vicinity of Mr. Borden, was the first to find the body, and the only account he could give of himself was the unreasonable one, that he was out in the barn looking for sinkers. Then he was out in the yard. Then he was out for something else. Would there be any question in the minds of men what should be done with such a man? There was a brief, painful pause, and the eyes of the judge were wet with tears. Then he resumed. So there is only one thing to do, painful as it may be. The judgment of the court is that you are probably guilty, and you are ordered, committed to await the action of the superior court. The glance of every person in the room was on Lizzie, as the finding of the court was announced. She sat like a statue of stone, totally unmoved, and without the slightest evidence of emotion or interest in the proceedings. Her aged pastor beside her placed his hand over his ears. He knew what was coming, and could not hear the words. The white faces of all in the courtroom rendered the séance particularly impressive. Then the prisoner stood up, still with that same impassive countenance and faraway look. She listened quietly while the clerk read the sentence of the court, ordering her confinement in Taunton jail until the session of the grand jury on the first Monday in November. At the conclusion of the word, she seated herself quietly, and after a few minutes left the courtroom escorted by the sorrowing old clergyman. After this, there were a few formalities. The recognances of Bridget Sullivan and John V. Morse were renewed. 
Marshal Hilliard and Officer Seaver becoming bondsmen for the domestic, and ex-Congressman Davis for Mr. Morse. Colonel Adams announced that the attorneys had agreed that the piece of blood-stained plaster should remain in the possession of the clerk, and with that the case came temporarily to an end. End of chapter 19Chapter 20 of the Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 Lizzie A. Borden Indicted. Contrary to the expectations of a great many people, Judge Blaisdell held that Lizzie Borden was probably guilty of the murder of her father. She was not tried nor accused of the murder of her stepmother. All that the state desired was to hold her to await the action of the grand jury of Bristol County. The prisoner was transferred to the county jail at Taunton, and delivered into the keeping of Sheriff Wright and his wife. The latter, the matron of the institution, formerly lived in Fall River, where she knew the Bordens very well. The accused was therefore in the hands of the kindliest of persons, who undoubtedly made her stay as pleasant as it was possible, under the circumstances. She was allowed certain privileges, and for the most part occupied her cell as an ordinary prisoner. Her sister Emma, Reverend Mr. Buck, Reverend Mr. Jubb, and her lawyers made frequent visits to the jail. Her life in the county Bastille was that of the other inmates, and nothing happened until November to attract to her more than passing interest. The newspapers made frequent reference to the case, but as she never read the daily papers, she was not disturbed by them. One New York newspaper printed a magnificent fake interview which its representative was supposed to have had with the accused, and ever and anon there would appear something to awaken interest in the case. The grand jury, composed of twenty-four men, assembled on November the 7th to consider the criminal cases in Bristol County. The Borden case was reserved for the last. The greater part of the week ending November 21st was devoted to this case. The state submitted most of its evidence, and the district attorney established a precedent by notifying Attorney Jennings that he would be allowed to present to the jury the evidence for the defence. This meant that Mr. Knowlton was so manifestly fair in conducting the case in the grand jury room that he was willing and anxious that the jury hear not only the evidence against Miss Borden, but the testimony in her behalf. If, after hearing both sides, the jury found her not guilty, he would be well satisfied, and if on the other hand she was found to be guilty, he would be equally satisfied. On the 21st the news of the adjournment of the jury without action in the case was heralded throughout the land. No one seemed to know what it meant, but almost everybody had a theory. Very few of these theories were alike, and perhaps none of them were correct. The grand jury simply adjourned until December the 1st, and that was all the public knew. On the day set, it convened again, and the state presented more evidence. Miss Alice Russell, an important witness, reappeared voluntarily, and relieved her mind of a few facts which it is said had been forgotten or overlooked at the time of her first appearance. The next day, the 2nd of December, the grand jury returned three indictments against Lizzie Borden. One charged her with the murder of her father, Andrew J. Borden. Another charged her with the murder of her stepmother, Abby D. Borden, and the third charged her jointly with the murder of both. At the time the vote was taken on the question of her indictment by the jury, there were twenty-one members present. Of these, twenty voted yes and one voted no. So it happened that twenty men had said upon their oaths, after having heard the evidence impartially given, that Lizzie Borden was guilty. There were thousands of people who had maintained all along that the Fall River Police, the medical examiner, the judge of the district court, and the district attorney had laboured in vain, and that the grand jury would fail to find a true bill. But alas for those good people who had traduced the city marshal's character, yes, assailed his honesty of purpose, and doubted his capabilities, and in some instances gone even further, his acts as well as those of his associates had been endorsed. It was an hour of triumph for them, even if it was one of sadness for the prisoner's friends. The criticism of the city marshal assumed various and in many instances unique forms. One instance will suffice to show 
to what extremities a few foolhardy editors carried their prejudices. An afternoon newspaper published in Worcester, Massachusetts, inflicted upon its readers a screed worthy the ablest efforts of a Chicago anarchist. It printed an editorial, at the time of the cholera scare in New York, in which it expressed the desire that the Asiatic pestilence would come up Narragansett Bay and destroy every man connected with the prosecution of Lizzie Borden. It drew a pen picture of the dread disease in the act of purging the city of Fall River, of such men as would dare to insinuate that the young woman was guilty. Then it sat back on its haunches, that editorial, and chuckled with ghoulish glee at the prospect. Looking at this case in the light of the action of the grand jury, it would seem that the author of that editorial was a trifle hasty. This was an extreme case, and yet there were many instances wherein a similar sentiment was expressed. Miss Borden remained in Taunton Jail until the 8th of May, 1893, when she was taken to New Bedford, Massachusetts, and arraigned before Judge J. W. Hammond of the Superior Court to plead to the indictments. Her plea on each charge was not guilty. The date of her trial was set for June the 5th following, to take place in New Bedford, and she was taken back to Taunton. Meanwhile, ex-Governor George D. Robinson was retained to assist in her defence. Her arraignment created a new public interest in the case, and a few days later the news was sent out from Taunton that she was very ill with a cold contracted on the journey to and from New Bedford. Still another story was circulated to the effect that her mind was weakening under the great strain and worry, but it was promptly denied the next day. About this time, Mrs. Mary A. Livermore paid the accused a visit and was accorded an interview at Taunton Jail. The next day, New England people were treated to a very pathetic story over the name of Amy Robsart, which was contrary to the report of Miss Borden's mental condition. Mrs. Livermore had told Miss Robsart, and the latter had painted the picture. End of chapter 20Chapter twenty one of the Fall River Tragedy by Edwin H. Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty one The Tricky McHenry Affair. The history of the Borden murder would be incomplete without reference to the affair in which Henry G. Tricky, the talented reporter of the Boston Globe, and Detective Edwin D. McHenry figured so prominently. They were not alone in the deal which resulted in the Boston Globe publishing on the 12th of October, 1892, a story which has since become famous as the most gigantic fake ever laid before the reading public. A dozen people, a majority of whom rank high in the estimation of the public, were directly connected with this matter, and while the writer of this book would be justified in giving each and every man's connection therewith, circumstances have arisen which would seem to indicate that by the publication of these names an unfortunate occurrence would be stirred into action again and perhaps no particular good would result so delicate in fact has the matter become that no newspaper has attempted to publish anything more than an occasional reference to it although more than one great daily is in possession of the main facts it is a delicate matter because it has many sides to be presented and each participant maintains that he was right in his actions and that the others were wrong. After hearing this story from many sources, each of which is apparently authentic, it becomes more confusing and treacherous. There are some things, however, upon which all parties agree, and they will be discussed in this chapter. Henry G. Tricky bargained with Detective McHenry for an exclusive story of the Borden case, and the price to be paid was $500, according to Mr. Tricky. The story was delivered, paid for, and published in the Boston Globe. It was false in every particular, and the Globe discovered its mistake ten hours after it had been made. Mr. Tricky left Boston soon afterward, and was accidentally killed by a railroad train in Canada in the latter part of November. His friends insisted that he was unjustly dealt with by McHenry, and that his death was the indirect result of the transaction. They claim also that he represented a great newspaper and that his efforts in getting the story for publication were honest, praiseworthy, and done in a manner which is to be expected of the live newspaper man of the day. But the state represented in this matter by McHenry makes a different claim, 
and it submitted evidence to the grand jury whereby Mr. Trickey was indicted for his connection with the affair. Had the unfortunate Mr. Trickey lived to meet his accusers, the result would no doubt have been as interesting and quite as sensational as the killing of the Bordens. As the Fall River Police, in connection with McHenry, secured the evidence upon which Mr. Trickey was indicted, it is but natural to expect that they had reasons for doing so. To offset this, the friends of the reporter claim he was the victim of a plot of which McHenry was the moving spirit, and they shoulder most of the blame on the detective. He, however, appears to be able to bear the burden, as Marshal Hilliard has repeatedly said that he found McHenry a capable, reliable, and trustworthy officer, so far as his connection with him had been. Thus it will be seen that if Mr. Trickey was innocent of the charges preferred against him, he was at a disadvantage, for the Fall River Police, as well as the District Attorney and the Attorney General, were kept thoroughly posted on what was taking place between the reporter and the detective. In order that both sides may be presented to the public, the story of the transaction as told by McHenry, as well as that of Tricky, is given, and can be taken for what it is worth. The detective has been unmercifully criticised by almost every newspaper in the country. Perhaps he deserved it richly, and perhaps he did not. The following is his statement made to the writer. He said, I was in New York the day of the Borden murders, and left that night for Fall River. Upon arriving on Friday morning, I, in company with State Officer Seaver, went to the Borden house to make a survey of the premises. This trip I took upon my own responsibility, as it were, prompted merely by a desire to look over the ground where so terrible a tragedy had been enacted. While in the yard I learned the story of the man who was said to have jumped over the back fence, and out of curiosity searched that part of the premises for a trace which the escaping man might have left. I was engaged in this work about three hours. I talked with John Cunningham, who was the first man on the premises, and from him learned that the back cellar door was locked when he made an effort to open it shortly after the murders were reported. I then went to the door and counted eleven weekly cobwebs, that is, cobwebs which had been in place a week or more. Assistant Marshal Fleet and I opened the door and concluded that no one had passed through it for a week at least. We then went to the barn and made further search. We were told that the place had been locked. After that we made a search of the Changyum fence, and I measured it and took other observations. From the house I went to the city marshal's office and there met Mr. Hilliard and Mayor Coughlin. The two men were discussing the case. It was then that the marshal employed me on the case, and the mayor authorised his action. I was engaged in various work until Saturday afternoon, or evening, when the marshal said to me, Mr. McHenry, I understand that there is a Pinkerton man in the city. I want you to take care of him. The mayor was also present at this interview, and gave his sanction to the order. I learned afterward that the marshal referred to the fact that Assistant Superintendent O. M. Hanscom of the Boston Agency was in the city, and believed that he was in the employ of Attorney Jennings and the Borden family. But the same night I found Mr. Hanscom, and watched him according to orders. It happened that the Marshal, Officer Seaver, and myself were at the Marshal's residence during the early part of the night, in consultation on the case. Mr. Hilliard was at supper, and I took occasion to go out and look around the premises. As I did so, I saw two Pinkerton men at the back window, evidently in the act of eavesdropping. I very quickly told them to get out, as we did not want any such cattle around. I did not mention the incident to the marshal at the time, but later, as we walked up to the city, I informed him of what I had seen. He was naturally angry at the audacity of the men whom I had seen around his house. On the way to the police station we met Henry G. Trickey, and he immediately entered into conversation with the marshal. I heard Mr. Hilliard say, I am making no special mark of anybody in this investigation, but I do intend to probe this affair to the bottom, no matter who it hits. I want to convey this information to your friend. Outside detectives must not interfere with the work of my men. Right here, I want to state, by way of parenthesis, that I did not go to the post office in Providence and offer to sell the evidence in the Graves Barnaby case to Mr. Trickey, although he said that I did. And the reason that I state that 
is that this very night, of which I am speaking, saw the beginning of the tricky McHenry affair, and it was but three nights after the Borden murders. It did not have its origin in me at all, as you will see as we progress. You will remember that yesterday I told you of an alleged truce which was said by the newspapers, in fact by Mr. Tricky himself, to have been patched up between us. The fact is that three months before the Bordens were murdered, I, in company with two friends, were in the Adams House, Boston, when Mr. Tricky came up. We had not been on friendly terms, as you know, since the Graves trial in Denver, and at that time we did shake hands, and apparently the hatchet was buried. In Mr. Tricky's own statement of this affair, which was printed over his signature in the Boston Globe of October the 11th, 1892, appears this sentence. I went to Providence to see about the lawyer's story. Now that was manifestly incorrect, as you know yourself that the Boston Globe published the whole story ten days before, and I know that Mr. Tricky got it from State Officer Siva. I merely mention this to show to you some of the glaring inconsistencies which are prominent in the story of the affair from which that sentence was read, but that is not the point for discussion now. On the night to which I referred a while ago, which was the 7th of August, Mr. Tricky, before meeting us as before stated, had left Superintendent Hanscom across the street, and Mayor Coughlin had joined the party, which then consisted of Marshal Hilliard, the Mayor, Officer Seaver, Mr. Tricky, and myself. After a short conversation with the Marshal, Mr. Tricky then turned to the Mayor and commenced to abuse the Attorney General for his course in the then-pending Trefferson Davis case. Mr. Tricky said, Hanscom has prevented the conviction of Trefferson so far, and he will lead Pillsbury yet. More than that, he will prevent the Fall River police from hanging Lizzie Borden. This thread of conversation was kept up for a while, and then Mr. Tricky, turning to me, said, Just a minute, Ned, I want to speak to you. I stepped aside with him. The Mayor and Officer Seaver walked along. The Marshal heeled up a few feet away. Then Mr. Tricky delivered himself as follows. Ned, you are a big chump if you don't throw that big clam digger, meaning the marshal, and deal to me. There is just five thousand bobs in this job for us. The marshal overheard this statement. I replied, What do you mean, Tricky? Then he said, You know how I stood with Hanscom in the graves matter, don't you? I just about own that Pinkerton agency, and the men do just about as I say in these matters. Now, I am in a position to give you a chance to get square with the Pinkertons, and at the same time catch five thousand nice juicy bobs. This was a tempting offer, I must say, for a poor man to hear made, and I said, Well, Henry, I will consider your proposition a while and see you again later. Hardly had the words been uttered than he grabbed me with both hands, and at the same time spoke in a loud voice to the marshal, who still remained nearby, saying, I'll let Mac go in a minute, Marshal. I want to speak to him about a lady we knew in Denver. Then lowering his voice, he continued, Has Lizzie Borden got a lover? Can't I allege that she has in my story tomorrow morning? I want something big to scoop this gang of newspaper fellows who are in the town. My reply to this was, Great God, Henry, no! He talked on, saying, Judging from what I heard today, somebody is in love with Lizzie. "'No, sir,' said I. "'The utmost consideration is and has been shown to Miss Borden, "'and I never heard that she had a lover.' "'The suggestion which Mr. Tricky made then was used in the great story, "'which he bought some months afterward, "'and you can begin to see now, perhaps, "'why I was suspicious of the honesty of Mr. Tricky's intentions.' "'He continued, however, saying, "'I know a great deal more about this case than the Fall River Police, "'and right here I want to give you a straight tip. If you take it to Hilliard, it will give him a valuable clue to work on. If my friend Hanscom, on his return from the next interview with Lizzie Borden, is satisfied that she is guilty, he is going to pull up stakes and leave the town. This very statement Mr. Tricky made again in the police office the next day, in the presence of the marshal and others. So, said Mr. Tricky, if he leaves the town, you can jump Lizzie immediately. Then in parting from me, he said, don't forget to consider my proposition and connect with me tomorrow. Then I will square myself with you for the dirty deal I gave you in the Graves case. 
I would have smashed him in the nose right there had not the marshal been in hearing distance. I promised him to think the matter over and see him again. I walked up to the marshal and we entered my room at the Wilbur House. Then and there I related what I have just told you and also told of Mr. Tricky's conduct in the Graves case. Went through it all from end to end. The marshal said that he had overheard a part of the conversation and that Mr. Tricky was up to just what he suspected. The marshal said to me in the course of the talk, Ned, if this man is what he represents himself to be, in connection with these people, you watch him, and look to me personally for help. Take plenty of time and use good judgment. Have everything in black and white. As I stated to you before, I had told him of my connection with the Graves case, and I suggested the advisability of my keeping in the background and under cover as much as possible in the work before us. Dr. Graves was then under conviction of murder, and the Supreme Court had not passed upon his motion for a new trial. Until this was settled, I did not feel that I should be prominently mentioned in the Borden case, as there were many men, enemies to me, who would antagonize me at every step if they knew that I was a factor in the investigation. He told me to go ahead and follow these people to the end, and to spare no pains or expense to do the job well. Next morning I was given a great many anonymous letters which the marshal had read, and in company with Inspector Medley ran them down, that is, established a clue for work which was afterward carried out by Captains Harrington and Doherty. This was part of the work which I did for the police, and secrecy of it kept me in the background. I kept my eye on the movements of the people I have mentioned before, and at the end of the first month made out my bill to the city of Fall River. It was allowed by the board of aldermen, but the Fall River Herald, in an alleged editorial, severely criticised the marshal for allowing me to work on the case, and objected to me being paid for what I had done. I never rendered another bill to the city of Fall River, although I worked night and day for months. In view of the Herald's criticism, I concluded not to bring the editor's unjust ravings into the heads of my friends, and so ever after that I paid my own expenses. I spent every cent of money I could rake and scrape to carry out the work assigned to me, until my family were all but destitute. I gave up all my time to this work, and stood still under the fierce and unjust thrusts of every editorial pen, with few exceptions, in New England. It made me a poor man, and eventually brought on an attack of nervous prostration, when I fell exhausted, penniless, and perhaps friendless, in the streets of New York, and was carried into the Cosmopolitan Hotel, where I lay among perfect strangers while my wife and child fought alone the battle for life in Providence. Yes, I did this rather than have such learned men as the editor of the Fall River Herald spill his gall over the magnanimous sum of one hundred and six dollars which I claimed for work and expenses, while upholding in my humble way the dignity of, and straining every nerve to assist, the Fall River Police. I took a solemn vow that no act of Ned McHenry should ever again compromise my friends, Rufus B. Hilliard, and his honour, John W. Coughlin. Therefore I plodded through in silence. And where is my reward? A few dollars for six months' work of myself and wife, and half a dozen men whom I paid regularly. But I would not have you understand that I am complaining. Perhaps the city of Fall River will reimburse me when the end of the Borden murder case is reached. Now in regard to all this bosh about my attempting to rob and defame newspaper men as a rule, I refer you to the Boston Post of October the 11th, and there you will see how I saved a paper which has been friendly to me. You may ask the managing editor how I treated him and his men in this case, and I think it only fair that he give you an answer. At this point, the writer asked Mr. McHenry if he furnished Mr. Tricky with a list of witnesses for the government. He replied, The only living evidence that I furnished Mr. Tricky with, with the names of living witnesses, is that I did tell him that I, my wife, and Bridget Sullivan were witnesses for the prosecution, and that he knew before I told him. I defy contradiction of this statement. Did you furnish him with that list of names which it is alleged that he showed the managing editor of the Globe in order to convince him that the story which he had bought from you was true? Mr. McHenry answered, That list of names is in Mr. Tricky's own handwriting, 
and if you or anybody else want further evidence of the truth of this statement examine the affidavits of those persons who were present when he wrote the list and which are now locked up in the attorney general's office commonwealth building boston who made these affidavits i asked and he answered several persons but all of them were not summoned to the grand jury to testify for instance there are two providence policemen two providence lawyers two of my men and captain desmond of fall river who know about the case but were not called all this documentary evidence against mr trickey is in his own handwriting and laid away in the same place and marked exhibit number one i want to say here and now that andrew j jennings has been clean and free in this whole business in justice to the man i do not believe that he did in any way give his sanction to the action of other friends of the accused woman i say this through no fear of mr jennings but because he would not countenance any such actions as tricky represented to have come from those friends as to the story i furnished mr tricky he had the gist of it in his pocket three weeks before it was printed in the globe i gave him a skeleton of what the alleged witnesses would testify to and he carried that around with him i suppose the attorney-general has the affidavits of eight witnesses to the transaction all of whom heard what was said at the time i gave him the story in an editorial of the globe of october the twelfth this statement appears reports are examined at short notice and sometimes under great hurry and excitement etc now that was no excuse for printing the stuff i sold mr tricky for he had the skeleton of the story for three weeks at least and if he had wanted it primarily for the globe there was no reason why he could not have examined it at his leisure the editorial goes on to say the story was so well written and on the face of it appeared to be so plausible that it was used without attempt at verification now i never read stronger language than that and i consider it a great compliment to me from the editor of the boston globe after mr tricky had made the proposition to buy the state's case from me i lay in bed that day and thought the matter over and formed some idea of the story which i would give out that night tricky came down and he and i worked on the story writing it out from the skeleton he wrote and i dictated we were at it until three o'clock in the morning this was on thursday before the monday on which the story appeared in print mind you i had not given the bogus witnesses names to him until that night in the skeleton there appeared no names but the separate statement of each witness was numbered from one to twenty-five and it read something like this witness number one will testify to so-and-so witness number two will testify to so-and-so and in this manner through the whole list that night i told him who the witnesses were and he used their names instead of the numbers after this was completed he showed me a draft made out by a certain gentleman payable to me in the sum of five thousand dollars it was drawn on andrew j jennings and was in payment for the government's case that draft was never honoured with it was a letter authorising the expenditure of any sum of money to get at the whole case of the prosecution that letter was laid in a convenient place and i got tricky out of my office long enough to afford other people a chance to get a good look at it and to read it i consider that movement a nice piece of detective work during the evening captains harrington and desmond sat behind the curtain in my office and heard mr tricky say to me that he had bribed them and that they had told him many of the state's secrets why tricky went on so far as to accuse the mayor of the city of accepting a bribe and selling out to him the representative of the defence at this point the writer asked mchenry how on earth did mr tricky escape in the face of such accusations as this mchenry replied at once he never met his match before continuing mchenry said tricky did agree in the hearing of the usual number of witnesses to give me twenty-four hours notice before he published the story in his published statement of october the eleventh he says i asked him two questions on the night of the tenth this mind you was at the time of his first and last visit to my office after the alleged evidence had been published the first question he quoted correctly except he did not use the word skeleton as he should have done the second is entirely wrong i did ask him this question tricky did you not promise to come down to my office with the balance of that five thousand dollars and he replied yes 
I did inveigle Tricky into Massachusetts, for I wanted him to commit that crime in that state. By agreement, I was in Attleboro, and waiting to hear from Tricky. He telephoned to me from Boston that he would be in Attleboro on the three o'clock train, and he kept his engagement. I met him in front of the Park Hotel. The message was received by the proprietor of the Park Hotel, and he has a record of it. In Mr. Tricky's published account of this matter, he says that he has eight affidavits of parties to the effect that the alleged evidence was true, and that they were sworn to before me as a notary in Providence. If he has, why don't they show them? I defy any man to produce such affidavits. On Monday night, after the Globe published its story, I was in Fall River and started for home. I expected that there would be trouble, and so Captains Desmond and Harrington went up on a late train to get behind the curtain and watch the fun which was sure to come. I left on an afternoon train by way of Mansfield. Mr. Carberry, a Globe reporter, followed me on the train and harassed me until forbearance ceased to be a virtue. Arriving in Providence, I was met by about four newspaper men, including Charlie Kirby and Mr. Tricky. They surrounded me at the entrance to the station and demanded an audience. I eluded them and was on my way home when they again caught sight of me, and when near engine company number four, matters almost came to a crisis. Mr. Tricky had his hand thrust into his pocket as if to draw a pistol, and he wore on his face the most aggravated look of desperation that it has ever been my misfortune to behold. I felt that he was in a state of mind which would lead him to do something rash. I feared he might attempt to take my life. I was not armed at the time, but I determined to make a bold stand, and so I told him that if he made a move I would kill him on the spot. Before leaving Fall River I had telephoned to my wife that I would arrive home at a certain hour, and she had already made preparations for receiving me. Hardly had I made this threat to Mr. Tricky than one of my men from the office rushed up and handed me a pistol. With this I ordered Mr. Kirby to stand aside, and told Mr. Tricky that if he wanted to speak with me, to proceed to my house where I would hear what he had to say. Before moving from his tracks, he said, McHenry, I ought to kill you instantly. I learned afterwards that he had made the statement in Boston that there would be a funeral in Providence if he ever laid eyes on me. In his published statement before referred to, he says that he was instructed before leaving Boston to treat me with the utmost consideration. You can judge for yourself whether he did or not. I believe that he had been instructed to shoot me on the spot, and he would have done so had he the courage. We removed toward the house, and he marched in front. We entered, and left Kirby on the outside. We had a more rational talk about the publication and authenticity of the story, and he finally withdrew. As he backed down the steps, I told him I would shoot him dead in his tracks if he ever entered my house again. The next time I saw Tricky was on Broadway, New York, after he had left Boston. I was sent to this city to shadow and watch his movements, and I had kept track of him all the time, up to the meeting of the grand jury. At the session of that body he was indicted on six counts. In the preparation and attempt at service of these warrants, there was some queer work, and I know that Tricky would have been arrested had he not received a tip and skipped to Canada. He was in Boston when the warrants were issued, and had been for three days. I had him located, and was at the Attorney General's office to get instructions as to how to proceed. He gave me a sealed letter of instructions to the clerk of the district court in Taunton, and this I delivered in person. Instead of making out the warrant according to his orders, the clerk made them out to the sheriff constable, etc., of Bristol County. I did not know this at the time. There was in the room at the time the warrants were made out, State Officer Seaver, and he demanded that the clerk deliver the warrants to him for service. To this I most strenuously objected, and then there was a clash as to who was entitled to possession of the papers. I told Mr. Seaver that I was sorry to quarrel with a man whom I had always looked upon as a friend, but that I had been into this transaction from the start, and I proposed to stay in it until the finish. Without more ado, I laid my hands on the warrants and took them to Deputy Sheriff Brown of Attleboro, who in turn delivered them into the hands of the Boston police. 
At police headquarters in Boston it was soon learned that the warrants were defective, inasmuch as they were made out in such a manner as not to be serviceable in any county except Bristol County. They had to be returned to the district court in Taunton and rectified. This necessitated a delay of about 28 hours, and gave somebody an opportunity to get Tricky out of the state. That is why he was not arrested. Mr. Seaver was especially desirous that I allow him to make the arrest of Mr. Tricky, but to this, as I said before, I successfully objected. There were some very strange things done in connection with these warrants, and if you doubt what I have said, I refer you to the records of the Boston Police on the 15th of last October. This, briefly, is my connection with the Tricky McHenry affair. In closing the interview, I asked Mr. McHenry how many times Mr. Tricky visited his office in Providence during the carrying out of his work, and to this he replied, twelve. My wife, said Mr. McHenry, did a great deal of work in this case, and was of much service to the Fall River Police. She was, I believe, the only woman who could and did succeed in getting the confidence of Bridget Sullivan. She was also of much assistance as a shadow, and was the famous veiled lady who was so mystifying to the newspaper men. She shadowed Tricky to Boston time and again, and on each occasion found that he went to the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Mr. Tricky always, after leaving my office, went to this place before he went to the office of the Globe. Such is the statement of McHenry, and it is but fair to say that the Fall River Police admit that Captain Harrington was sent to Providence several times to overhear the conversation between Tricky and McHenry, and that Captain Desmond went one or more times. The police also admit that Mr. Tricky was indicted for tampering with a government witness. There is, however, another side to this case, and that is the explanation made by Mr. Tricky of his conduct. It is conceded that he was one of the ablest and at the same time most brilliant man in his profession in the state, and there is no attempt made here to reflect discredit upon his methods or to question his honesty of purpose. Thus, it is justice to him in giving his version of the affair. Before his departure from Boston and after the Globe had published its big story, he made a written statement of connection with it, telling plainly of every move he made and all the talk he had had with McHenry before and after the purchase of the story. This written statement was delivered into the hands of Superintendent John Cornish of the Pinkerton Detective Agency and served as a basis for the extended investigation which the Pinkertons carried on for months in Fall River, Providence, New York and Boston with the intention of sifting the entire matter to its foundation. Mr. Tricky alleged, and his friends believe him, that McHenry was responsible for the injustice done, the Boston Globe, and that the detective, actuated by motives of personal gain and revenge, not only sacrificed Mr. Tricky and the Globe, but deliberately misled the Fall River Police, and secured their sanction and cooperation in the deal. He starts out by saying that he was in Providence the early part of September on the lookout for the lawyer story, and that he saw McHenry on the street, that the detective called him across, and the two men entered into conversation, during which McHenry said that he had a good story to sell. Well, Max, said Tricky, the Globe will pay as much for it as any other paper. Yes, said the detective, but it's worth a great deal more to somebody else. Who? asked Tricky. The defence, replied McHenry. Then Tricky was given to understand that he could have the entire evidence in the Borden case for $1,200. He says that McHenry gave him to understand that the matter would be sold only for the use of the defence and not for publication. Tricky didn't care anything about the defence. All he wanted was a story for his paper, and with a view of getting it, he humoured McHenry by agreeing to call upon Colonel Adams and ask him if he wanted to hire a good detective, one who could get at all the state's evidence against Miss Borden. Tricky did call upon Colonel Adams and had a conversation about this matter, with the result, according to Tricky's statement, that the lawyer didn't have any use for a detective and didn't care anything about investing his client's money in the purchase of the Commonwealth's case. In other words, Colonel Adams refused to have anything to do with the proposed deal. But the reporter, knowing that his chances of securing the stuff for publication would be materially lessened if he made known the result of his visit, 
concluded to act the part of an agent for the defence and represent to mchenry that colonel adams did in reality desire to buy the story with this conclusion in mind he again visited the detective and reported but wrongfully as he says that the colonel would buy if the price was lowered mchenry then agreed to sell for one thousand dollars and divide the money with tricky this was the reporter's opportunity he knew that the globe would give five hundred dollars and that sum he intended to pay over to the detective representing that it came from colonel adams and that he had kept the other five hundred dollars as his share according to agreement it might be said here that if any such deal as this was made the supporters of mr tricky have failed to find a witness who overheard the bargain while on the other hand the police denied that such a conversation ever took place and claim that captain harrington and others were in a position to hear all that was said upon the subject by mr tricky and the detective but this chapter is not an argument either for or against mr tricky his declaration goes on to say that after the fifteenth of september or thereabout he made numberless visits to the detective and in this particular he agrees with the police version of the affair he admits receiving the skeleton story first and later the names of the alleged witnesses and that he did play the part of an agent for the defence prompted purely by a desire to get the story for publication the fact that he hastened to print the story without further attempt to verify it is due to two causes first he feared that mchenry would sell it to the boston herald second that he had given a fall river police officer one whose name does not appear in this chapter the sum of one hundred dollars for a list of the witnesses in the case and they agreed with the names furnished by mchenry in the latter part of the transaction the fact that it did agree convinced him that the story was all right and he did not want to take the chances of mchenry selling out to the herald so the agreement about the twenty-four hours notice was violated the writer has been assured by the police that if mr tricky had given the twenty-four hours notice before publication the boston globe would have been spared the trouble of printing the fake in justice to the boston globe it must be said that its editors made the most humble and abject apology for the wrong done miss borden by the publication of the thirteen columns of lies which detective mchenry had sold to mr tricky the apology was made as prominent as the story had been and the globe's position although not an enviable one appeared to be as graceful as the circumstances would admit it has been stated by persons who are in a position to know whereof they speak that not only mr tricky but others were indicted for their apparent connection with this affair End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the fall river tragedy by edwin h porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two beginning of the superior court trial according to the arrangements already made the trial of miss lizzie borden commenced in new bedford on the morning of the fifth of june eighteen ninety three it was conducted before three superior court judges they were chief justice albert mason and associate justices caleb blodgett and justin dewey no spectators were allowed in the courtroom the first day of the trial but this rule was not observed later the only persons present at the opening were the one hundred and fifty jurors from which twelve were to be selected the court officers a few of the intimate friends of the prisoner and thirty-five newspaper correspondents miss borden was escorted to the courthouse by deputy sheriff kirby and to all appearances had not changed in the least during her ten months of confinement in taunton jail the court was opened by prayer by rev m c julian who spoke as follows almighty and all-wise god our father we look to thee as the only source of wisdom as the only source of courage we pray thee that thou wouldst grant that in entering on the solemn duties of this court we shall have not only such help as comes from the experience of the past through the history of the world but such help as thou by thy providence wilt and canst give to thy earthly children we pray thee that so innocence may be revealed and guilt exposed to the glory of thy own great name and the well-being of the world we ask it all for thy name's sake amen 
The first day was devoted entirely to the selection of the jury, which was made up of the following named gentlemen. Charles I. Richards, foreman, of North Attleborough. George Potter, of Westport. William F. Dean, of Taunton. John Wilbur, of Somerset. Frederick C. Wilbar, of Raynham. Lemuel K. Wilbur, of Easton. Louis D. Hodges, of Taunton. Augustus Swift, of New Bedford. Frank G. Cole, of Attleborough. John C. Finn, of Taunton. William Westcott, of Seaconk. And Alan H. Wardell, of Dartmouth. The second day of the trial was devoted to the opening of the case by the government's representative, Mr. William H. Moody, District Attorney of Essex County, and assistant to District Attorney Knowlton of Bristol County. During the afternoon of that day, the jury visited the scenes of the murder in Fall River. Mr. Moody spoke as follows. May it please your honours, Mr. Foreman and gentlemen of the jury. Upon the fourth day of August of the last year, an old man and woman, husband and wife, each without a known enemy in the world, in their own home, upon a frequented street in the most populous city in the county, under the light of day, and in the midst of its activities, were, first one, then, after an interval of an hour, another, severally killed by unlawful human agency. Today, a woman of good social position, of hitherto unquestioned character, a member of a Christian church and active in its good works, the own daughter of one of the victims, is at the bar of this court accused by the grand jury of this country of these crimes. There is no language, gentlemen, at my command, which can better measure the solemn importance of the inquiry which you are about to begin than this simple statement of facts. For the sake of these crimes and for the sake of these accusations, every man may well pause at the threshold of this trial and carefully search his understanding and conscience for any vestige of prejudice and finding it cast it aside as an unclean thing it is my purpose gentlemen and it is my duty to state to you at this time so much of the history of the cause and so much of the evidence which is to be introduced upon this trial as shall best enable you to understand the claim of the government and to appreciate the force and application of the testimony as it comes from the witnesses on the stand. It is my purpose to do that in the plainest, simplest, and most direct manner, and it is not my purpose to weary you with a recital of all the details of the evidence which is to come before you. Andrew Jackson Borden, the person named in the second part of the indictment, was at the time of his death a man of considerable property somewhere, I believe, between $250,000 and $300,000. He had been retired from business for a number of years. He was a man who had obtained his fortune by earning and saving, and he retained the habit of saving up to the time of his death. And it will appear in the course of this trial that the family establishment was upon what might well be called, for a person in his circumstances, a narrow scale. He had been twice married, the first wife died some twenty-seven or twenty-eight years before he died, leaving two children, now alive, the prisoner at the bar, Lizzie Andrew Borden, the younger, and then somewhere between two and three years of age, a sister, Miss Emma Borden, being a woman at the present time in the neighbourhood of ten years older than the prisoner. Not long after the death of the first wife, Andrew Borden married again a woman whose maiden name, I believe, was Abby Durfee Gray. The marriage, I believe, was something over twenty-five years before the time of their deaths, and there was no issue of the second marriage, at least none living, and none that I have been informed of at any time. Abby Durfee Borden, at the time of her death, was about six years younger than her husband, and that would make her, of course, sixty-four years of age. Mr. Borden, I may say here, was a spare, thin man and somewhat tall. Mrs. Borden was a short, fat woman, weighing, I believe, in the neighbourhood of two hundred pounds. The house in which these homicides were committed had been occupied by the Borden family for some twenty years. I shall have occasion to consider its construction 
and its relation to other buildings and streets later on in the course of this opening. There was, or came to be, between the prisoner and her stepmother, an unkindly feeling. From the nature of the case, from the fact that those who know the most about that feeling, except the prisoner at the bar, are dead. It will be impossible for us at this hearing to get anything more than suggestive glimpses of that feeling. It would appear that some five years before the death of Mr. and Mrs. Borden, some controversy had arisen about some property, not important in itself. Mr. Borden had seen fit to do some benefaction for a relative of Mrs. Borden, and in consequence of that fact, the daughters thought that something should be done for them by way of pecuniary provision as an offset. The details of what happened at that time are, as I have said, by no means important. It is significant, however, that enough of feeling has been created by the discussion which arose to cause a change in the relationships between the prisoner and Mrs. Borden. Up to that time she had addressed her stepmother as mother. From that time she substantially ceased to do so. We shall show to you that the spring before these homicides, upon some occasion where talk arose between the prisoner and a person who did the cloak-making for the family, the latter spoke of Mrs. Borden as mother. The prisoner at once repudiated that relation and said, Don't call her mother. She is a mean thing, and we hate her. We have as little to do with her as possible. Well, don't you have your meals with her? Yes, we do sometimes, but we try not to and a great many times we wait until they are over with their meals, and we stay in our own rooms as much as possible. I know of nothing that will appear in this case more significant of the feeling that existed between Mrs. Borden and the prisoner than a little incident which occurred not long after the discovery of these homicides. When one of the officers of the law, while the father and the stepmother lay at the very place where they had fallen under the blows of the assassin, was seeking information from the prisoner, he said, When did you last see your mother? She is not my mother. My mother is dead. You cannot fail, I think, to be impressed in this respect with what will appear as to the method of living of this family. It will appear later on in the evidence that, although they occupied the same household, there was built up between them by locks and bolts and bars almost an impassable wall. At the early part of August of last year, the older daughter, Miss Emma, was away, I believe at Fairhaven, at the time. When Miss Emma was away, the household that was left consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Borden and a servant who had been in the service of the family nearly three years, Bridget Sullivan, and the prisoner. Upon the day preceding the homicides, John V. Morse, a brother of Mr. Borden's first wife, and therefore the uncle of his daughters, came upon a visit, or a passing visit, to the Bordens. The homicides, I may say now, were upon a Thursday, and the visit of Mr. Morse was on Wednesday. He came a little after the completion of the dinner, went away, I think, during the afternoon, returned in the evening, and slept at the house upon the Wednesday night. Upon Tuesday night, Tuesday, August the 2nd, an illness occurred in the household. Mr. and Mrs. Borden were taken suddenly ill with a violent retching and vomiting sickness, and it is said to a less degree the prisoner herself was affected by this illness. Bridget Sullivan was not. Upon the Wednesday morning, Mr. and Mrs. Borden rose, feeling, of course, in the condition that people would be in after a night of that character, and Mrs. Borden consulted a physician with reference to her condition. Upon the noon of Wednesday, which you will keep in mind was the very day before these homicides, the prisoner went to a drug store in Fall River, the situation of which will be pointed out to you, and there asked the clerk for ten cents worth of prussic acid for the purpose of cleaning a seal-skin cape. She was told that that was poison, which was not sold except on the prescription of a physician, and after some little talk went away. I think, gentlemen, you will be satisfied that there can be no question that the person who made this application for the deadly poison was the prisoner. There were three persons in the drug store, two of whom knew her by name and sight. One of these two knew her as the daughter of Andrew J. Borden, and the third recognized her at once as he saw her. On the evening of the Wednesday, the prisoner made a call, 
not in itself unusual or peculiar, upon a friend of hers, Miss Alice Russell, and we shall commend to your careful attention what occurred during that interview. It will appear that the prisoner had been intending to spend a vacation with a party of her friends at Marion, and had made some arrangements about going to Marion, and the talk between the two friends started upon that subject. The prisoner said, I have made up my mind, Alice, to take your advice and go to Marion, and I have written there to them that I shall go, but I cannot help feeling depressed. I cannot help feeling that something is going to happen to me. I cannot shake it off. Last night, she said, we were all sick. Mr. and Mrs. Borden were quite sick and vomited. I did not vomit, and we are afraid that we have been poisoned. The girl did not eat the baker's bread, and we did, and we think it may have been the baker's bread. No, said Miss Russell, if it had been that, some other people would have been sick in the same way. Well, it might have been the milk. Our milk is left outside upon the steps. What time is your milk left? At four o'clock in the morning. It is light then, and no one would dare to come in and touch it at that time. Well, said the prisoner, probably that is so, but father has been having so much trouble with those with whom he has dealings that I am afraid some of them will do something to him. I expect nothing, but that the building will be burned down over our heads. The barn has been broken into twice. That, said Miss Russell, was merely boys after pigeons. Well, the house has been broken into in broad daylight when Maggie and Emma and I were the only ones in the house. I saw a man the other night when I went home lurking about the buildings, and as I came up he jumped and ran away. Father had trouble with a man the other day about a store. There were angry words, and he turned him out of the house. And so the talk went on. That, I beg you to keep in your minds, was with Miss Russell, Alice M. Russell. There comes now the most difficult duty which I have in this opening. I am consoled, Mr. Foreman and gentlemen, by the fact that you will be aided beyond any explanation that I give you by a view of these premises that I am about to explain. I hope I shall be able, even without the view, to make myself entirely intelligible to you, because no one can understand this testimony that is to come, and rightly reason upon it without an exact knowledge of the interior and exterior of that house. In the first place, I may say, that the house occupied by this family was a common type of house in this community and in this state, a house with the end to the street and the front door upon the end. It was a rectangular house. It was situated upon Second Street in Fall River, which is one of the most frequented streets outside of the main thoroughfares of the city, and is within, as all probably know, a very short distance of the city hall. It may fairly be called a thoroughfare, as well for foot passengers as for carriages. It is a street used partly for residences and partly for business purposes. Second Street runs substantially north and south. It is a street which ascends towards the south. The higher part is south, the lower part is north, and upon the east side of Second Street this house is situated. At the south of the house is the residence of Dr. Kelly, and also very near the house. To the north of the house, and also near it, is the residence occupied by Mrs. Churchill, and diagonally in the rear of the house is the residence occupied by Dr. Shannon. The house is separated from the sidewalk by a wooden fence, a picket fence, with two gates, and in the rear of the yard, in which is situated a barn, there is a high board fence, on the top and the bottom of which there was at the time, and is, I believe, now, a line of barbed wire. There are three exterior doors, three entrances to the premises, and only three, excepting, of course, the windows. There is a front door leading directly from the sidewalk up a pair of steps into the hall. There is a side door upon the north side, facing Mrs. Churchill's house, leading into a small entryway which leads into the kitchen. There is a third door exactly in the rear of the house, which leads down to the cellar. There is what might be called a porch, and a door leading into it, as you will see. As you enter the front door, you enter a hall, from which lead two doors, a door into a parlour, which is the front room of the house, making the northwest corner of the first story. 
a door leading into the sitting-room, and a stairway leading upstairs. Let us, in the first place, go upstairs and see the arrangements there. It will aid us in considering this arrangement to remember that this house was originally a double tenement house, and with the slight exception that I shall refer to later on, the arrangement as it is upstairs is as it is upon the first story. As you are about to see the premises, gentlemen, I do not deem it wise to detain you at the present time by explaining this plan in detail. I will try to make it as clear as I can by stating it to you. As you turn and go upstairs from the front entry, you come into a hallway. From that hallway lead three doors. First a door which leads into a large closet, used at this time for the keeping of dresses, and which is almost large enough to be a small bedroom. Another door, which leads into the guest chamber, which is directly over the parlour below, and corresponds to it in every respect. The guest chamber is the chamber in which you will subsequently hear that Mrs. Borden was found dead. It is a matter which is to be carefully considered, that as you turn upon the journey upstairs, as the stairs wind about, and to begin to face into the hall, toward the north, you can look directly into the door of the guest chamber. The other door which leads from the hall is a door which leads into a bedroom, and leads toward the rear of the house. Following then my direction, gentlemen, as you come up the stairs, turn to your left. As you approach the entry, in front of you is the door leading into the guest chamber, and to your right is the door leading into a chamber, which at that time was occupied by the prisoner. Between the guest chamber and the bedroom of the prisoner there was a door. I may as well dispose of it now for good. It was a door which always, including the day of this homicide, was kept locked upon both sides, and upon the side toward the prisoner's room there was against the door a desk which she used. In other words, it was not a practicable opening. When you have got up into this part of the house, gentlemen, you can go nowhere except into the clothes closet, into this guest chamber, and into the room occupied by the prisoner. It is important to remember that. All access to the other part of the house is cut off, not by the natural construction of the house, but by the way in which the house was kept. Follow me, if you please, then, into the prisoner's bedroom. As you enter the bedroom, a door leads to the left into a room which has no other entrance than that door. That is the room that was occupied by Miss Emma when she was at home. The only access to it was through the prisoner's room. There is another door at the rear of the prisoner's room, and directly opposite the door of entrance, which leads into the room occupied by Mr. and Mrs. Borden, which is over the kitchen. The prisoner's room was exactly over the sitting room. The room in the rear of the prisoner's room was exactly over the kitchen, and was occupied as the bedroom of Mr. and Mrs. Borden. That door leading into that room was always kept locked on both sides. It was locked upon the front toward the prisoner's room by a hook. It was locked in the rear toward Mr. and Mrs. Borden's room by a bolt, and I may as well say here, as at any time, that the proof that that door was locked upon both sides upon the morning from the morning down to the time of the arrival of those who came alarmed by this homicide, will be ample and complete. But as we go further, passing into the rear, into Mr. and Mrs. Borden's room, we find a door, and only a single door, leading out into the entryway, which is over the entryway leading into the kitchen. That door, it will be clearly, amply, and satisfactorily proved, was locked all through this day, up to and beyond, the time of the homicide. Now then, gentlemen, if I have made myself clear upon this description, which is wearisome, I know, but it is one of the wearisome duties that we must undertake in this cause, I have made it clear to you that as you go up the hallway you get access to but four rooms. The hallway itself, if you call that a room, the closet, the guest chamber in which Mrs. Borden was found, and the room of the prisoner, and the room leading out of that, the blind room, so to speak, that was occupied by Miss Emma when she was at home, and there is no other access whatever to the rear of the house. Now, gentlemen, let me, at the expense of being tedious, go below. As you enter the hallway below, it is, I believe, exactly as above, except, of course, there is no clothes-closet there, as there is above. 
There are two small closets, very small ones, as you will see. To your left as you enter is the door, which leads into the parlour, under the room where Mrs. Borden was found dead. Going straight ahead, you enter into the sitting room, which is a room in the rear of the hall at the south of the house, and directly under and corresponding to the prisoner's bedroom. Now you come to a difference of construction in the two stories. You turn to the left from the sitting room as you enter, and you enter the dining room, which is upon the north side of the house, and is directly under Miss Emma's room, and a large room which was used as a closet by Mr. Borden, and which joined his room, another blind room. That difference is made either by the taking down or putting up of a partition. You enter the dining room, and there is a door of exit which goes into the kitchen. Above, that arrangement is varied by a partition directly down through the room, which would correspond to the door leading from the sitting-room to the dining-room, leads from Miss Emma's room to the bedroom of the prisoner, and the door corresponding to the door leading from the dining-room to the kitchen, leads from the room which adjoins the blind-room, which adjoins the bedroom of Mr. and Mrs. Borden, so that the effect of that partition is that while there is free communication two ways from the kitchen to the front part of the house downstairs, upstairs this partition reduces those ways of communication to one, and that one, you will recall, always and upon the day of the homicide was barred by two doors, locked. Again, gentlemen, I say that the difficulty of understanding this is great, but I am confronted by the fact that you will be aided by a view of these premises. Mr. Morse returned upon a Wednesday night. It is important to show who occupied the house on Wednesday night. Let us go first to the front part of the house. The prisoner came in the last one that night, and locked the front door. Upon that front door were three fastenings, a spring latch, a bolt, and a lock which operated the key. Those three fastenings were closed, by the way, when she came in, the last person that night, by the front way of the house. The door leading into the cellar, the other exterior door, had been closed since Tuesday, the washing day, and by complete and ample evidence will be proved to you to have been closed all through Wednesday night and on Thursday morning, including up to and beyond the time of those homicides. Bridget came in through the back door that night, found the back door locked when she came, unlocked it, locked it as she went in, went upstairs and went to bed. So when Bridget and the prisoner had come in at their respective doors, every exterior approach to this house was closed. Now in the front part of the house that night, the prisoner slept in one room. Mr. Morse slept in the guest chamber. There was no other room in that part of the house except Miss Emma's room, which led out, as you still remember, of Miss Lizzie's room. Mr. and Mrs. Borden slept in the room over the kitchen, and Bridget slept in some room above in the third story of the house. Now then, it becomes my duty to relate in considerable detail all that occurred in that house down to the time of the discovery of these homicides. In the morning, Bridget was the first person up. We may safely assume that upon the proof the only human beings who were in that house at the time were Bridget, Mr. and Mrs. Borden, John V. Morse, and the prisoner at the bar. Bridget comes down first, the back way, goes down cellar and gets her fuel, builds up a fire in the stove. Then she went to the door, took in the milk, unlocking the door, locked it after she got through. The rear door, I may explain here, was a double door, it was an ordinary wooden panel door, which was used at night, and a screen door, which was used at least in hot weather, during the daytime, and was fastened by a hook on the inside. When the outside door was opened by Bridget at that time, it was opened for good for the day, and the method of security was keeping the screen door locked from that time on. The next person who came down was Mrs. Borden. Bridget came down a little after six. Mrs. Borden came down a little before seven. Next, Mr. Borden comes down, and after coming down, goes out into the yard and empties his slop pail, and unlocks the door to the barn. Bridget saw him do that. Bridget did not see Mr. Morse until they all met at breakfast a little after seven. Mr. and Mrs. Borden and Mr. Morse taking breakfast together. It will appear what the material of their breakfast was, but it is not important at all for me to state it at this time. After breakfast, the first one to depart is Mr. Morse. He goes away at a quarter of eight, 
and Mr. Borden lets him out and locks the screen door behind him. Soon after Mr. Morse went away, the prisoner came downstairs and began eating her breakfast, or what took the place of a breakfast, in the kitchen. While she was there, Mr. Borden went upstairs, and while Mr. Borden was upstairs, Bridget went out into the yard, because she was sick and desired to vomit. She was gone some minutes, just how long, I cannot tell. When she came back, Mr. Borden had apparently gone downtown. The prisoner was in the kitchen, and Mrs. Borden was in the dining-room, dusting. There was some talk then between Mrs. Borden and Bridget about watching the windows on the inside and the outside, and Bridget received the directions from Mrs. Borden to do that service. Mrs. Borden disappeared at this time, and it will appear that she told the prisoner that, having made the bed in the spare room, she was going upstairs to put two pillowcases upon two pillows that were there, a trifling duty, a duty which would take less than a minute. You will be satisfied, gentlemen, that that was not far from half-past nine o'clock, and upon the evidence you will be satisfied that she never left that room alive, and that she was killed within a very few moments after she left the room, because no living person saw Mrs. Borden from that time until her death, except the assailant. In the course of beginning the duty of washing these windows, Bridget had to go to the barn and down cellar to get some of the implements for doing the work. As she was at the screen door about to go out, the prisoner appeared at that back door, and Bridget said to her, You needn't lock that door, because I am coming in to get my water to wash the windows. But you may, she said, if you wish, and I will get my water from the barn. As she did. The prisoner said nothing, and I believe it to be the fact, as the evidence will disclose it, that the door was not locked at that time. Then Bridget went into the kitchen and dining-room and sitting-room to close the windows in the sitting-room and the dining-room, and there was nobody there, neither the prisoner nor Mrs. Borden, who were the only two human beings in the house at that time except Bridget. In washing these windows there were two of the sitting-room windows open, upon the south side of the house, which were out of sight of the screen door, because they were on the other side of the house. These two windows were washed first, on the outside, and the two dining-room windows. Those two windows were washed first, on the outside. Then Bridget came to the front of the house, washed two windows facing the street. Then she came to the south side of the house, the Mrs. Churchill side, and washed the parlour window, and the two dining-room windows. During all the time that Bridget was washing those windows, she saw neither Mrs. Borden nor the prisoner in any part of the lower part of the house or anywhere else. When she finished washing the windows on the outside, she came in at the screen door and hooked it behind her, and began to wash the windows upon the inside of the same windows that she had washed upon the outside. First she went into the sitting-room, which is upon the Kelly side, the south side of the house. She had partly washed one of the two sitting-room windows when somebody was heard at the front door. Now, gentlemen, let us pause a moment and find out, as well as we can, what time that somebody came to the front door, because it was Mr. Borden. Mr. Borden, it will appear, left the house some time between nine and nine-thirty o'clock in the morning. He was at two banks, two or three banks, between nine-thirty or at twenty-nine minutes of eleven. I am not quite sure which. He was at the store of a Mr. Clegg, who fixes the exact time. The next place we find him is at another store, which belongs to him, upon South Main Street, near the corner of Spring, and not far from his own home. He left there, apparently in the direction of his home, at twenty minutes of eleven. That was a moment or two's walk from there to his house. The next we see of him is that he is seen by Mrs. Kelly, who lived upon one side of his house and who was going downtown, coming around, apparently, from the screen door, where he had attempted to get in, out upon the sidewalk and toward his own front door, taking out his key to open it. Mrs. Kelly will fix that time at twenty-seven or twenty-eight minutes of eleven, which cannot be reconciled with the other time that I have stated here. There will be some explanation of that, and we think you will be satisfied that the clock by which she obtained this time was not one that could be depended upon, and that the real fact is that, at twenty minutes of eleven, Mr. Borden started to his home, which was but a moment or two walk away. Now then, we fix that as well as we can. 
When Mr. Borden came home, contrary to the usual custom in that house, Bridget found the front door locked with the key and bolted, as well as secured by the spring lock. Mr. Borden had not rung the bell. He had put his key in and made the noise which people usually do who expect to get in the house by the use of a latch key, but the door was locked and bolted. He came into the house, and as Bridget let him in, made some talk or explanation about the difficulty of unloosening the locks. The prisoner from the hall above made some laugh or exclamation. At that time, gentlemen, Mrs. Borden's body lay within plain view of that hall, dead, probably more than an hour. Mr. Borden came in, went first into the dining-room. There the prisoner came to him, asked him if there was any mail, and said to him, "'Mrs. Borden has gone out. She had a note from somebody who was sick.' That, gentlemen, we put to you as a lie, intended for no purpose except to stifle inquiry as to the whereabouts of Mrs. Borden. Mr. Borden then took his key, went upstairs, came down again, and as he came down, Bridget had finished the other window and a half in the sitting-room, and was just going into the dining-room to finish those windows. As she was washing the windows in the dining-room, the prisoner again appeared from the front part of the house, went to the kitchen, got an ironing-board, and began to iron her handkerchiefs. While there she told Bridget this falsehood about the note. She said, "'Are you going out, Bridget, by and by?' Bridget said, "'I don't know. I am not feeling very well to-day.' "'Well,' she said, "'if you do, I want you to be careful about the locks. I may go out myself. Mrs. Borden has gone out.' "'Where is she?' said Bridget. "'I don't know. It must be somewhere in town, because she received a note to go to a sick friend.' Bridget finished the washing of the windows in the dining-room, and her work was done. She went out into the kitchen, put her cloth away, emptied the water, and was about to go upstairs, when the prisoner said to her, "'There is a cheap sale of goods down town, Bridget, where they are selling some kind of cloth for eight cents a yard.' Bridget says, "'Well, I guess I will have some,' and Bridget went upstairs. Now, gentlemen, probably all that occurred after Mr. Borden came in occurred in less than perhaps it has taken me to tell it. We can measure time better by seeing what is done in the time than by the estimate of any witness of the time. After Bridget went upstairs, there is nothing more that happened until the alarm is given to her. Now, pursuing the same course, let me so far as possible fix the time of that alarm. I shall have to anticipate somewhat in doing it. Bridget, upon the alarm, came downstairs, was immediately sent diagonally across the street for Dr. Bowen, returned rapidly and was sent away for Miss Russell. As Bridget went away, Mrs. Churchill, by accident, came to the house, or got the alarm and came to the house. There was a moment's conversation between the prisoner and Mrs. Churchill. Mrs. Churchill ran out, ran diagonally across the street to a stable, there gave some sort of alarm, was seen by a man named Cunningham, who heard what she said and went to a telephone in a paint shop nearby, telephoned to the Marshal of Fall River, who gave directions to an officer to go to the spot. The officer, having a duty which called his attention to the time, looked at his watch and found it was quarter past eleven. Now then, gentlemen, stopping a moment, let us try to find out, as well as we can, these times. It could not have been upon the evidence far from a quarter of eleven o'clock when Mr. Borden returned. It could not, upon this evidence, have been far from quarter past eleven when the alarm reached the station. Therefore, the time between Bridget's going upstairs and down again must be diminished, on the one side by the time consumed by the washing of a window and a half in the sitting-room, and two windows in the dining-room, and the putting away of the cloth and water. On the other side, the half-hour between eleven o'clock and half-past eleven, must be diminished by the acts of Bridget, and the acts of Mrs. Churchill, and the acts of Cunningham, which I have described. I shall not attempt to fix that time. You can fix it better, and measure it better yourself when you have come to hear the evidence of what was done by Bridget between the time Mr. Borden came and the noise was heard upstairs, and what was done between the time when the alarm took place and the alarm reached the station house and the marshal of Fall River. Now, gentlemen, you will be struck by the fact, through the evidence that is to come, that instinctively there leaped to the lips of every inquiring person, of the prisoner, where were you before a thought of the suspicion was over her head? 
She had been the last person left with her father alive. When Bridget came down, that question arose, and she says, Where were you, Miss Lizzie? It is not clear what the prisoner told Bridget, whether she was sick or killed or dead. That is not important, but the moment the information was received arose the question, Where were you? She said, I was out in the backyard. I heard a groan, came in and found the door open and found my father. Bridget was then sent to Dr. Bowen. She came down, found the prisoner somewhat agitated standing by the screen door and inside. There had been no screech, no alarm of any kind, and there was an attempt simply to secure the presence of Dr. Bowen. She came back unsuccessful from the search for Dr. Bowen. As she came back, she was seen by Mrs. Churchill, who, looking out of her kitchen window, saw the prisoner standing inside the door and something in her appearance attracted her, and she called out to her. In the meantime, the prisoner had said to Bridget, "'You go down to Miss Russell's house.' "'And, gentlemen, it will in this connection occur to you that Miss Russell, though she lived a long distance away from this house, was the person to whom this prisoner was predicting disaster the very night before. Mrs. Churchill came there by accident, and she will testify in detail as to what had occurred after she came there.' She, too, said, Lizzie, where were you? I was out in the barn. I was going for a piece of iron when I heard a distressed noise, came in and found the door open and found my father dead. Bridget returns from Miss Russell's and, returning, says, Shall I not go down to Mrs. Whitehead's for Mrs. Borden? No, said the prisoner. I am almost sure I heard her come in. Up to that time, by alarm, by screaming or by any attempt, had there not been an effort on the part of the prisoner to communicate with Mrs. Borden. "'I wish you would look,' she said, "'and see if you can't find Mrs. Borden.' Mrs. Churchill and Bridget together went up this front stairway, turned as they do turn, to their left, and as they turned, Mrs. Churchill turned her head above the level of the floor. She looked in and saw Mrs. Borden's dead body as she looked under the bed. It is to be regretted that Dr. Bowen, a witness accustomed to observation, was the family physician and friend, and therefore affected naturally by this dreadful series of murders, for we might expect from him something of accurate observation. But Dr. Bowen thought Mrs. Borden had died of fright, and so expressed himself at the time. I do not, and shall not attempt in detail, to tell you all that occurred for an hour or two after the discovery of these homicides. Soon after, people came in. The prisoner, who had never been in the room where her father lay dead, passed from the dining-room diagonally through the corner of the sitting-room, without stopping to look at her dead father, upstairs by the room where her stepmother lay dead, without an inquiry, without a thought, went into her own room, lay down, soon, without a suggestion from anyone, changed her dress and put on a loose pink wrapper. There are one or two things, however, in what she said that I ought to call your attention to at the present time. She told Dr. Bowen at that time that she was out in the barn for a piece of iron. She told Miss Russell that she went into the barn for a piece of iron or tin to fix a screen. She told Officer Mulally that she went out into the barn, and upon being asked whether she heard anything or not, she said she heard a peculiar noise, something like a scraping noise, and came in and found the door open. There is, therefore, Bridget Sullivan, to whom she said she heard a groan, rushed in and found her father. Mrs. Churchill, to whom she said she heard a distressed noise, came in and found her father. Officer Mulally, to whom she said she heard a peculiar noise like scraping, came in and found her father dead. And all these, gentlemen, you see, in substance, are stories which include the fact that while she was outside, she heard some alarming noise which caused her to rush in and discover the homicide. Well, gentlemen, as inquiry begins to multiply upon her as to her whereabouts, another story comes into view, and she repeats it again and again, and finally repeats it under oath that at the time Bridget went upstairs, she went out into the barn, and into the loft of the barn, to get lead to make sinkers. Now, gentlemen, having in view the character of her statements, that she heard the noise, you will find that when she gave a later and detailed account, she said that she went into the loft of the barn, opened the window, ate some pears up there, 
and looked over some lead for sinkers, came down, looked in the stove to see if the fire was hot enough that she might go on with her ironing, found it was not, put her hat down, started to go upstairs to await the fire which Bridget was to build for the noonday, and discovered her father. It is not, gentlemen, and I pray your attention to it, a difference of words here. In the one case the statement is that she was alarmed by the noise of the homicide. In the other side the statement is that she came coolly, deliberately about her business, looking after her ironing, putting down her hat, and accidentally discovered the homicide as she went upstairs. Gentlemen, upon this point, it is my duty to point out to you a piece of testimony which will be for your consideration. This day, August fourth, 1892, was one of the hottest days of the last summer in this vicinity. The loft of the barn was stifling in the intensity of its heat. Officer Medley, who came there quite early after the alarm, went to the barn and went up the stairs of the barn. He had at that time heard of her going up into the loft, and as his head came up on a level with the floor of the barn, he saw that it was thickly covered with dust. He stopped, put his hands upon the floor, and drew them across, and saw the marks of them. He looked again, stepped up, counting his footsteps upon a part of the barn floor, came down into his position again, and saw plainly every footstep which he had made. I have said to you, gentlemen, that Mrs. Borden died some time before her husband, and it is my duty to open to you the proof upon that question. There will be many here who observed the two bodies as they lay. I shall not attempt to state their evidence in detail. It will tend to show that Mr. Borden's body showed freshly flowing blood, was warm, and was not rigid in death, but Mrs. Borden's body showed blood that was coagulated and hardened and dry, that her body was cold, and that she was stiffened in death. There will be the judgments of some professional men who observed the two bodies soon after the discovery of the homicides. There will be other important testimony in this case. The stomachs of the two victims were taken to Professor Edward S. Wood, who examined them and is prepared to state their exact contents. The stomach of Mrs. Borden contained eleven ounces of food in progress of digestion. One-fifth of that eleven ounces was water, and four-fifths of it was this partially digested food. Mr. Borden's stomach, and you will remember that they ate breakfast at the same time, contained only six ounces of matter, and nine-tenths of that was water, and only one-tenth solid food. So you will see that there was a very marked difference in the contents of their stomachs. Upon the autopsy, it appeared that the upper intestines, leading directly from the stomach, the intestine into which the contents of the stomach first passed, in Mrs. Borden's case, was empty of food. Now, gentlemen, you will have the opinion of many who are competent to give an opinion upon all these facts, and they will say to you that upon those facts alone they are able to give a judgment that Mrs. Borden must have died at least an hour before her husband. And that, gentlemen, you will remember and take into view with the fact that anywhere between nine and half-past nine o'clock she went upstairs for a mere temporary purpose, and apparently never left the room that she went to. Now, gentlemen, it will appear that about the two rooms in which the homicides were committed there was blood spattered in various directions, so that it would make it probable that one or more spatters of blood would be upon the person or upon the clothing of the assailant. And there has been produced for the inspection of the Commonwealth, it was produced a good many days after the homicide, the clothing said to have been worn by the prisoner on the morning of August the 4th. The shoes, stockings, dress, skirt. At this point the articles of clothing mentioned were produced and placed on the table, after which Mr. Moody continued as follows. The most rigid examination by the most competent expert in this country fails to disclose any marks of blood upon the dress which is produced as the one she wore on the morning of the homicide and upon the skirt which she is said to have worn upon that morning is one minute spot of blood which i do not think it worth while to call your attention at the present time i must go back a moment in this story you have in mind of course the interval which elapsed between the two homicides the prisoner has said and it is important to consider and we shall prove that she has said that the reason she left her ironing was because she found the fire was low that she took a stick of wood, put it on top of the embers of the fire, and went out to the barn to await its kindling. 
but when she went out it was smoking and smouldering as if it was going to catch that when she came back the stick of wood was there and the fire had all gone out it will appear and it was pure accident that this observation was made that soon after the alarm an officer of fall river was attracted by something that dr bowen was doing to the stove i do not mean to suggest anything but the fact that he was tearing up a note and was going to put it into the stove and he looked in and saw what was there and found a large roll of what appeared to be burnt paper the prisoner had a calico or cotton dress perhaps i ought to say which she was in the habit of wearing mornings it was a light blue dress with a fixed figure a geometrical figure of some sort and the figure was not white but navy blue a darker blue dr bowen has said and i have no doubt will say here now that she had on a cheap calico dress a sort of drab coloured dress mrs churchill says she had on that morning a light blue ground with white in it that is white in the blue not a white figure but white in the blue to make it lighter blue i suppose and a mixed figure of navy blue without a white spot in it at all a diamond figure of navy blue as she will describe it and upon being shown that dress showing dress to the jury she will say that it is not the dress that the prisoner at the bar had on when she came in upon the morning of the homicide you will recall that soon after the homicide miss russell and the prisoner went to the bedroom of the prisoner while they were there the prisoner said i think i had better have winwood for undertaker and miss russell went away upon the errand of getting dr bowen to see about the undertaker and as miss russell came back she found the prisoner coming from emma's room with the pink wrapper on that i have described to you before the loose wrapper upon saturday night the chief executive officer of the city of fall river mayor coughlin informed lizzie andrew borden that she was under suspicion for these murders saturday night bridget sullivan left the house alice russell was staying with her friend and of course miss emma was at home at that time on the morning of sunday miss russell came into the kitchen there were officers about on the outside of the house but none in and there was the prisoner with the skirt of her dress upon her arm and what appeared to be its waist lying upon some shelf and we will describe that dress it was a dress which the prisoner had purchased in the spring of that year a cotton dress and not a silk dress like this holding a dark blue silk dress up to view it was a light blue dress you will recall mrs churchill's description of that in this connection it was a light blue dress with a fixed navy blue spot on it the dress ordinarily worn in the morning corresponds to that description and was also bought in the spring as she saw the prisoner standing by the stove and as she approached her miss emma turned round and said lizzie what are you going to do the prisoner replied i am going to burn this dress it is all covered with paint miss russell turned away she came again into the room and she found the prisoner standing with the waist of the light blue dress apparently tearing it in parts and said lizzie i would not do that where people can see you the only response which the prisoner made was to take a step or two further out of observation miss russell turned again and went away upon the following day in consequence of some talk with mr hanscom a pinkerton detective not in the employ of the government miss russell went into the room where the prisoner and her sister emma were sitting and said lizzie i am afraid the burning of that dress was the worst thing that you could have done she said oh why did you let me do it then a considerable search had been made by the officers for clothing and for weapons and they will say that no clothing unconcealed covered with paint could have escaped their observation you have noticed mr foreman and gentlemen this indictment a more particular description of what is to the jurors unknown it is the duty of the government to bring forward all its information upon this subject and i propose to open it all to you at the present time upon the premises that day were found two hatchets and two axes upon one of those hatchets spots were discovered which upon view were thought to be blood it is extremely difficult impossible in fact dr wood the highest authority on this subject in this country if not in the world will say to distinguish between blood and some other substances 
attention upon the view then was directed to one of these hatchets it is not important which holding both hatchets in hand before the jury it is said to be the one i hold in my right hand these axes gentlemen are so far out of the question that i need not waste any time of them they could not have been the weapons with which these homicides were committed upon careful examinations neither of these hatchets is seen to contain the slightest evidence of blood-stain the appearances which were thought to be blood turned out to be something else you will observe gentlemen that there are ragged pieces near and about the entrance of the handle to the blade of this hatchet that the same appearances exist there in that weapon also on the outside of the handle and dr wood will say to you that those weapons could not in all probability have been used for these homicides and have been washed so as to have prevented the traces of blood from being caught in those ragged surfaces in that view of the fact we may well lay those weapons aside as entirely innocent upon the day of the homicide another weapon or part of a weapon that was thought to be a bloody hatchet had been discovered and attracted little attention it was seen by one officer and left where it was at that time this fragment of the handle was in its appropriate place in in the helve if that is the proper name of the hatchet in the place fitted in the head it was covered with an adhesion of ashes not the fine dust which floats about the room where ashes are emptied but a coarse dust of ashes adhering more or less to all sides of the hatchet upon the monday morning this hatchet was taken away and its custody from that time to the present will be traced you will observe gentlemen that both hatchets are rusty the hatchet which is innocent the handless hatchet now under discussion but the rust in the case of the handless hatchet is uniform upon both sides and upon all parts of its surface such rust for instance as might be the result of exposure upon wet grass to the night's dew such rust as must result from an exposure uniform in its extent upon all parts of the hatchet professor wood will say to you he saw this hatchet soon after it was found that while there were ragged fragments of wood which would detain absolutely no indications of the blood in these weapons that if that weapon had had upon it the remainder of the hatchet and was as smooth as he saw by the application of water soon after the homicide blood could be readily effectually and completely removed dr wood will also tell you that that break which had not the colour then which it has now it has been subjected to some acid process was a new break and was a fresh break by that i do not mean to be understood as a break which had necessarily occurred within twenty-four hours within forty-eight hours or within a week but perhaps a break which might have been a day or might have been a month old it was a fresh break in accordance mr foreman and gentlemen with the unbroken practice of the authorities in this commonwealth such parts of the mortal remains of the victims as would tend to throw light either in the protection of innocence or the detection of guilt have been preserved and must be presented here before you for your consideration i do not think it is necessary for me to allude to them at this time there is one story that is unmistakably told by those skulls and by the chipping blows that are upon them and that is that the weapon which produced them was a sharp weapon there is another thing that is unmistakably told by one of the skulls i think that of mr borden and that is that the weapon which brought him to his death was just three and one half inches on its blade no more no less that is the exact measurement of the blade of that hatchet let there be no mistake mr foreman and gentlemen about my meaning the government does not insist that these homicides were committed by this handleless hatchet it may have been the weapon it may well have been the weapon the one significant fact which in this respect is emphasized is that the bloody weapon was not found by the sides of the victims upon the premises or near them doubtless you will consider that fact well when you come to consider whether these homicides were the acts of an intruder or stranger flying from his crimes with the bloody weapon in his possession through the streets of fall river at noonday or the acts of an inmate of the house familiar with its resources for destruction 
obliteration, and concealment. When these bodies were found, it was discovered that not a thing in the house had been disturbed. No property had been taken. No drawers had been ransacked. Mr. Borden had upon his person a considerable sum of money, as well as his watch and chain. We almost might hope that it was not necessary to exclude another motive, but sad experience tells us that age of a woman is no protection from an assault from lustful purpose. But I may say, gentlemen, there was nothing to indicate a motive of that sort. In and about the rooms, where these two homicides were committed, there was not the slightest trace of a struggle. The assailant, whoever he or she may have been, was able to approach each victim in broad daylight and without a struggle, and without a murmur to lay them low before him. Mrs. Borden was found prostrated between the bureau and the bed, her face upon the floor and the right side of her head hacked to pieces by blows, some of great force, some of uncertain and vacillating weakness. Mr. Borden was found reclining on a sofa in the sitting-room, and apparently had passed from life to death without a struggle or a movement, and his head too bore the same marks as the head of his wife bore. It will appear that no one, and it is confirmatory evidence, not in itself of the strongest character, but confirmatory of the conclusive evidence of the opportunity in the house, it will appear that no one was seen to escape from any side of that house, nor to enter that house on the morning of August the 4th. Gentlemen, let me stop a moment and see where we are. The Commonwealth will prove that there was an unkindly feeling between the prisoner and her stepmother, that upon Wednesday, August the 3rd, she was dwelling upon murder and preparing herself with a weapon which had no innocent use, that upon the evening of Wednesday, August the 3rd, she was predicting disaster and cataloguing defences, that from the time when Mrs. Borden left the dining-room to go upstairs for this momentary errand, up to the time when the prisoner came downstairs an hour later, from this hallway which led only to her chamber and that in which Mrs. Borden was found, there was no other human being except the prisoner at the bar present, that these acts were the acts of a human being, that they were the acts of a person who, to have selected time and place as it was selected in this case, must have had a familiar knowledge of the interior of the premises and of the whereabouts and the habits of those who were in occupation of them at that time. We shall prove that this prisoner made contradictory statements about her whereabouts, and, above all, gave a statement virtually different upon the manner in which she discovered these homicides. We shall prove beyond all reasonable doubt that this death of Mrs. Borden was a prior death. Then we shall ask you to say, if you can, whether any other reasonable hypothesis except that of the guilt of this prisoner can account for the said occurrence which happened upon the morning of August the 4th. Now, gentlemen, my present duty is drawing to its close. The time for idle rumour, for partial, insufficient information, for hasty and inexact reasoning, is past. We are to be guided from this time forth by the law and the evidence only. I conjure you to keep your minds in that same open and receptive condition in which you have sworn they were. I pray you to keep them so to the end. If, when that end comes, after you have heard the evidence upon both sides, the arguments of counsel, the instructions of the court, the evidence fails. God forbid that you should move one step against the law or beyond the evidence to the injury of this prisoner. But if your minds, considering all these circumstances, are led irresistibly to the conclusion of her guilt, we ask you in your verdict to declare the truth, and by doing so, and only by doing so, shall you make true deliverance of the great issue which has been committed to your keeping. End of chapter 22